By late 2005, the Kingdom Hearts series had seen significant success. The first game was a unique exploration of a strange concept, with lots of creativity and heart poured into every nook and cranny. It boasts the accolade of being one of the first 3D action RPGs, and did a good job of codifying many genre norms we've come to expect since then. People loved the game, although it was far from perfect. The final mix version that was later released in Japan fixed some of the issues and expanded it into an even more complete package, specifically with lots of new cutscenes which extrapolate on the story, and a few new combat encounters that put the game's combat system to the test, pushing it to its limits. Chain of Memories then came out on the Game Boy Advance to a resounding, huh, interesting. Its card system was innovative at the time, not without its faults, but the game was fun enough and the story directly tied Kingdom Hearts 1 to what was to come soon enough. So Kingdom Hearts 2 had a great foundation to build itself upon. Let's explore what some of the intentions were with this game prior to its release. Tetsuya Nomura, series director, did a number of interviews specifically on KH2. In onefromoneup.com, he states that there were certain mechanics planned for KH1, but that got scrapped for that game, which are finally getting to see the light of day. They also wanted to focus on camera improvements, understandable, since that was the main thing people complained about from the first game. The gummy ship had been scrapped and redone, and in another interview with Dengeki PlayStation, he states that the gummy ship will feel like a ride at Disney World. The plot was going to be deeper, and the difficulty options would be more robust once the initial release came out, rather than waiting till the final mix version to implement them, like with Kingdom Hearts 1. From PlayStation.com, he stated that Sora was improved with the Keyblade, and his new moves and combos would reflect that. Not to mention that there would be no duplicate moves from the previous games, as the whole system was brand new. This statement is a bit misleading, although it could be a translation issue. More from Dengeki PlayStation, Nomura stated that the game was shaping up to be twice as large as the first, that his team just wouldn't stop working. They had changed how the game flowed. He describes the first game internally being thought of as having three distinct gameplay sections, battle, move, and event. KH2 would be simplified somewhat, now only having event and real time, the meaning of which we'll discuss later. Finally, and most interestingly, Kingdom Hearts 2 was said to have a clean ending, with the sequel only being considered if fans really wanted it, but otherwise it would tie up all loose ends. So that was the developer expectations going into the release. What about the fans? I can personally attest to the fact that most people thought Chain of Memories was a spin-off, without any significance going forward like most spin-offs. Nomura specifically stated this to not be the case, and yet people still thought it was true, even after the game came out. Which was... silly, frankly. Some were definitely confused and upset that the game was released on GBA, when Kingdom Hearts 1 was a Sony console exclusive frustrated that they couldn't even play the bridge game, understandably I'd say. In spite of all this, fans of the series were very excited for the next numbered installment, to jump back in to see where Sora's story was going to go, what's up with the organization, and what's going to happen to Riku, King Mickey, and Kairi. And after three and a half years from the original game, Kingdom Hearts 2 was released in Japan, and three months later, in America. What greeted fans? This game starts the same as the first one, with a CGI movie with excellent fidelity and animation. This one starts with Sora saying some poetic nonsense. A scattered dream that's like a far-off memory. A far-off memory that's like a scattered dream. I want to line the pieces up. Yours and mine. <sighs> We see Kairi crafting the good luck charm, followed by Sora jumping off the tree into his adventure. Sora, Donald, and Goofy fight up Hollow Bastion until they get to the apex where Kairi and Riku wait. You may notice that this is just a shorthand, more vague version of the important bits of Kingdom Hearts 1. Then, a similar thing happens with Chain of Memories, where we see the events of that game in shorthand. I love these scenes because they are actually full of parallelism and symbolic imagery for character relationships and what's really going on behind all of the literal events. Finally, we see Sora asleep on the beach with his friends, when suddenly a boy falls through into the ocean, landing on the dive to the heart just like Sora did. This is the same kid as from the end of Chain of Memories. Then, we see the scene from the end of Kingdom Hearts 1, on the dark beach, this time with voice acting for half the cast. You have arrived. I've been to see him. He looks a lot like you. I'm what's left. Or maybe I'm all there ever was. 
My name is of no importance. What about you? Do you remember your true name? Now we get a clip show of early Kingdom Hearts 1 events. After that, the boy from before wakes up in a bedroom and says he had another dream about him. How much of those previous scenes were a dream remains unclear. Next we meet more new characters, Hainer, Pence, and Olette. They talk about something being stolen, and that another group, Cyphers, blames them for it. First, we gotta clear our names. Once we find the real culprit, everyone will get off our backs. Uh, oh no! They're gone! Our... are gone! Uh, 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 what? All are... gone? Huh? 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 You can't say, why not? Yeah, this editing is pretty awkward, not gonna lie. As they all head out to search the town for clues, Roxas falls and hears a voice. His heart is returning. Doubtless, he'll awaken very soon. Next, we get a tutorial for basic movement and some controls. Triangle is now used for most situational commands. This wasn't true in the original Kingdom Hearts 1 or Final Mix, but was implemented in the 1.5 re-release of Kingdom Hearts Final Mix. I promise by the end of this series, you'll be used to all these re-releases. Next, we go to the Sandlot, where we meet some more new characters. Cypher, Fujin, and Raijin, all from Final Fantasy VIII, and Vivi from Final Fantasy IX, who bears a striking resemblance to a Heartless. Cypher apparently thinks they stole the pictures because it was undeniable proof that they totally owned those lamers. And before you unsubscribe, I didn't write that line, that was in the game. That was undeniable proof that we totally owned you lamers. So what did you do? Burn it? Huh, <laughs> not that we need some to prove that you're losers. Replay. <laughs> now you're talking. I guess if you get on your knees and beg, maybe I'll let it slide. <laughs> Roxas pretends to beg for forgiveness before launching forward and grabbing a weapon to spar with. Next is a combat tutorial against Cypher. Before that though, we have a choice. Take the wand, the hammer, or the sword, and it will increase your magic, defense, or strength by one, respectively. This choice does literally nothing else and comes off as a bit strange. This fight, similarly to the fights from Destiny Island, does teach you something, namely that you can parry enemy attacks with your own. Cypher has huge windups to his moves that open him up for attack when parried, so you're pretty much guaranteed to stumble into it. After the fight, Pence tries to take a picture, but not long after a weird white creature appears to steal the camera. Roxas gives chase. He chases the creature all the way to this large mansion and has to fight it, except his attacks do nothing against it. After a moment, his struggle bat turns into, wouldn't you know it, a keyblade, and it seems to direct him to fight the creature. After defeating it, the missing pictures appear. Roxas doesn't let on what happened when he got the pictures, strangely. Also strangely, there is one common theme among all the pictures. They all have Roxas in them. Roxas steps outside before hearing a familiar voice. Where am I? Who's there? Who are you? Restoration at 12%. Organization miscreants. They found us. But why would the nobody steal photographs? Both are nothing but data to them. The fools could never tell the difference. We are running out of time. Namine must make haste. We get another clip show from Kingdom Hearts 1 as memories continue to be compiled. By this point, it should be pretty obvious what's happening here. Sora's memories are being repaired. The second day, Roxas picks up a stick and swings it around before tossing it behind him, accidentally hitting a man in a familiar black cloak. Hainer wants to go to the beach, but they don't have enough money. Hainer, however, has a plan. There is a short scene establishing that these two are going to compete in what they call a struggle tournament in two days. And then they all go off and get odd jobs to make up some dough. 
There are six mini games you can do, three in this area and three in the tram commons. In order to move on, you simply have to do one mini game and make some amount of money, but you are rewarded for more. One additional ability point for 650 money and two additional ability points for 1050 money. I like this for encouraging players to engage with the admittedly pretty good mini games, but it never tells you there's a reward anywhere so it's easy to miss. Though it's not like two additional AP is really going to help much in the long run, so it's not a huge loss either way. The group puts their money together and gives it to Roxas before Hayner says this really cryptic Thing. We can't be together forever, so we better make the time we do have something to remember. Huh? Gotcha! As he's following the group, Roxas falls to the ground, a familiar stick falling nearby. The black cloaked man appears once again, picking up Roxas and asking him something unintelligible. The rest of the group acts like he wasn't there. Inside, Roxas can't find the money anymore and surmises that the guy must have taken it, but the rest of the group says there wasn't anyone there. On top of the clock tower, the group is eating ice cream, but Roxas seems uninterested. Can you feel Sora? Can you feel Sora? Restoration at 28%. Namine. Hurry. The black cloaked man asks why Diz couldn't just create a beach, and Diz responds that it'd be another entry point for the enemy. He then says that the money should be deleted, because it can't find its way to the real world. So all of this is some kind of simulation? After another set of memories and a brief scene with Namine, Roxas wakes up on the third day. He finds a note that says they are going to go to the beach today. He runs into Pence and Olette, but suddenly they are frozen in place, and Namine appears. She says she wanted to meet Roxas at least once before walking away, the scene unfreezing once again. Roxas goes to see if she went to the haunted mansion before getting attacked by more of those white creatures, which chase him back to the sand lot where Cypher's gang is hanging out. The trio fight the creatures alongside Roxas, but don't get very far, obviously. Then, the scene freezes once again for everyone but Roxas, and Namine calls out to use the Keyblade. Before he can, he is warped to the dive to the heart and presented with another choice. This time, the choice is for your ability specialization, meaning the first choice you make in Kingdom Hearts 1 has been split into two, and you now no longer have to choose which stat you want to give up. This is kinda cool, except the first choice in the game is completely irrelevant because it's only one stat point anyway. The ability specialization functions the same as it did in Kingdom Hearts 1. The sword will prioritize attack abilities, staff magic abilities, and shield defensive abilities. And just like in Kingdom Hearts 1, the choice here is pretty obvious. The shield gets you access to second chance and the new once more ability, which protect you from dying from individual large hits and combos respectively, much earlier than the other specializations. If you're playing on a higher difficulty, this choice is pretty much undeniably better than the others because those abilities are so helpful. Unfortunately, as we'll talk about later, this game shipped with a difficulty curve which roughly resembled a straight line prior to the final mix re-release, so this actually isn't as important as you'd think. Just to limit confusion going forward, I am judging the game primarily off my critical mode and level 1 critical mode playthrough, so when I talk about difficulty, that's what I'm referring to. Prior to Final Mix, critical mode wasn't an option, and the game was childishly easy. But like I said, we'll talk about that in a few hours. Next up we get the Keyblade. Thankfully we aren't forced to physically use the weapon we chose this time, and a bunch of the white creatures appear once again to fight us. These guys are called Dusks, and they are our new introductory enemy, similar to Shadows from Kingdom Hearts 1. I like these guys a lot better for a few reasons. Dusks can't go into the ground and force you to wait around, unlike Shadows, and their attacks are more varied. They are parryable, and doing so curls them up into this weird ball and opens them up for attacks. Finally, their reaction command, Reversal, affects all other enemies around them. All of this means they are much more interesting to fight than Shadows, and continue to be a treat to fight even late into the game. Let's also briefly discuss their design. They are very fluid and buoyant. Their animations are fun and energetic. We don't know what kind of enemy this is, but it's pretty clear they aren't heartless. They look fairly humanoid in an uncanny sort of way, a detail I love because it implies their inherent strength. In Kingdom Hearts 1, a trend you could see is that more powerful Heartless looked more like humans, in many cases, all the way up to Ansem who looked exactly like a human despite the fact that he was a Heartless, and he was definitely the most powerful of the lot. Other good examples are Invisibles, the Trick Master, and Darkseid of course. Now here, even the basic introductory version of this new enemy type looks weirdly human. They act with more sense rather than most Heartless which acted off instinct, and they work in teams and can even speak, such as when the first one we meet says, we have come for you, my liege, to Roxas. They can plan and have motivations, such as stealing the photos of Roxas. 
What all of this is for is unclear, but this enemy type is much more human than their shadowy counterparts, and it makes them more intimidating. After the fight, we are rewarded with aerial recovery and a new system called bonus levels, translated bafflingly as get bonuses. These function as rewards for completing required mob fights and bosses, now referred to as events, which can be denoted by the information box popping up at the top left of the screen. I love this because it guarantees a steady stream of valuable rewards regardless of what you're getting from regular level ups, and also guarantees that all playthroughs will get many of the most useful abilities regardless of what level they hit. You also solely get HP and MP upgrades through this system, so you'll never be lagging behind in these stats. Thanks to this, the actual leveling system is much less important as you won't be lacking for HP or MP even if you are underleveled. Other systems are also in place to encourage this change in focus, which we will discuss later, but important now to know is that this game takes numerous strides to take the focus off stats and put it on skill, which is great, except for the fact that, again, the game shipped too easy, but I'm getting ahead of myself. A chest appears and we are given a tutorial for opening them. Before that though, let's go equip the ability we just got. We can now open the menu and... <laughs> what the heck is this? These menu tutorials are abhorrent. They are cluttered, full of needless pictures, and explain things in the most complicated way possible. The easiest way to show this is with the auto reload tutorial. First, this section here has two text boxes on the bottom and one on the top, completely confusing the eye on what order to read the boxes in. Second, there are multiple blurbs of text that explain the same thing, meaning they are just taking up space. Finally, the second page which is supposed to teach you how to do it, teaches you in the most convoluted way, by going to the customize menu and doing it from there. The much easier way is just, after equipping your items in the item menu, press triangle on them so they show AT. Also, why is it labeled AT and not AR for auto reload? Either way, these menu tutorials are pretty terrible, not just this one. I really am not sure how these got past the design phase, but regardless, let's move along. A familiar door appears and we step through it, the game telling us that hitting 0 HP now means game over. We unlock some more chests and fight some more desks before eventually getting to our first boss. His name is Twilight Thorn and he takes the place of Darkseid, except he does a much better job. His attacks are more varied and he accomplishes something much better than Darkseid does, teaching about unsafe phases. Darkseid has this attack where these balls of hurt float down slowly towards you, which I'm pretty sure you're supposed to stop attacking in order to avoid. However, standing on the opposite side of his hand will allow you to continue attacking during this time. Similarly, Twilight Thorn has a phase where he constantly sends these thorns at you, which can be avoided using reversal, but trying to attack during this time will usually result in you taking damage. The ring around the arena, denoted by his weird appendages here, constitutes a safe zone, where you're meant to wait this attack out. Rather than just expecting you to stand there though, the boss sends these cute little guys called creepers at you during this phase, giving you something to do in the meantime. Creepers are a great choice for fodder enemies during a boss because they attack slowly and telegraph their attacks from a mile away. They also have low HP, and so can be dispatched during the phase easily. Numerous bosses have phases where either dealing damage is difficult without taking it yourself, or dealing damage is impossible and you simply have to dodge and wait it out, and this boss does a good job of showing that to the player. It also has a great reaction command. Reaction commands, or RCs, are a new mechanic in this game. A prompt over your command menu and a big green triangle will appear on the screen. Pressing triangle will activate an animation where you do a quick time event. There are two different kinds used in this game. Scripted RCs, like the one you are seeing right now, are big flashy moves that mostly play out in the same way every time, with very few exceptions. While cool on the first pass, impressive from an animation perspective, they do fail in one major way. They tend to get boring over time. This one here is probably the worst offender, because it's maybe the longest scripted RC in the game, and it will usually happen twice during the fight unless you can somehow defeat him prior to the second go around. To make matters worse, they also don't punish triangle spam in basically every case bar barring one example that we'll be seeing later. Mashing triangle will get you through every one of these, adding to the boring factor. The other type is unscripted RCs. We've already seen one in the reversal command for the desks or even on this boss. These function more as a context-sensitive move you can perform, which plays out quickly and usually with only one input. Sometimes they are based on dealing damage, sometimes they avoid damage. Almost every enemy has one of these, although many of them will be hard to find. They use the mechanic in a more interesting way and more readily reward quick reflexes, so these are my preference in terms of design. Overall, I'd say they are a positive addition, but occasionally they are used too often or make bosses feel trivial, lame, or on rails. This is somewhat rare though, especially on harder difficulties. Finally, I love the design of this boss. 
He's weird and floppy, just like the desks. The animations are delightfully uncanny and humorous. Lots of squashing and stretching is used to make him look like Jello given life and trying to kill you. I love it because it's such a different style from the Heartless. Their animations are a bit more grounded in some semblance of reality, of how creatures like them move. These guys are animated like something otherworldly, like something that doesn't exist, at least not in our universe, and hey, there could be a story reason for that we haven't gotten to yet. We get Guard from the bonus level after beating this boss, and he blows up. Namine kind of saves Roxas, I guess, then they have a conversation. Roxas, do you remember your true name? Suddenly, the black cloaked man shows up to interrupt, saying it's best Roxas doesn't know the truth. Back in the usual spot, Hayner and the gang seem bummed out. They couldn't go to the beach today because Roxas was hanging out with Cypher's gang, and they can't go tomorrow because of the struggle tournament. I like this because all this weird stuff going on, the gameplay that we've had and the pieces of story peppered into this otherwise innocuous arc, it's straining the relationship between Roxas and Hayner and the rest of the group, not to mention Roxas' own mental state. We'll see how it plays out going forward. How about we go tomorrow? We could get those pretzels and... I promised I'd be somewhere. Oh. Diz is angry because Namine is acting out of his control. He resigns that it doesn't matter as long as she finishes her mission. More memories and then Roxas wakes up for the fourth day, and it's time for the struggle tournament. Prior to their match, Roxas and Hayner make up. Now it's time to struggle. The struggle minigame is interesting. You have to strike your opponent to collect their orbs, but if your opponent strikes you, you drop them as well. If you collect all 200 at once, the match ends early and every opponent, of which there are three, can be stunned if you drain enough of their HP, although this is a somewhat difficult task to accomplish. I find this interesting because this is actually sort of preparing you for some mechanics that come up later. Numerous bosses and events have mechanics where attacking enemies drop some sort of item that you need, and in some of these cases, the same is true if you get struck. The fights themselves are pretty good too. They're all human bosses, and so of course, they're good. We should know this by now, but each one has a decently varied attack set, and Setzer even has a block and retaliate move similar to Riku from KH1. Also, after Cypher loses to Vivi, you can actually go fight him in the back alley if you want to, though there is no purpose to this other than street cred, I guess. After the fight with Vivi, everything freezes once again, and some dusks show up to ruin your day. After taking them out, an old friend appears. Axel. If you thought he was dead based on my last video, that is more to do with the way I structured the recap, not making it clear that he actually didn't die, he just warped away. The game makes it decently clear in Riku's story that he's still alive at the end of the game. He asks Roxas if he remembers him, but Roxas says he doesn't. Axel says he is going to take Roxas somewhere, away from his creation. Roxas' anger flares up and he throws the Keyblade, which then reappears in his hand. Axel calls Roxas number 13, the Keyblade's chosen one, and then they fight. I like how the game peppers in little details about characters' past and motivations, and it doesn't really give you much time to think about them before whatever comes next, adding to the intrigue. Axel just implied Roxas was part of Organization 13. So how did he get here? Why isn't he still with them? Axel's fight is a neutered version of a fight with him we'll do later. He attacks slowly and regularly stoops down to take a breather, opening himself up to attacks. It's probably the first time you'll find really good use in the guard and aerial recovery abilities we've earned. After the fight, Diz shows up, telling Roxas not to listen to Axel, who tells Roxas not to be deceived. They each take turns yelling at Roxas before he screams his friend's names, resulting in the scene around him being unfrozen. Painter! Pence! Olette! One more note on this scene before we move on. Setzer asks Roxas to throw the match, and if you do, you actually get a better reward in the form of the medal, which raises your strength. Winning the match nets you the champion's belt, which just adds elemental resistance, which is just as useless a mechanic in this game as it was in the first one. Afterward, the group go up to the clock tower once again in celebration of Roxas' victory in the tournament. When Olette reveals she brought ice cream, Roxas jumps up and trips, falling to his death. Uh. Okay, yeah, that's not really how it ends, I'm just playing. Next, we see something new. Kyrie and Selfie are in this adorable looking town, and the Destiny Island can be seen in the distance. Kyrie has vowed not to go back there until she remembers the other boy they used to play with. Then, we hear Roxas' voice, saying Namine. We see Roxas falling in slow motion as a conversation between Roxas and Kyrie plays out. Then, a familiar voice pipes up to be offended that Kyrie doesn't remember his name. Okay, I guess I can give you a hint. Starts with an S. 
Kairi sends out a message in a bottle and hopes that it'll find its way to the boy she can't remember. We then see Diz and the black cloaked man talking once again. Diz says Namine wasn't born like other nobodies and then asks the black cloaked man to identify himself. It's Ansem. <laughs> it's an honor, Ansem. The next morning, Roxas questions if he fell off the tower, to which his friends say no, but that it was close. They have to do an independent study prior to going back to school, and Roxas wants to do it on the weird stuff that's been happening to him. However, the group says they already have a search committee planned to scour the town for answers to these issues. All that for me? I'll go get some ice cream. Then they discuss the Seven Wonders of Twilight Town, which they end up researching for their independent study. The majority of the fifth day involves traveling around this new area, Sunset Terrace, and finding all these supposed Seven Wonders. Pence has a map if you talk to him that can come in handy if you're lost. Most of them equate to some programming glitch in the constructed town, but Pence and the gang just sort of shrug them off because by the time they get there, Roxas has already taken care of the situation. The sixth wonder, the ghost train, is said to appear under Sunset Hill with no conductor or passengers. They wait on the hill for the train to come by. As they do, Cypher shows up to heckle them, but reveals that he, too, is part of the investigation into Roxas's troubles taking place tomorrow. Then, a purple train appears riding down the tracks, and Roxas gets excited, telling his friends to go to the station. When they get there, Roxas makes to get on the train, but Hainer grabs him, afraid of him falling into the tracks. A moment later, another train appears to take the ghost train's place. His friends never saw the ghost train. Back in Twilight Town, Roxas flusteredly asks about the Seventh Wonder, and Hainer storms off in a fit. Pence says it's at the Haunted Mansion. The strange occurrences have officially driven Roxas and Hainer completely apart. At the mansion, Pence tells Roxas that the supposed wonder is that a girl in a white dress can be seen in the window, in spite of the fact that the mansion has been abandoned for so long. Roxas sees Naminé in the window, and they have a conversation over pictures she drew. One is of Roxas and Axel, and Naminé says they were best friends. In order for Sora to become whole, he needs Roxas. Naminé then explains her powers to him, and says that Roxas was never supposed to exist. What? How could you even say such a thing? Even if it were true? I'm sorry. I guess some things really are better left unsaid. Pence, of course, can't see Naminé. They think it's just a flapping drape in the window. Tomorrow, the town is searched for answers. Meanwhile, Diz explains that he allowed Roxas to see the train because he missed his trip to the beach. Everyone's memories of Sora are filling in, and Diz explains what his goals are. What is it that you want? Revenge. Revenge. Now for the finishing touches. First, we must dispose of Namine. She did a splendid job with Sora, but it's high time she disappeared. Roxas isn't the only one who was never meant to exist. Take care of it, Ansem. Next, we see a fight between Roxas and Riku, the one from the secret movie in Kingdom Hearts 1. Why? Why do you have the Keyblade? Shut up! The sixth day, things are not quite right. Man, I could not sleep last night. Guys? Huh? As he leaves the usual spot, Axel appears to him, explaining that he must kill Roxas if he doesn't go back to the organization. Roxas says they were best friends, and Axel tests Roxas' memory by asking what their boss's name is, but Roxas clearly doesn't remember. Roxas gets ready to fight just as a bunch of enemies appear. This is the first time we'll see the assassin-type enemy. 
They are dangerous because at low HP, they can do the self-destruct attack that deals a ton of damage. On top of that, they can be tough to deal with because they spend much of their time invincible in the ground. Parrying their attacks will open them up for retaliation though, and they are pretty easy to stun lock after that point. After the fight, Axel gets ready to strike but freezes in place. The voice of Diz appears, telling Roxas it's time to go to the mansion. Roxas, to the mansion. The time has come. Painter! Pence! Olette! As Roxas leaves, Axel says that the Roxas he knew is long gone. Fine. I see how it is. Roxas uses the Keyblade to unlock the gate to the mansion, and Ansem appears, wielding a Soul Eater, to fight off some desks that were chasing him. Roxas explores the mansion, and finds Namine's room. He has a memory of him and Axel in the Dark City. Roxas asks why he has the Keyblade. Axel tells him he can't turn his back on the organization. Namine doesn't know if the organization is good or bad, just incomplete, searching for Kingdom Hearts. Roxas asks what is going to happen to him, and Diz appears to interrupt Namine, saying it's best he doesn't know the truth, that the knowledge won't change his fate. It doesn't. I want to know. I have the right to know. A nobody doesn't have a right to know. Nor does it even have the right to be. But what is a nobody? Diz, we're out of time. Too many nobodies. Roxas, nobodies like us are only half a person. You won't disappear. You'll be whole. I'll disappear? No further outbursts. No, you won't disappear. You'll... Wait. <sighs> Roxas, we will meet again. And then we can talk about everything. I may not know it's you. And you may not know it's me, but we will meet again, someday soon. I promise! Let her go! Nominate! Exploring further, Roxas finds the computer we've seen Diz sitting at. Roxas has a memory of him in the organization and getting taken by Riku. Will it work? If we can maintain the simulated town, until Namine finishes chaining together Sora's memories. What will happen to Roxas? He holds half of Sora's power within him. In the end, he'll have to give it back. Until then, he'll need another personality to throw off his pursuers. Poor thing. It's the fate of a nobody. Roxas smashes the computer in anger. In the next room, more Dusks and Assassins show up to fight Roxas, and afterward, Axel shows up once again. Simply amazing, Roxas. Axel, you really do remember me this time. I'm so flattered! But you're too late! This is the real fight with Axel. Our combos are improved thanks to the second Keyblade, but Axel is on his A game now and is hitting much harder and faster. After a combo, Axel will typically go into the wall and blast out with a quick attack, but if you can hit the RC in time, you'll deal a bunch of damage and turn the arena floor back to normal. To be honest, I find the two Keyblade combos to be kind of stiff in this fight, not a lot of fluidity to how they work with other moves and things like that. You get on their bad side and they'll destroy you! No one would miss me. That's not true. I would. Axel. Let's meet again in the next life. Yeah, I'll be waiting. Silly. Just because you have a next life, Moving forward, Roxas finds Donald and Goofy inside flower pods. 
Then he steps into one final chamber with one big flower pot, and Diz meets him there. At last, the key blade's chosen one. Who are you talking to? Me? Or Sora? To half of Sora, of course. You reside in darkness. What I need is someone who can move about the realm of light and destroy Organization 13. Why? Who are you? I am a servant of the world. <laughs> and if I'm a servant, then you should consider yourself a tool at best. Was that... Was that supposed to be a joke? Cause I'm not laughing! Ugh. My apologies. This is only a data-based projection. I hate you so much. You should share some of that hatred with Sora. He's far too nice for his own good. No! My heart belongs to me! Sora. Looks like my summer vacation is over. Roxas' story in this game is really, really good, so let's talk about it a bit before we move on. I used to find that its length was overbearing, but now I'm not so sure. It takes around two hours to get through, and it tells a captivating story for Roxas, who is troubled over and over by circumstances that are completely out of his control. You can see him growing from depressed to frustrated and angry, a feeling perhaps shared by the player as they wonder what's going on and where Sora even is. His final moments on screen are incredibly powerful, as Roxas resigns himself to the fate he so desperately wishes to break out of. Gameplay-wise, I feel like it does an even better job of presenting mechanics and testing you with them than Destiny Islands, with some fights that can actually be pretty tough, but have a lot of lessons to teach. It's a good prologue, but thankfully, Sora is back and ready for adventure. Sora, Donald, and Goofy all share a reuniting moment before remarking that they have no idea how they got here. They only have one note in Jiminy's journal, thank Namine. Later, they run into Hainer's gang, who say that King Mickey was just here. They go up to the train station looking for him, but get attacked by dusks and creepers when they get there. After a short battle, it's looking like Sora and team are outnumbered, and their grogginess hasn't worn off enough to fight well, but then Mickey appears and bails them out. He tells them to board the train and hands them a sack of money. They are confused as to how he's out of the realm of darkness, and it's at this moment, when taking notes on this playthrough, that I realized that Sora, Donald, and Goofy all lost a year of their lives, and I don't recall anyone telling them that. They surmise that Riku must have made it out as well, and Sora asks what Donald and Goofy are going to do now while Sora goes to look for Riku. Gorsh, Sora, do you have to ask? <laughs> hey, what's so funny? Your face. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, guys? Let's stick together for one more journey. They buy tickets for the train with the money Mickey gave them, and then the Hainer gang shows up, feeling like they needed to say goodbye to them. Olette remarks that she has the same money pouch. Sora says he can't help but feel like they are never going to see this town again. As they board the train, Sora cries, but expresses he's not sure why. You know... Sad. We'll be back. Yeah, we can visit Hainer and those guys again. The 
train lands in a completely different place, a lone tower in the middle of some weird abyss. At the door, they find someone peering into the tower. Meet Pete. You know him? We sure do. Pete's been causing trouble for ages. His Majesty banished him to another dimension a long time ago. You want to know how, eh? Well, Maleficent busted me out, that's how. And now your world, no, 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 all the worlds are going to belong to yours truly. Because uh, Maleficent's going to help me conquer them. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Maleficent's power is so great that... She's toast. Huh? Sorry, but Maleficent can't help you now. What do you mean? <laughs> you! So you're the ones that did it. Well, we might have had something to do with it. Heartless Squad, round up! Now we fight shadows, and it may occur to the player at this point that this is also the first time we've seen Heartless in combat. Afterward, Pete reveals that someone named Master Yen Sid is in the tower, and Donald and Goofy take off toward the door in an excited rush. They fight shadows and soldiers up the tower until they meet the man of the hour himself, King Mickey's teacher, Master Yen Sid. He tells us to read this book, and then he'll explain more about our foes on this journey. The book sort of retells the themes of the first two games in poetic form and prophesies some things about this one. Then, speaking with Yen Sid again, he tells us about our enemies, the Nobodies. Nobodies are born when people of strong heart or will become a heartless. The empty shell of their body that is left behind begins to act with a will of its own. Paradoxically, he explains that Nobodies don't actually exist, and that they don't have feelings, they only pretend to have hearts. Dusks are the most basic form of Nobodies. The Organization 13 is a group of very powerful nobodies, and they command the lesser ones. He explains that nobodies don't just act on instinct, they can think and plan. The Organization 13 has a plan as well, but they don't know what it is, and that's why Mickey left. Before we can leave, we need new garments, as these are looking a little small on us. As we move that way, Sora remarks that... Me, you guys, Riku, and the King. I don't care who this organization is, or what it's planning. With the five of us, I mean, six of us, there's nothing to worry about, right? Which it's a little weird that he corrected himself to the wrong number, unless there's someone else he was subconsciously thinking of. We go into the next room to see the three good fairies from Sleeping Beauty, who bicker for a while about what color to make the clothes. Eventually, and after a frustrated outburst from Sora, they finally put their heads together and make this. The new design gives Sora his own space separate from his Mickey Mouse inspiration, and it looks great. The cool design isn't the only positive about these clothes, though. They also carry unique abilities. There's a new mechanic in this game called Dry Forms. These let you shift into a new form that has increased power and complexity for a short time before reverting back to normal form. Doing so fully restores HP and MP as well. The fairies say that this journey is going to be twice as difficult as the last. Yeah, about that. As we leave, the fairies see a raven perched in their window, which tosses Maleficent's cloak on the floor in front of them, causing them to remember Maleficent. Apparently, this is enough to revive her back from the dead. I haven't seen Sleeping Beauty, so I have no idea if this is, like, a thing from that movie, but regardless, I guess Maleficent is back now, so yay. Yen Sid tells us the pathways between worlds were locked again after the events of Kingdom Hearts 1, which makes sense, so we'll have to find a new way to get to the worlds, and that the Keyblade will guide us as always. Then we board the gummy ship and find that the only world available is Hollow Bastion. Pete is seen walking around in the castle looking for Maleficent before finding the raven from the other scene. Then we drop down and everything looks different from before. We aren't in the castle this time, but instead the city that surrounds it. I like this because it expands the scope of this world and gives new stuff to see in an otherwise familiar place. It sort of makes these worlds a little bit more believable as places rather than just gameplay zones, and at least somewhat answers the question of, is there anything beyond the gameplay borders that the first game neglected to hint at? We later run into Yuffie before getting interrupted by Dusks. Then we go to Merlin's house where we learn that the Final Fantasy gang forgot about Sora and team, and the Final Fantasy gang expresses they need help. Leon tells us to go to the Bailey before Merlin comes in, disappointed that we forgot all our magic. He gives us Blizzard, a member card for the Holobastrum Restoration Committee, and then we head to the Bailey to see what's up. Leon shows us a big heartless and nobody problem they are having as they attempt to rebuild Holobastion. Then a voice is heard. You called? You're doing well. Who's that? This calls for a celebration. This fight at the Bailey Gate can actually be pretty tough. First of all, the Nobodies are aiming to destroy the gate, and if they deal enough damage to it, you will lose. 
Secondly, this is the first time the Samurai Nobody appears. These guys have strange attack patterns and hit like a truck. Parrying then gives access to their RC, which freezes time as you enter into a dual stance. Your command menu goes blank, and after a second, the end will appear in one of your commands. Hit it fast enough, and you'll decimate the Samurai and any enemies nearby. Fail to hit it in time, and the Samurai will deal a bunch of damage to you. They are a great enemy on their own and in a group, and their RC is pretty engaging and goes by very quickly, keeping the pace up well. The organization reappears after the battle, taunting Sora. Another of their members shows up nearby and heckles them for a while. Afterward, Sora holds up the honorary member card, which begins to glow, revealing a keyhole. Sora unlocks it, which opens up pathways to a couple new worlds, which they presume is what Yen said was talking about. Off they go, into another Disney-filled adventure. This game has 11 Disney worlds if you don't count the returning 100 Acre Wood, and I don't. Those worlds are Land of Dragons from Mulan, Beast's Castle from Beauty and the Beast, Olympus Coliseum from Hercules, Disney Castle from the Disney logo prior to every Disney movie ever made, Timeless River, which is based on classic Disney cartoons, Port Royale from Pirates of the Caribbean, Agrabah from Aladdin, Halloween Town from Nightmare Before Christmas, Pride Lands from The Lion King, Atlantica from The Little Mermaid, and finally, Space Paranoids from Tron. That sounds like a pretty meaty playlist when it's read out that way, but there's a small caveat. Disney Castle and Timeless River are two halves of the same coin, and so really only function as a single world, meaning the total worlds of KH2 comes to 10, compared to KH1's 8. Again, not including 100 Acre Woods and the original worlds, we're only talking about Disney stuff here. So the question is, how exactly is this game twice as large as the original like Nomura claimed if there are only two more worlds? Well, the answer is that you visit each Disney World twice rather than once, and numerous times in the case of Atlantica. This section is going to be specifically about the first pass of the Disney Worlds because there are some common storytelling elements that are used for all of the first passes. The same is true for the second pass, but the first and second don't really have much overlap, and as we'll see, this is for the best. So let's dig into a few examples of the first passes at these worlds and see how their stories and gameplay were handled. Let's see, what can we look at here? Ah, Atlantica is a returning world, let's see, how does it compare to the original? First, we see a cutscene of Ariel singing to Eric, which I suppose implies that we're going to be doing a retread of the movie story, okay, that's not necessarily a bad thing. We land, meet up with our old friends, and pretty much immediately get a new movement tutorial for the underwater gameplay. The original game had up and down bound to circle and square, and it was admittedly pretty janky overall. Now, the right stick moves you up and down, and the camera left and right. This is a much better system, and it feels pretty fluid, too. This is a good basis for new gameplay challenges based around a new movement system that feels pretty good, so let's see where it goes with it. Next, Sebastian asks us if we want to sing in a musical, and then we do a... rhythm tutorial, and then we do... Okay, when I said it was a shame that some voice actors didn't have songs in the first game, this was not what I had in mind. Okay, so yeah, Atlantica isn't a good example. Not only does it have none of the Kingdom Hearts gameplay, it basically just retells the movie's story with Sora as an event instigator. But how's the rhythm game? Well, the actual timing of it feels a little strange. It doesn't really feel like it's on the beat, although when you hit an excellent, it does fall on the beat. Don't be shy, let the music inside a dance, dance, dance. It's easier to ignore the rhythm and just press the button when the bar is over the excellent portion. The songs themselves, well, there are some songs from the movie, which are obviously good. Down on those, what do you call them? Ah, oh, feet. And then there are the originals. Just a touch, cause it won't take too much to up, up, up. Flotsam and Jetsam! Boil, darling, strong as the tide. Sweet as poopsies, hasten to my side right now. Mommy needs you. Smash those stupid fools! Make them rise! Sorry, Mommy. Your poopsies are toast. And he found you too. We were glad to help you out and very proud, it's true. I am impressed that a series with such good music was able to create such terrible lyricism. Granted, this may be a translation issue, it might flow better in Japanese, but regardless, this is pretty bad. Thankfully, Atlantica is completely optional, and so it's not really worth worrying about. Let's look at a few real examples, starting with Land of Dragons. We arrive and stumble into a small outcropping where we find Mushu and Mulan, who is currently disguising herself as Ping. 
Yeah, we're retreading the movie's plot again, aren't we? <sighs> so this didn't actually happen that much in Kingdom Hearts 1. Deep Jungle kind of sort of counts, but for the most part, KH1 used the worlds and their plots and elements to tell at least somewhat unique stories. Whether those stories were good or not is another concern, but like I said earlier, doing retreads of the original stories isn't necessarily a bad thing, it doesn't automatically make the story bad, so let's see where it goes. So we run into Mushu, who Sora already knows because of the summon from Kingdom Hearts 1. While there are numerous new Disney World appearances in this game, only Port Royale and Space Paranoids have no prior connections to Sora. This is good, because it means we have an immediate attachment point to these people and the story, and a reason we want to help out. So Mulan is disguising herself as a guy to get into the army and fight for her family's honor. Already we're seeing the little bit of time that is spent to make sure that players understand these characters' motivations is paying off. The group agrees to help her, and they travel down to the camp. The same fight breaks out from the movie, and then Shang walks up to put an end to it. It's really, really funny when you think about the fact that Donald and Goofy are joining a literal army populated by literal humans that fought a literal war in China. Shang sends us on three missions to prove ourselves. The surprise attack, the ambush, and the search. Each one uses the new mechanic present for the Land of Dragons, the morale gauge. The gauge steadily drips down, and if it completely empties, it's game over. You restore it by defeating enemies and picking up the orbs they drop. While it's usually not a concern, the mission titled The Search has the bar dropping very quickly and all the enemies are hidden somewhere in the camp, so you have to find them and defeat them quickly. I like this. It's a very different use of the game's mechanics and adds a little more interest. In these missions, we also meet our first Assault Rider, who is an absolute beast of an enemy that will rip you to shreds. Attacking them when they aren't staggered is practically a death sentence on higher difficulties, so you have to be smart about how you encounter them. Magic usage from a distance is also pretty effective. These guys are probably the single most complex fodder enemies we've seen so far in the series, and the trend toward more complex fodder enemies will continue throughout this game. After the missions, Shang still isn't sure about Ping, but he begs Shang to give another mission, and so we are tasked with clearing a pathway up the mountain. There are lots of enemies in this zone, and we have to clear them out before we can perform the Rock Shatter RC to open up the pathways. Getting to the other end of the mountain pass will progress us onwards. The army moves up to this village in the mountains, and Mushu says he saw Shan Yu go into a nearby cave, and that we should go get him because it would be the perfect way to prove Ping is capable. We go into the cave and Donald and Goofy get trapped on the other side of a force field, just as a huge group of Heartless spawn. There are a lot of shadows here on top of an assault rider that spawns with them, and then a few more assault riders spawn after that. This battle is pretty tough, largely because of the assault riders and the fact that you can't use Valor form to easily stunlock them. As it turns out, the cave was actually a trap, because while we were inside, Shen Yu came and burned the village to the ground and went further up the mountain. We give chase and find him with an army of Heartless. Eventually, Ping gets the great idea to avalanche the mountain, and Mushu says a slightly different version of the line from the movie, and I always struggle to remember which one's from the movie and which one's from the game. How could you miss it with three feet in front of you? You're going the wrong way! Everyone survives the avalanche, but it's revealed that Mulan tricked Shang and he storms off. Mulan takes it surprisingly well, and we start moving down the mountain. Fortunately, this means that Mulan is now herself, and she fights much better as a girl than when she was pretending to be a dude. Unfortunately, Shen Yu also survived the avalanche, and he makes his way down to the palace. Our team gives chase to warn the Emperor, but by the time we get there, Shen Yu already has him at knife point. The Emperor and Shang escape into the palace, leaving us to deal with Shen Yu. This fight is interesting for a few reasons. For one thing, he spawns lots of fodder enemies, but they don't even fight you directly. Instead, they attack the palace gates, the HP of which is represented by the morale gauge. So on top of draining Shen Yu's HP, you need to keep track of the enemies on the gate and make sure they don't break through. Shen Yu himself is pretty simple. He has a couple basic sword combos and some more difficult to dodge sweeping and thrusting attacks. Blocking or parrying his attacks will usually get you his RC, in which you have to use press fast enough to overtake him, and then use takedown to deal some damage and knock him away. The cool thing about many of these RCs is that if you perform them close enough to other enemies, they will usually hit them as well, meaning there is some strategy you can employ to how and where you perform them. Shan Yu's bird also attacks you and can pick you up and drag you away. He's a pretty good boss. All of the different elements keep you engaged without having so much complexity as to be tiring. Afterward, we congratulate Mulan for saving China, Mushu says that he's the best, we unlock this world's keyhole, and we move along. So, how does it fare?
Well, while the story doesn't contain any plot significance in the long run, character motivations are better explained. This alone means that the story works better than some in Kingdom Hearts 1. That being said, Land of Dragons is one of the weaker examples because our main characters don't feel like they matter much. This may be partially due to the fact that we already know how the story is going to play out when we see Ping in the opening, assuming you've seen the movie that is. It's also a little strange because Ping doesn't really have a moment of success and proving himself like he does in the movie, with the exception of the avalanche plan, I suppose, which could have very easily gotten the whole Chinese army killed just as likely as it could have saved them, to be fair. So if it wasn't for Sora and team, Ping wouldn't have even made it into the army in the first place, at least that's the way it seems here, and that makes the story feel a little nonsensical. Our main characters seem to contribute nothing to the original story, and yet they are now somehow the reason the story is even able to play out. It's a little paradoxical, I know, but that's the way it feels. I do like the gameplay mechanics they added to this one, as well as the increased complexity of the fodder enemies you fight. Let's look at another one. How about Olympus Colosseum? When we land, we are greeted with the cutscene of Hercules taking down the Rock Titan. It is nice to actually see him in action in this one. After that, we see that Sora and team are dropped down in the underworld this time, which is where most of the story and gameplay takes place. This means that dry forms are gone for most of this world because of the limitations incurred by fighting in the underworld, which is pretty cool. And I like that the devs are making sure you aren't relying too much on them. This is also a new location in an old world that expands the world's scope, which I've already spoken about being a positive. But this world in particular being expanded means that Olympus Colosseum can have an actual story other than just, here's an arena game, try to be a hero or whatever. We meet Meg down here who says she was going to see Hades but couldn't make it. We volunteer to do so to help Hercules because he's apparently been very overworked in the games. We travel to Hades' lair, occasionally seeing this organization member running around. Pete is here and is working with Hades, and Hades spawns in a big bad baddie from his Fountain of Souls. This baddie is Oron from Final Fantasy X, and he immediately turns on Hades in a pretty hilarious scene. Fight Hercules in the Colosseum to the death! This is my story, and you're not part of it. Did you forget who you're talking to? I am the Lord of the Dead! <laughs> no wonder no one wants to die. You are fired! We try to fight Hades, but we can't because we're in his domain, so we have to try to escape, which Oren joins us on. We fight through three waves of enemies while Hades constantly harries us with fireballs and such, and then head back to the underworld lobby area. When Oren introduces himself to the party, he says this. No. I'm no hero. I'm just an... Huh? Or... Which, as a kid, I always got confused and thought his name was Justin. Can you really blame me? Maybe you can and I'm just an idiot, I don't know. While escaping, we see Hades send Cerberus after us. Before we can get out of the corridor, Cerberus does indeed show up, and Donald and Goofy are once again locked out of the room, leaving us to fight with just Oren, who is admittedly pretty good. Serbi here is a similar to Kingdom Hearts 1, but is much faster paced, with very few to no pointless dodging phases. His chomping phase is much more dangerous, as his attacks are a little harder to time and predict, but otherwise he's not too bad. His RC is pretty cool. If you get hit by this certain attack, you'll transition into the RC, which ends in Sora slamming down onto Serbi, knocking him out momentarily. Interestingly, it seems the game makes Serbi do the attack more often when you're close to finishing him off, increasing the chances you'll be able to defeat him with the RC in a really cool cinematic moment. The get bonus for this fight is Counter Guard, a better version of Counter Attack from Kingdom Hearts 1, which we'll be seeing a lot of use during my playthrough. We escape through the door and are now safe. Meanwhile, we see a scene between Herc and Meg, and Herc is a sleepy boy. We also see a scene between Pete and Hades. Pete explains Sora's Keyblade to Hades, and Hades hatches an idea. He's going to use the power of the Keyblade and trick Sora into unlocking the Underdrome, an underworld version of the Colosseum where all bets are off. Sora and team head up into the Olympus Colosseum to find Herc and Phil. Hercules walks off to grab the Olympus Stone for us so we can fight better in the Underworld, and we do some training minigames with Phil involving breaking pots to pick up orbs. See, I told you picking up orbs would stay relevant, and it's definitely not done yet. Herc walks back up and mentions that the Olympus Stone had been stolen by a man in a black cloak, and Meg had also been kidnapped. We head down to the Underworld to track down the stone and Meg, and find that Phil had been knocked out by the black cloaked man. He went down a pathway that was previously consumed by fire, but the black cloaked man put the fire out with his powers, according to Phil's optional dialogue here, which is a cool detail that ties into this character we are soon to meet. While we travel, Herc fights the Hydra and wins. Later, we meet the black cloaked man, and he dehoods himself. This guy's name is Dimmix, and he summons a bunch of water clones of himself by playing his sitar. 
After we win, we get the Olympus Stone and access to our dry forms again, but Demix gets away. Next, we need to save Meg, and so we find her visage carved into this weird stone. Unlocking it opens the pathway inside where we find Meg and Pete. The first fight with him is mostly a mob fight while you avoid Pete himself. It's got a soft time limit, but you have to protect Meg or you'll lose. Herc appears after the fight to help and send Sora with Pegasus to take Meg back to the Colosseum, but Meg begs us to help Herc, so back in we go for a more legit boss fight. When Pete goes into this invincibility bubble, you can use the RC with Herc to force him out of it. We'll talk more about Pete's actual moves later though, because this won't be the last time we fight him. Unfortunately, when we unlocked the keyhole to free Meg, we also unlocked the Underdrome, and not to mention, Herc didn't kill the Hydra. It's completely destroyed the Colosseum, and now we have to take care of it. This boss is kinda lame. It involves a lot of forced waiting periods as you wait for the Hydra to lower its head to attacking range. There is a cheesy thing you can do in the second phase by getting hit by his tail swipe and then attacking from there to get in some damage in between offensive phases, but it's clearly not exactly intended. The RC with Pegasus is kinda cool, but it goes on a bit too long. A brief cutscene wraps up the story thus far and we get to the keyhole and move on. So Olympus Coliseum has much better showing. Sora and company have good interactions with the Disney characters present. The story has some amount of plot relevance with Demix showing up. While it's not pivotal by any means, we are getting to know a villain and that villain's goals are shrouded to us, encouraging the player to question why he's here and what his plan is. Pete's presence here, and in many of the Disney worlds also, acts as a through line which gives them some level of connection to each other and the overarching plot. Orin is a cool addition of a Final Fantasy character. He serves the same purpose basically as Cloud, but is instead belligerent to Hades in a hilarious way. As for the plot itself, it's cool that we actually do get tricked into unlocking the Underdrome, although the cutscenes in this first pass don't make it extremely obvious that it even happened. This ties to the second pass story in a pretty satisfying way and gives Hades more viability as a villain. The location is engaging and fresh, and the story is actually pretty good, so it's a good improvement from some examples we've seen in the past. I like that the world restricts your abilities for most of its runtime, but not so far as to make things tedious or annoying. A few gameplay mechanics are also introduced here that will be coming back later, which is cool. Finally, let's look at the first pass of Halloween Town. It takes place in the titular town, but this time expands out into Christmas Town as well. Christmas Town is tiny, but it's nicely rendered and plenty goes on there that it feels valuable. Before landing, we see Jack finding the door to Christmas Town. Then, when we see him momentarily, he's constructed a landing pad and a sleigh with a barrel presumably full to bursting with presents. Jack wants to do Christmas this year, but needs Santa's blessing. Santa also needs a bodyguard from all these Heartless, and so Sora and Co. are contracted to do just that. Maleficent appears and begins working with Locke, Shock, and Barrel. She revives Oogie Boogie, who starts out seeming a little woozy, but quickly gets some pep back in his step. Meanwhile, we make it to Christmas Town, where this adorable scene plays out between Santa and the team. Your name? Um, Sora, sir. Let's see, Sora, here you are. Well, according to my list, Sora, seven years ago, you told everyone you did not believe in Santa Claus. Oh, that is unfortunate. Uh. How about that Am I on your list too, by any chance? It's me, Jack. Jack Skellington? Oh. It's Luck, Chuck, and Barrel. Next, we have to track the footprints back to where the kids went. When we find them, Maleficent and Oogie escape, leaving us with the Prison Keeper to deal with. Prison Keeper is a cool fight. He has three attack styles that he can switch between at certain HP thresholds, one for each of the kids. They're simple, generally only having a single attack per style, but he switches often enough that it stays interesting. One form sees him launching fireballs at you, which can be parried to launch them back and will stun the Prison Keeper if they make contact. Another sees him trying to bite Sora, which can be blocked to open him up for combos. The last sees him lift up in the air and shoot magic down to the ground. Jumping from the hill, it's possible to get at him from above his onslaught. When he first goes to switch, you have the opportunity to use the RC to open him up for a couple of more free combos before the fight moves on. Toward the end of the fight, his final form allows him to switch between all three at will. He's not particularly tough, but it can take some practice to learn how to respond to each move properly. While we do that, Oogie was busy kidnapping Santa. As we travel back to Christmas Town to rescue him, we get some scenes of Maleficent and Oogie and their interesting work relationship. Hmm. Oh. Clumsy oaf! 
Are you still here? Why don't you boogie on back where you came from? You're crapping my style! Have you already forgotten who brought you back, you insolent bag of bugs? Mm, sorry, can't remember a thing. Very well, you ingrate. You'll rue the day you spurned my help. <laughs> then we confront Oogie directly. Oogie's fight in this one is more balanced in the sense that it was pretty easy to perform so well in the first one that he basically never got to attack. This time around is a little more complicated. We stand on these constantly moving conveyor belts and have to launch presents into Oogie's bay in order to bring him down so we can attack him directly. While doing that, Oogie has a few attacks he will launch at us. The most common and most deadly is the fist that punches down from above in predetermined intervals. This attack is a one-hit KO on level 1 crit mode, which is, as you can imagine, extremely punishing. He will also occasionally toss a bomb down at the player. Third, he will send Heartless after you. Finally, on the last phase, he can use this lightning attack which goes off to the sides of the conveyor belt, convenient because that's often where the presence will be. He will also switch between the three conveyor belts periodically, forcing you to go to the front of the conveyor belt and time your RC so you go to the correct one. The conveyor belts also start moving faster after each phase. By the end, it gets surprisingly difficult to dodge certain attacks. Thankfully, all these moves Oogie can do are telegraphed with a sound. <laughs> This way, the attacks never come out of nowhere and are always dodgeable if you're capable enough to do so. He's surprisingly well designed in spite of his purely gimmick boss status. Interesting that Oogie hasn't had a straight one-on-one -on -one fight so far, it's always some sort of gimmick. After Oogie is defeated, Santa tells Jack to stick to Halloween, and the keyhole is in Jack's Santa suit. What this world does really well is exploring characters with this setting. Wow. Well, hello everyone. Did you come to see if you're on my nice list? Sora and Santa is the easiest example to point to. Sora getting so excited can remind us that he's still pretty young, and in all honesty, he had a lot of his childhood stolen from him when he had to go on his first adventure. So it's really nice to see Sora getting to act like a kid. We also get some nice details about Riku from this as well, which is a great touch. We better get going. Before you do, Sora, I believe there's a friend of yours who, if I recall correctly, was the one who told you there's no such thing as Santa Claus? Oh yeah, he did say that. Be sure to give him my very best wishes. I will, but do you know where I can find Riku? No, but don't give up. Remember, if you believe in Riku, you will find him, just as you found me. Right. Maleficent is also seen being an active player, even more so than she was most of the time in Kingdom Hearts 1. While I don't love everything they did with her in this game, getting to see the villains actively pursuing their goals is great. Her bickering with Oogie is hilarious and makes sense given their characters. They have a very familiar nature to their relationship now, like old pals picking up where they left off, which makes sense and is important for making Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 feel like they are in the same canon. Finally, Halloween Town spends most of its runtime exploring the Kingdom Hearts relevant characters, rather than exploring the story of Halloween Town itself, which is exactly what I'm looking for. It's got some solid bosses and some decent mob fights throughout that keep it engaging. One of the enemies introduced here, the Toy Soldier, is one of the most complex in the game, having two different versions depending on if it's in Christmas Town or Halloween Town, each with some difficult attacks to deal with. It's a strong showing in both story and gameplay design. It's about time we moved on from the Disney Worlds for now, but I do want to give one dishonorable mention to Pride Lands. Firstly, you are transformed into a lion for the entirety of this world, and while this transformation doesn't play as poorly as the mermaid transformation from Kingdom Hearts 1, it's still questionable at best. You have no drive forms, no summons, only one limit, and almost none of your usual defensive options. In fact, Lion Sora gets his own ability page during this world. Reflect can cover for the lack of defensive options, but it still just begs the question of why they would do this at all. The story in this world is pretty lackluster too, but I'm not going to dwell on it too much. However, you do have to see how cursed Lion Pete is. What is that? What the f On the positive side, Pride Lands is the only world in the game that is completely optional, so you don't even have to complete it to beat the game. Lion Sora also has an ability to move while casting magic, which always feels great. That's about all I can say positively about this world though. Anyway, let's start talking about the gameplay. 
So the gameplay of this game is largely the same as the first one, just with a number of additions and modifications, as well as a few subtractions. Let's start with the section I feel is most improved, the movement. Sora feels significantly better to move around. There is a slight movement speed increase during combat, which feels great while retaining accuracy in exploration. The jump feels much better, even its default version is pretty good. When discussing the interviews earlier, I mentioned that the devs paired the sections of the game back from battle, move, and event down to just event and real time. So let's now discuss what that means. KH1 was split into three distinct sections, generic battles, platforming and exploration, and events such as bosses or required heartless fights. I argued that the platforming was weak due to poor movement in that game. It's also now abundantly obvious to me that kh one sections basically never overlapped. KH2 now only has two modes, real time, which would be all generic battles and exploration, and event, which would be required battles and bosses, as well as some other things like required minigames. An easy way to tell the difference is that events are designated by the information box popping up at the top left most of the time. This also shows a difference in focus. Move no longer gets its own phase, and so platforming has significantly less importance. This is a positive change for the most part, although there is an argument to be made that the movement in this game would facilitate interesting platforming much better, and so perhaps the mechanic should have been iterated upon instead of scrapped. That argument is best supported with the Cavern of Remembrance, which was added in the Final Mix version, and requires some pretty tricky use of the growth abilities in order to get to the end. It's fun, and there's even some sections that require platforming while fending off enemies. Yeah, it's good, and it's kind of a shame that this was the only platforming gauntlet we got in the game with the movement system so ripe with potential. The movement discussion isn't all sunshine though, I do have some issues. You see, the drive forms introduced in this game can also be leveled, and doing so unlocks what the game calls growth abilities, which increase Sora's movement potential. There's high jump, which increases the height of your jump, aerial dodge, which gives you a second jump that is capable of parrying attacks and has iframes, quick run, which moves you quickly along the ground or in the air if used from a standing position off a ledge, and has iframes for the majority of its time, and Glide, which is just like Glide from the first game. These are great in a bubble because they greatly increase Sora's defensive options. Aerial Dodge is even a rare case in which Sora gets an in-air defensive option that has a lot of utility. Here's my problems. First of all, and least important, grinding the drive forms is exceptionally tedious. Each one has a different process by which they level. For one, you have to defeat a certain amount of Heartless while in the form. For another, you just have to strike enemies a certain amount of times while in the form. Regardless, they always feel like they take too much time to level. My second problem is that the game was so easy when it first released that players weren't incentivized to even use these drive forms, meaning it was unlikely that they would discover the growth abilities or how valuable they can be. Finally, since they were completely optional, the devs couldn't guarantee that players would ever get them, and therefore could not build challenges off their use. Considering how well done these growth abilities are, this is a complete shame. Also. No dodge roll? Really? What the heck even is Quick Run? Dodge roll was eventually included in the final mix version, but why not in the original release? Quick Run is not a good alternative because of the animation lag as it ends, which leaves you very open to attacks and, even if you don't get hit by anything, it makes it difficult to punish enemies. With the inclusion of dodge roll, Quick Run now serves a purpose as being purely about escaping attacks in a much safer manner than dodge roll typically provides, so they work well together, but Quick Run couldn't hold a candle to dodge roll's usefulness. Questionable decisions aside, though, the movement system is much improved from KH1, but perhaps underutilized for most of it. Next, let's discuss combat. The magic system has seen a complete overhaul, and thankfully for me, it's much easier to explain now. This time around, Sora has a set amount of MP that doesn't recover through attacking. You cast spells to consume it, and then once your MP is gone, you enter MP charge mode, in which this pink gauge appears in place of the blue one from before. Now you just wait for it to deplete, and you get all your MP back. All spells have a certain amount of MP they consume, with the exception of Cure, which consumes all your remaining MP, forcing you into MP charge every time you use it. This is a much better system because it effectively nerfs Cure, so it is now in balance with healing items, each having their use cases. It also nerfs Leaf Bracer to the point it is now significantly more balanced, as it's only usable once in a while. Spells in general are less spammable and need to be used smartly in order to get good value out of the more limited MP system. It is possible to circumvent the system's limitations with either Ether or Elixir spam, We'll just call that your reward for farming those items, since that's actually fairly difficult to accomplish. Most of the spells have been reworked completely. Fire now covers a circle in close proximity to Sora, making it great for crowd-controlling swarming enemies. 
blizzard fires off in a straight line and is only one projectile, but it can pierce through enemies now. Thunder is the same basic thing, except it only calls down one lightning bolt, but it casts much faster now. Cure can't select different targets anymore. Instead, it now has a circular field which appears when cast, and any party members in that field receive the cure as well. Gravity, Stop, and Arrow all went the way of the Dodo. They have been replaced by two new spells. Reflect creates a protective shield around Sora, which deflects all attacks, even otherwise unblockable ones, and returns damage by producing a damage field around Sora if anything hits the shield. Finally, Magnet creates a sphere above Sora that pulls enemies in, dealing damage and stunning them for a while. The differences between some of the spells and their original counterparts are obvious, while some are fairly subtle, but they each have more use cases now, rather than having situations like fire being basically always outplayed by Blizzard, like in KH1. Basic attacks and combos work the same as they did in KH1. 3-hit combo with the first two being interchangeable based on enemy proximity, followed by a combo finisher which can also change depending on situation and enemy proximity. Sora has more varied moves, even from the start, that he can choose from. Many more abilities augment these combos, and many of them are rewarded in get bonuses. Combos have also been expanded because magic now contributes to your combo. Magic finishers even deal slightly more damage, just like physical combo finishers. This means magic can even be sequenced into combos in a more meaningful way than before, and it allows for more creativity with combos and more fluid movement between magic and physical attacks. The exceptions to this rule are Cure and Magnet, which function as combo finishers and will end your combos early if used in the middle of them. All of these changes give magic much more prominence in basically all situations, and it's easier to justify switching between physical and magic, regardless of your specialization. Items remain largely unchanged from KH1, but now have the addition of the auto-reload mechanic, which automatically takes items out of your stock and into your equipment after each battle, if you use them. This is a nice addition that reduces the need for menuing, something I see as a plus generally. Ethers restore all of your MP if used prior to MP charge, but only half of your MP charge bar. This is a great choice because it gives Ethers some real power, but doesn't make Cure much more spammable than it already is. Elixirs restore all HP and MP regardless of MP charge status, but they are also very expensive and hard to come by. Potions also restore percentages of HP rather than set values, basic potions at 40% and high potions to 60%, so they retain their usefulness throughout the playthrough. These changes to the items are very well thought out and encourage their use for the duration of a playthrough, especially since Cure is no longer as valuable. Next, let's detail the Dry Forms and their uses. First, we get Valor Form. Valor Form consumes three bars of the Drive Gauge and Goofy. It's based on physical combos and magic is completely turned off during its use. Its combos are long and full of lots of individual hits. It also has a special ability that allows you to hit the square button during a combo to go straight to the finisher. Blocking, as well as any growth abilities you've acquired, are turned off for this form. Which is also true for every form except the Limit Form, which retains Sora's Guard ability. Valor governs the High Jump growth ability, and levels it with each strike you land on an enemy. Valor Form has its uses, especially since you can skip straight to combo finishers to easily stagger otherwise tough to stagger enemies. It loses usefulness pretty quickly, as the lack of defensive options and relatively rigid combos mean it's easy to get punished during its use. Wisdom Form consumes three bars of the Drive Gauge and Donald. It is the first Drive Form that boasts free movement during ability, so regardless of what attacks or spells you use, you can keep dodging attacks and staying out of punish range of your enemies. This one has a strong spell focus, and there are no physical combos. Instead, Sora shoots little magic bullets out of his keyblade in a combo, complete with a more intense finisher, which usually results in your target getting knocked hilariously into the air. Every spell is augmented in some way, so they don't cast the same way they do when not in Wisdom. As a quick example, Reflect isn't chainable and has some pretty ugly end lag on the animation. Wisdom governs the Quick Run Growth ability and is leveled with the number of Heartless killed while in Wisdom form. Wisdom has its use cases, but it's probably my least used form overall. The speed at which most of your spells cast means you'll be running out of MP quickly, and then all you're left with is Sora's Dinky Pea Shooter, please don't demonetize this video, that came out wrong, that just doesn't do enough damage to justify the time and spent in MP recharge. Bosses that are susceptible to magic, like the Grim Reaper from Port Royale, will exhibit Wisdom Form's best qualities, but overall I'd say it's underwhelming. Limit Form, which was added in Final Mix, consumes four bars and is the only drive that can be used alone and doesn't consume a party member. Physical combos are based on Sora's KH1 moveset, and magic is turned off, replaced with four limits from KH1, which consume half your MP bar each. 
Ars Arcanum, Sonic Blade, Strike Raid, and Ragnarok all make an appearance, and each has its uses. Limits restore HP on successful hits and have iframes, although they aren't consistent throughout the whole attack and enemies can still find opportunities to punish through them. Each limit also has an RC attached to it in order to get full damage out of it. Limit governs the dodge roll growth ability, and levels with limit finishers used during battle. Limit is a great panic form because it's literally always usable after acquiring it. It's also very capable of dealing damage, both with limits and its basic combos, which have surprising damage output. Limit Form's guard is also more spammable, making it a great defensive option as well. This one stays relevant the whole game, and it governs the best growth ability, of course. Master Form consumes four bars of the Drive Gauge and both of your party members, regardless of who they are. It is the first form which can use both physical combos and spells, and it excels at both. Its combos are crazy, with tons of damage zones all over the place as Sora spins and slashes both of the Keyblades in wild formations. The finishers for the combos are equally crazy, and notably, it doesn't have a ground combo because the first attack just automatically pops Sora into the air. Magic is augmented even more than in Wisdom form, usually changing how Sora moves during the attack. Sora's free Keyblade, that being the one he controls through telekinesis, will also usually spin in some pattern around him during a spell, dealing extra chip damage to nearby enemies. Master Form governs aerial dodge and levels by picking up drive orbs. This form is why I say Wisdom is only probably my least used. Master comes in a close second if it doesn't beat it. While the attacks are really cool and the augmentation on magic is neat, it feels very rigid and its combos take too long to complete to be useful in most cases. In fact, the augmentation on magic is also a pretty strong divisive element that makes me avoid using it very often, as it makes magic more difficult to control rather than just making it more useful or more powerful. In basically any situation in which you need a drive form, either Valor or Wisdom can usually do the job better, and for less drive gauge cost to boot. Or you could go into limit and retain your party members on top of having a more useful combo moveset. Final form consumes 5 bars of the drive gauge and both of your party members. It's not unlocked like the other forms, instead being unlocked by using one of the other forms during certain boss fights, which gives you a chance at randomly getting Final Form. Once you get it, you then have to beat the boss to unlock it permanently. It boasts free movement during abilities, an even better version than Wisdom's in fact, because magic doesn't lock you up quite as much as some spells do in Wisdom form. Combos are at their most complex, but don't take forever to complete, usually getting to the finisher pretty quickly. Magic is augmented somewhat, though not as heavily as Master Form, and both Keyblades continue to strike nearby enemies during spells. Final Form governs the Glide growth ability, and levels with nobodies killed. Final Form is, while easily the most powerful of the Drive Forms, not always the most useful. Its combos can be a bit unwieldy compared to other Drive Forms, and it's the most expensive of the forms, making it a big investment when it might lock you out of using other forms later if you need them. It is the only form that, even at the maximum Drive Gauge of 9, cannot be used twice in a row, and in many of the most challenging situations, its power doesn't justify the cost. There's one more form that goes unlisted in your drives menu, and that's anti-form. It's not pickable, it actually happens based on a hidden counter. Your anti-points increase with each Valor, Wisdom, Master, or Limit form used by one point, and certain situations, like fights with the organization, multiply your chance to get anti-form. The chance caps out at 25% at 10 points or more. Final form reduces the point value by 10, and getting anti-form reduces it by 5. According to Nomura, Antiform was meant to be a punishment for overuse of the drive system, and it's supposed to be strong but troublesome. You can't use magic or items, both your party members are consumed, and you can't manually revert from the form during battle. You also can't heal, not only because items and magic are locked, but you can't even pick up any HP orbs that should drop. Landing attacks will cause the drive gauge to deplete more quickly, as well as picking up drive orbs, meaning offense is the best way to get out of the form if activated during a fight. Its attacks are incredibly complex and long, many lasting longer than you'd think with just a single button press. It has no defensive options beyond basic movement and jumping, but it does have a unique growth ability called Anti-Glide, which can be used to quickly hone in on enemies from a distance. It can't be leveled, and Anti-Glide can't be acquired outside of this form. It consumes all of your remaining drive gauge bars when used. While it is technically a punishment, Anti-Form has some use cases in which it is valuable. It doesn't deal physical damage, instead dealing a combination of neutral, like reflect, and dark type damage, meaning enemies such as large bodies and fat bodies can be attacked even from the front while in this form. 
Each individual attack it deals is pretty weak, but they come at such a quick pace that it's possible to rack up a lot of damage over a combo. Its quick movement speed makes it possible to dodge attacks fairly easily too. However, because of the length of its attacks, enemies that can break out of your combos have a good chance to punish you, since none of your attacks are cancelable once started. I've got some footage of Anti-Form coming in clutch, and I've got just as much if not more footage of Anti-Form getting me killed, so it definitely functions as a punishment for overusing drives despite its strengths. I love that they didn't just make it impossible to use, instead giving it some value in certain situations. For ease of discussion, Sora's base form is called Standard Form. When switching from Standard Form to another, Sora immediately becomes invulnerable, blasting away nearby enemies. Your HP and MP both get fully restored when switching into forms, and they can be cancelled at any time, barring anti-form, obviously. So the limiting factor in this mechanic's balance is the drive gauge, so let's talk about that. The drive gauge restores slowly anytime you strike enemies or get struck by enemies. It restores more quickly during MP charge, encouraging a flow to battle where you use your MP and then switch back to physical attacks in order to charge the drive gauge more effectively. To give some context, the drive gauge charges fast enough off strikes that it's entirely possible to fully charge it over the course of a single fight. This is going to depend on the abilities you have equipped, it starts out charging much slower until you unlock some drive boost abilities. They also increased the speed it charges in the final mix version, implying they wanted people to be able to use them more often. As drives level up, they last longer, starting at 3 bars and lasting all the way up to 9 at max. In spite of this, they always cost the same to change to. For example, Valor always consumes 3 bars, and Final always consumes 5 bars, regardless of what level they are or how long they last. This gives weaker forms more usefulness, since they can almost be used as a panic heal due to their low cost. Many harder bosses don't allow this though, due to party members being absent. In spite of their immense strength, drive forms are well balanced in this game, due to the use of high risk and high reward. While your power is increased from your base level in every one of these forms, you become much more vulnerable. Whether that be because the form uses long sweeping attacks which give enemies lots of opportunities to punish you, or because the form lacks key defensive options available to standard form. Keep in mind that this is only true in critical mode. We'll discuss this game's balance at initial release later, as I've said. Despite their strength, there are many situations in which standard form still shines above them because it is the only form that gets all growth abilities and all defensive options. It's an honestly surprising amount of depth in a system that could have easily just become charge gauge and use drive form to win. Up next, let's talk summons. This time around, summons were given much more utility, most of them having multiple phases and use cases that actually justify their existence, and none of them lock you into a different fighting style, allowing Sora to continue attacking independently of the summon if he chooses. Each consumes all party members, uses three bars of the drive gauge, and can be cancelled at any time. Summons can also be leveled, increasing their summon gauge, which therein increases the time they stick around as well as how many of their special limits you can use before they go away. Chicken Little is the first you acquire and he has a good defensive utility. He will occasionally whistle, calling enemies towards Sora and stunning them in a similar fashion to Magnet. He can also restore 40% of Sora's HP, and Sora's Keyblade Strikes restore a small amount of HP on their own. As you can imagine, this makes him great to use against mob fights, as getting free Magnets and HP periodically is a great value for 3 drive bars. His limit, FPS mode, is an optional offensive mode you can enter where the camera goes first person and you can launch exploding firecrackers and baseballs at enemies. This mode is utterly worthless, an absolute waste of drive gauge as it consumes three of your summon bars, immediately ending it in early levels. Next we get our old pal Genie once again. Genie's only function while Sora attacks normally is to restore his HP if it gets low. However, he has four limits he can use, based roughly on Sora's drive forms, minus limit form. The drive question mark command will switch which one you have equipped, followed by the bottom command in the menu changing to the relevant limit. Valor Form's Sonic Rave performs four wide sweeping physical attacks which easily stagger enemies, dealing a good amount of damage. Wisdom's Strike Judgment sends a bunch of magic bullets at enemies. Master's Final Arcana is similar but is more focused on AoE rather than single target damage. Finals Infinity performs a collection of strikes which you can move during, allowing you to seek out the best targets. Then it finishes with a large AoE blast, dealing a ton of damage to basically every enemy in the area. While it seems like Infinity would be the best, they actually each have their own use cases, barring Strike Judgment which just doesn't do as much damage as the others. Genie is really good for crowd control and taking out mob fights quickly and easily, but isn't so good at bosses. 
Also, it should be noted that each limit used takes up a significant amount of the summon gauge, usually ending the summon after a single use at low summon levels. Next is Stitch. Stitch doesn't physically enter the battlefield, instead choosing to crawl around on the camera, essentially, which is where he performs his actions from. If HP or MP get low, he will restore them. He will also deflect oncoming enemy projectiles and even basic attacks, blocking them with his blaster. He can also use his ukulele to stun enemies for a time. This makes him incredibly effective against enemies that use projectiles as well as bosses that do so. Not to mention, his ability to refill HP and MP is very valuable, easily justifying its cost on its own. I have footage of Stitch neutering bosses even at level 1. His limit, Ohana, sees Sora jump onto the screen and attack using the Keyblade as a guitar while Stitch plays the ukulele, dropping prizes and dealing damage. Just like FPS mode with Chicken Little, this limit is basically worthless. Finally, we get Peter Pan. Peter Pan flies around with Sora, usually attacking enemies that Sora attacks. Tinkerbell also joins the summon, consistently healing Sora and reviving him if he gets knocked out. His limit, Neverland, sees Sora fly alongside Peter, attacking while showing images of their past encounters, all the while drawing enemies near, similar to Magnet. Peter is probably the least useful of the bunch, in my opinion, due to his lack of utility. His attacks aren't anything to write home about, and his limit is just as useless as the others. Tinkerbell is a valuable asset, of course, but other summons are capable of the same thing now, so that previously unique property of hers is now less so. Summons, generally speaking, don't justify their price compared to dry forms. While there are certainly situations where they shine, they don't last long enough at low levels to be as valuable. They also typically only perform well in a utility sense, which is often not as useful as increasing damage dealt in order to end fights more quickly. However, their design is much better than Cage 1, bringing some actual value to their use and giving most of them situations in which they shine. Now let's talk about limits. We've already mentioned the ones possessed by summons, but there are many more. Each party member has at least one, two in the case of Donald and Goofy. They are powerful, flashy moves that consume all your remaining MP. They give permanent iframes for the duration and combination of triangle, and the first command on the menu is used to perform the actions. The only exception to this rule is Donald's limits, which allow Sora to move and attack freely during them though he still has permanent iframes, and the limit is progressed solely through the triangle button. In order to use them, the party member must have the relevant ability equipped, and it must be selected from the limit command. Each party member also has the auto limit ability, which, when equipped, will populate the triangle button with their limit if conditions are met to perform it and no other RCs are taking up that slot. Strength-wise, they differ. Some of them are pretty powerful, usually this is the case mainly in mob fights, but some can even damage bosses well. Others are less so, failing to justify their MP cost. The grand prize goes to Donald's limits, which as I said, allow you to continue to move and attack while performing them. Considering how long they last, this is a pretty substantial amount of time to be able to attack freely. There is some skill involved with getting the most out of them, making sure to time triangle presses so the limit continues for as long as possible, but these are the closest we've seen a mechanic come to broken this far. We'll talk more about broken mechanics later though. Our party members have seen a bit of an overhaul as well. They are more customizable this time around. Just as a reminder, in the first you could set their general behavior but couldn't completely control what they did and when. Now we can turn off abilities wholesale, so if, for example, you want Donald to only use Cure, he will only use Cure and basic attacks. For each of these active abilities we can also toggle them between four different states. Often, Uncommon, Rare, and of course, Off Entirely. If you, just for sake of argument, want Donald to only use Cure and not even attack using basic attacks, that's where the attack style you choose comes in. There are a number of options here, each customizing how the party member behaves with the enemies. Relentless attack will see them attacking, well, relentlessly, finding new targets as soon as the old one goes down. Sora attack will keep them around Sora, typically not attacking enemies directly. The other options cover a decent amount of the spectrum between these options, though relentless attack is usually the one I stick with. I largely prefer what they did here over the less granular control you had in KH1. Now as for how they perform, I find that the party members tend to have more utility than they used to. Whereas party members in the first game tend to be more focused on raw damage, this time around it seems like Donald and Goofy's abilities are aimed toward keeping them relevant in other ways. Cure is obvious, but less so is Goofy Tornado, which sees Goofy spin around and fly toward enemies, usually stunning them almost like a moving magnet. The MP cost for this is pretty low, meaning Goofy can use it often to soften the effects of large groups. Other party members, even when they aren't particularly useful, have their benefits as well. It's now easier, and by that I mean possible, to swap out party members during battle using the party command in the menu, as long as said party member is alive. 
This presents some valuable strategies. For example, let's say you know you want to incorporate Wisdom Form into your strategy for a particular boss. Donald has a habit of dying in this game, because of course he does, and so you may choose to keep him pocketed until you want to use Wisdom Form. Use the party menu to switch out one of your party members for Donald, and then quickly go into Wisdom Form before he can get sniped. While this requires quite a bit of menuing, it's a valuable tactic to have in your utility belt. All that being said, the world-specific party members can still provide some value. They basically all have some sort of merit to them, even if it isn't ground shaking. So that's all the basic mechanics run over, so how about UI and menus next? Starting with the most ubiquitous, the command menu, which has seen some expansion in the most literal sense of the term. There are now two pages to the command menu, swapped between using the left button on the D-pad. The first is familiar, attack, magic, item, and then adds drive to the bottom, which, in the original release of KH1, was populated by situational things like treasure chests and talking. Then the second page, attack is at the top of this one too, but then there's summon, party, and limit, all of which are pretty self-explanatory. While I still think that my control revision for KH1 would have been effective, the number of mechanics in this one actually do a good job of justifying the command menu, and I can't think of a better way to handle this many mechanics beyond making the game real-time with pause, which would be lame. Instead, the player is now greatly incentivized for getting used to the command menu and using it well by allowing them to switch between many mechanics quickly, all while the battle continues on. It's admittedly tough to get the hang of, but it's highly rewarding and still unique in the greater gaming landscape. The shortcut menu has had a couple changes. First, you can now put shortcuts on the circle button. I suppose it was originally left out so you could still jump while having the shortcut button held down, but it just comes off as a little silly when you can always just jump and then press the shortcut button plus whatever button you want. This gives the shortcut menu just a little bit more versatility that I feel like it needed. If one command is taken up by Cure, there are rarely situations in which more than three other spells would be valuable at such ease of access, and if they truly are, the magic command is always there for those capable enough to use it. On top of this, you can now assign items to the shortcut menu. This is really great because it continues to give items more value over their KH1 counterpart, encouraging their use alongside Cure, especially ethers which can help to circumvent some of the more difficult to deal with limitations of the magic system. These two simple changes were enough to bring the shortcut menu into its fullest potential in my eyes. In KH1, it just felt a little bit limited, but now it can do basically everything I need it to. A small addition to the UI this time around is the mini-map, which sits up at the top right of the screen after collecting the map of the area. Despite its inclusion, there are still no waypoints or anything, and the mini-map only really shows topography and where the loading breaks are for the next zone. I hardly ever notice it, honestly. It's small enough that it isn't intrusive in spite of its relative uselessness. Perhaps someone completely new to the game would find it useful to show some of the more esoteric loading breaks, but the game actually does a good job of telegraphing these most of the time in the level design, so eh. Let's talk about the pause menu, which is, given that this is an RPG, a pretty vital part of the experience. I didn't give it its own section in the KH1 video, but I did bring it up in different sections, but let's see how it's evolved. The item and equipment sections are now combined, making equipping armor, items, accessories, and keyblades simpler. While we're here, I would like to say that the keychains are better balanced in this game overall. Early on, the keychains are designed in such a way to where you might not want to switch to every one you get. It's going to depend more on your playstyle and what matters to you. Later on, one particular keyblade seems to set itself apart, the Decisive Pumpkin, because of its combo boost ability, which greatly increases increases overall damage for ground combos. Even then, the Hero's Crest competes well with it depending on the boss and whether you'll be using ground or air combos primarily. The Ultima weapon in this game is also more useful overall than its KH1 counterpart, its MP Hastiga ability greatly reducing MP charge times. Different playstyles definitely encourage use of the different keyblades, even at endgame, which is pretty cool. Each drive form that uses two keyblades has a keychain selection of its own here as well. Abilities now allow you to press triangle to equip or unequip them, making ability menuing simpler and easier. They also did a good job of color coding and organizing the abilities so that they would be easier to navigate through. Each drive form has an ability pane, and reading these can reveal useful mechanics the game won't otherwise tell you, such as pressing square to go to combo finishers in Valor form. Customize is where you customize party fighting styles and the shortcut menu. One valuable addition is that this game allows you to select which spells you want to set as safe, meaning they won't trigger MP charge. This will obviously lock you out of using them if you don't have enough MP, but it will keep you from accidentally spamming a spell into MP charge, which will lock you out of cure for a while. Notably, if a spell or limit is going to trigger MP charge when cast, its name will turn yellow in the command menu, which is a nice quality of life touch. 
The party menu lets you switch out party members, kind of superfluous now, but it's whatever. Status shows you the stats of everyone in the party as well as drive forms and summons, and also shows you how to level up your drive forms and summons. This is the only way to get this information as far as I can tell, and that's a bit of a shame for obvious reasons. The journal is the same idea as KH1, with story recaps, character bios, enemy dossiers, and completion goals such as treasure chests collected for each world. There's a new important addition this time around. On the first page of the journal for each world, there was a small sentence hinting at what you're supposed to be doing, fixing an issue I had with the first game. It's not so much to make it terrible obvious, and it is slightly hidden in the journal, which I'm sure a lot of players don't use, but it's still a great addition. I'll talk more about this later though. For now, just know that steps were taken to keep players on the right track, and I think this is a good move. Overall, menuing in both the pause menu and the command menu were improved in this iteration. It's snappy and responsive, and everything is laid out in a more logical way. Lots of quality of life improvements were implemented to make the menuing less tedious and even to reduce the time spent menuing, which is good. This is an element that has seen great improvement from its predecessor. How about the controls? Have they improved? X square and circle all function the same as they did in KH1. Now, a short tap on square will give a dodge roll, and a long tap will give a quick run. This is sometimes a bit unwieldy and has gotten me killed by some bosses, but it's not generally an issue. Triangle is now the reaction command button, which was added to KH1 in the 1.5 re-release. This performs everything from talking, chests, and contextual examinations, to reaction commands and auto abilities like auto limit. Drive forms and summons also get an auto ability function just like auto limit that functions the same. There are definitely times where, with a lot of these things equipped, the auto abilities and contextual reaction commands can sort of stumble over each other, or situations such as a reaction command going away right as you press the triangle button resulting in using an auto ability and wasting the relevant resource can happen. This is why I typically leave auto abilities off. The camera is better overall in this one as compared to the original release of KH1. Players may notice the camera is more zoomed out this time around, giving a much better view of the battlefield. This is particularly useful because the number of enemies in each mob fight is usually higher than those of KH1, so more situational awareness is a necessity. Now that enemies are more aggressive too, this reduces the chances of getting sniped from off camera as well. R1 is your target lock-on, and in one of the few negative changes to the controls, there is now no way to quickly swap lock-on targets. Changing targets now necessitates a tedious game of removing your lock-on and moving around until the target you want is soft-locked, then hitting the lock-on button. This often results in me not using the lock-on function in many mob fights. It's kind of a bummer. R2 does different things depending on what mode the camera is set to, and I don't know that I've ever actually pressed it during gameplay. Holding L2 will change the right stick from camera controls to controlling the D-pad, which I never use, but more options is always better. That being said, considering R2 and L2's functions are both kind of useless or redundant, at least one of them could have been devoted to swapping lock-on targets. L1 pops up the shortcut menu. Start opens up the start menu and pauses the game during combat. And finally, select goes into first person mode. To end this gameplay overview on a humorous note, you can play the whole game in first person mode should you desire to do so. And the gamer's joint has beaten the whole game in first person, which is impressive if not completely ridiculous. I'll link the video in the description. Once you've completed the first pass of every Disney World, minus Pride Lands of course, Twilight Town becomes available again. Going there will end up running into Syax, who claims some outlandish things. It would break our hearts to hear something happen to you. Hearts? You don't have any hearts! True, we don't have hearts. But, we remember what it was like. That's what makes us special. What do you mean? We know very well how to injure a heart. Sora, you just keep on fighting those heartless. Let's jump in after him. How come? I'm not sure, but maybe he'll lead us to the organization's world. Don't be reckless. Do you want to end up like Riku? What? After that, Pence asks if we know a Kairi, and we see a scene of her being taken by Axel. Then we continue on to Hollow Bastion, which seems to be very much full of heartless and nobodies right now. As we head to Merlin's house, we see and talk to Cloud momentarily. We learn that the Final Fantasy gang discovered Ansem's computer, and so we head that way. We find Ansem's study, which looks like it's been ransacked, with notes written along the walls and a large painting of the man himself, Ansem. After a moment, Leon joins us and shows us the way deeper into the study, where Ansem's computer is. We try to use it, but our intrepid heroes aren't incredibly tech-savvy and the computer rebels, pulling us into its data. 
This is where Space Paranoids is. We get locked up by this guy, and then we meet Tron and learn a little bit about this world. We break out of prison and go to repair the power core so we can leave. There's a brief scene detailing the MCP's motives and his relationship to Sark. We go to leave Space Paranoids, and Tron asks us to find the password to the DTD because he wants to overthrow the MCP. We'll need to find Ansem to get it. Tron strangely calls him Ansem the Wise, though. Back in Hollow Bastion, we begin looking around for clues for the password. Behind Ansem's painting is a drawing which reveals that DTD stands for Door to Darkness, but that doesn't help us with the password. Then the king appears. He thinks the password might be the Seven Princesses of Heart. Mickey says that he has some explaining to do regarding Ansem, and gives us master form prior to us going back into the datascape to get the password to Tron. Upon getting there, we wind up in the game grid, where we have to do the light cycle minigame. It functions basically like rock, paper, scissors. You have three abilities and each counters one of the others. Enemies will have one of the abilities depending on their color, with the exception of the white ones which can use all the abilities. It's fine, but it's kind of boring for the most part. We escape the game grid through a hole in the wall and find our way to Tron. We make our way to the computer where we can enter the password, and the seven princesses ends up working. Although there is another security protocol in place. We have to collect these orbs the enemies drop in order to unlock the freeze RC for each of the three computers. The theme of picking up orbs just keeps coming back. Unfortunately, the MCP takes full access once the unlocking process is complete. And so we make our way to the IO tower to enable Tron to pause the MCP's takeover. As Tron does his work, a hostile program comes to put a stop to our process, which we then go to fight. This boss, literally called Hostile Program, is pretty good actually. Just like the security protocol minigame, we earn orbs by hitting the boss, and then we can freeze him in place to deal a bunch of damage. Otherwise, he moves around the arena pretty quickly, so not much damage is going to be dealt during this phase. His first phase sees him launching these slow-moving projectiles at you. While they are easy to deal with on their own, it can be tough to find safe windows to attack during this phase. The second phase introduces lasers that he shoots across the battlefield. Dodging these is fun and enables more opportunities to attack. His final phase is sort of like a desperation move. He goes into the center of the arena and performs a much more complicated volley of lasers that the player must dodge. Alternatively, the player can also just freeze the boss during this phase, which is kind of lame. It's a bit weird to actually advocate for a required waiting section in a boss, but this move is so fun to dodge that I don't think it would make the boss lesser if he was invincible during it, forcing you to learn it and dodge it. Regardless, he's a solid boss with lots of mechanics that are typically fun to deal with. Tron talks to us about Ansem before we leave and gives us the new password to the computer. We head back to Hollow Bastion and use the computer. While it doesn't provide much information, it does provide the picture of some blonde haired guy. When Mickey comes in, he says that the picture is of Ansem the Wise. Sora pulls him aside to the Ansem painting in the main study and says that this is Ansem. And Mickey finally does his explaining. Apparently, the Ansem we knew was a fake. It wasn't really Ansem, he just called himself that at some point. This guy, fake Ansem, died and became a Heartless, and that Heartless was the villain of our first adventure, and his nobody is the leader of the organization. Ansem the Wise, the guy from the computer, is probably still alive and could help with knowing about Organization 13 and what's happening to the worlds. Mickey left to try and find Ansem the Wise. Sora asks about Riku's whereabouts, and Mickey doesn't give a straight answer. A large earthquake erupts around them, launching Mickey into action, saying they should help their friends now while they have the chance, and then they'll look for Riku and Kairi together. Maleficent interrupts us as we head out the door and we fight some of her Heartless. Then, these fairies that we met earlier, who are the Goal Wings from Final Fantasy X-2, reveal they were working for Maleficent, but Donald manages to pull them to Leon's side with some clever lying, which he is clearly proud of himself for. Sephiroth makes a quick appearance as we head back down to the path toward the Bailey. A huge hole is ripped in the wall and we pass through it, but Mickey interrupts us, commanding we go and search for Riku and Kairi elsewhere. Donnelly Goofy helps Sora push past the king and move deeper to help the cause here in Hollow Bastion. We get down into this clearing where we meet a familiar face, Dimix. Dimix summons his sitar and a fight commences. Silence, traitor. Boy, if this isn't the brick wall boss of the century, I don't know what is. Demix attacks quickly and moves around the arena rapidly. Almost none of his attacks can be blocked, heavily incentivizing using Reflect in order to block his attacks, although that isn't even safe half the time. You really have to work to find your openings. You can either stay close to him and try to punish him after certain attacks, which is risky, or the advanced tactic is to use Thunder to catch him from a distance in order to stagger him in between attacks. 
It's this element, the difficulty of finding openings, that makes him so challenging. His RC, Showstopper, pops up every now and again and punishes you if you strike him with the Keyblade while it's active. Hitting the RC will give you a free opening, though. There's also the Water Clone phases, which show up at certain HP thresholds. They task you with destroying a certain number of Water Clones in a certain amount of time. Using the RC is the most effective way to do this, but combining it with fire can also be very effective. He adds a pretty rough attack toward the end of the fight, a combo move that can easily juggle you if you get hit by it. It's easy to deal with, but tough to figure out how. His sitar strikes are blockable, but the whole move is very disorienting, so it may be hard to even figure that out. Even then, the last water blast of the combo has to be dodge rolled out of, even if you successfully guard the move up until that point. Reflect Spam can get you through it, but the timing is pretty tight to ensure you don't get caught out of it. He's a great, challenging boss that telegraphs his attacks well. It's just a surprising wake-up call if you've been getting through the game by mashing attack the whole time. It's also interesting that Dimix is basically the exact halfway point of the game. Does that mean that this video is halfway done? No, not even close. After that nonsense, Dimix fades into nothingness and then Goofy freaking dies! Goofy! No! Hey! You're the pig's captain! You gotta get up! Come on, wake up! I'm sorry about the ice cream! Goofy? Uh, um, Goofy! This is not happening. It can't be happening. It can't. They'll pay for this. Sora fights through a bunch of Heartless on the way down the mountain, aided by the Final Fantasy gang. A few things about this stand out to me. Firstly, that they are very powerful, able to kill Heartless even faster than Sora in most cases. Second, it's nice to see the Final Fantasy gang actually doing something for a change, enacting some change and agency in this world they call their home. Also, if you die during any of these fights, you have to fight Dimix again, so that's rude. At the base of the mountain pass, Donald, Mickey, and Sora mourn Goofy's death and vow to make sure it wasn't in vain before charging forward. They move on to hopefully find the source of the nobodies. As they go, they run into the leader of the organization, and Mickey remembers his true name, Xehanort. Next is the 1000 Heartless battle. This event is pretty technically impressive for the time, though the cracks definitely show. It's pretty obvious that the Heartless that aren't active in the battle are just sort of pasted on an invisible wall in a certain distance away from Sora. Still, it's a decently cool battle the first time. It basically is just an RC fest as these particular Heartless's RCs are very good at wiping out tons of enemies at once. Zimnus greets us at the end of the pass and he implies that the king knows something about Riku. Mickey charges into the portal after him and Axel appears. He says that Sora and company fell into the organization's trap and that they want Sora to destroy Heartless. Syak shows up just as we are asking Axel about Kairi and Axel leaves. Syak says they have Kairi. Sora begs to go to her, but he says no. He says Sora should redirect his anger at the Heartless, who will form Kingdom Hearts with the released hearts. Maleficent appears, trying to rescue the party, but she gets bodied pretty hard. Syak says the Heartless follow whoever is strongest before leaving. Yes, Sora. Extract more hearts. Maybe everything we've done, maybe it was all for nothing. What am I supposed to do if I can't use the Keyblade? Imbeciles! You can't be trusted to do anything. Huh? Somewhere else, we see the ending of the scene from Leon and Cloud's perspective. Sora wonders what he's supposed to do if he can't use the Keyblade, and somehow, Maleficent saves them. In the dark void, they get a package, a picture of Roxas and friends, and some sea salt ice cream. Sora and company decide they have to keep helping folks, even if using the Keyblade on Heartless is furthering the organization's goals. This scene, and the events at Hollow Bastion here, act as a pretty great bridge between the first and second passes of the Disney worlds. It adds a ton of new intrigue to the plot and asks a bunch of questions that won't be answered until later. 
I love the recontextualization of Sora's adventures in the Disney worlds up till this point. While the stories that take place there aren't necessarily consequential, this new revelation means every minute of the game has been playing into the villain's hands, and there's really not much we can do about it either. The organization continue to be menacing, capable villains whose plans are well beyond those of the heroes, and they are actively winning this time. It makes players uneasy about continuing on, unsure of what's going to happen. It's great to see the Final Fantasy game being active, like I said, and all of those fight scenes give some more value to their presence. One important thing about this game is that I feel like the fear of making the crossover seem silly has gone out the window now. Mickey Mouse is fighting alongside Sora, Donald, the now deceased Goofy, and all of the Final Fantasy gang, and the game doesn't even pretend for a second that it's weird. And it makes this game feel much more active and engaging than the first one tended to be in these crossover scenes. The first game shined when it was just Sora, Donald, Goofy, and Ansem, but now everyone gets time to shine and make this game better for their presence. If only Goofy could be around to share in the fun. The second pass at the Disney Worlds tend to be shorter, clocking it at around 30 minutes as compared to the pretty consistent hour of the first pass. They also tend to focus more on either the overarching plot or the KH relevant characters, which is obviously a good thing. This more focused scope makes these worlds go by pretty quickly and can be pretty engaging as well, though there are some notable exceptions to this rule. Let's take a look at some examples. How about one that we've already talked about, Land of Dragons? This time around we drop in and see a black cloaked man and give chase, running into Milan as we do. We meet him up at the top of the mountain and he's, strangely, using a soul eater. Sora fights him along with a bunch of rapid thrusters. He's He's tough, mostly because he never staggers. After each attack, he will stand there for a moment to let you hit him, but keep in mind how long you have because whether you're ready or not, his next attack is coming for you. Weirdly, some of his attacks veer well off course of Sora, almost like he's not even aiming for you at all. The battle ends prior to draining the enemy's HP bar fully, and the man escapes. As we stand on top of the mountain, a huge flying beast appears, flying towards the palace, and so we make haste down the mountain. We climb into it just like Mulan and the other guys do in the movie, and then run into a black cloaked man. Sora asks if it's Riku, and the man replies that he's never heard of him in a voice very unlike Riku's. This man summons some nobodies to fight us before escaping. After beating them, we get into the throne room, where the Emperor recounts what's happened. There's a great moment here where Sora assumes that the black cloaked man was Riku because he was quite rude according to the Emperor. Donald wonders about why Riku would be in the organization, but we need to go and take care of the situation outside. The beast from before is at the door, the Storm Rider. This boss is kind of lame for the most part. You have to use these wind gusts to launch yourself up onto the Heartless's back. From there you can either attack his weak point, the horns, directly, or you can attack these little metal doohickeys hickeys on his shoulders to make him fall, which will allow you to do a bunch of combos safely. While on his back in the air, you can use an RC to grab onto his spines and hang on as the Storm Rider tries to throw you off. Eventually, however, he will get away because the RC won't appear. This happens because he's moving into a more offensive phase, but it's still kind of annoying. His attacks are basically all AoE and then occasionally dropping lightning bolts on your head, so he's also not much of a threat. The battle goes on for a little longer than the mechanics feel like they deserve. That being said, this RC is really Cool. After the Heartless is defeated, the Emperor tells us that the supposed Riku came to warn him that a dragon had been turned into a Heartless, and that's what we just fought. I love this detail, because dragons of this universe have clear hearts and souls in the same way people do, so it stands to reason a dragon could be transformed into a Heartless. Sora is confident it was Riku. They aren't sure why he's with the organization, but Sora doesn't care about that as much. <sighs> Goofy used to love dragons. Land of Dragons' second pass gives us some more detail about Sora and Riku's relationship that is pretty well written to boot. The story is quick and snappy, but contains some info that is nice to learn and meaningful long term. More Disney World stories should have aimed for this style of writing, to focus on the Kingdom Hearts characters and explore them through the guise of the Disney Worlds they are in. Gameplay-wise, it's a bit of a downturn compared to the first pass, with one boss that doesn't stagger and only has like two attacks, and another boss that is just dull. The nobody fight in the middle is cool though. Overall, I'd say Land Land of Dragons is a good world, both first and second pass included in that. But how about we look at a bad one for a change? Oh, Agrabah, why do you always get the short end of the stick? I didn't talk about its first pass because it's not particularly great. It focuses on Jafar's lamp and whose hands it's in. It randomly appears and ends up in the hands of the peddler. Iago shows up and claims he is reformed and promises to show Sora and company where to find something so valuable that the peddler would trade it for the lamp. They go to the Cave of Wonders, find a gem, bring it back, and then Pete gets involved and there's a scene straight out of Scooby-Doo where everyone's trying to fight over the lamp. That's about all the story does. Gameplay-wise, it has a couple decent mob fight encounters and then maybe the lamest boss in the game, barring the boss at the end of Agrabah's second pass. 
okay, you're caught up. The second pass starts with the lamp being tampered with in the location it was sent to, so we have to figure out what's going on. We have Genie open up a pathway to the sunken city, and we fly out on the flying carpet. Most of the gameplay in the second pass of this world takes place on this carpet. Controlling it is similar to the controls of Atlantica in this game. The right stick controls ascending, descending, and moving the camera left and right, while the left stick controls your lateral movement as always. Locking on and moving forward pulls you toward your target as well, and using attacks or spells doesn't stop you in your tracks like you think it would. You still have access to guard, but not dodge roll or quick run, which is a bummer. As you move through the city, your speed increases as you hold down forward. It feels decent, if a little slippery at top speed. Jafar's ghost appears and we chase him through the city. Then we have to unlock this building by casting the proper spell on these three switches scattered across the city. Inside, we figure out Iago betrayed us and the whole city starts falling down, so we have to escape quickly. Back at town, we learn that a black cloaked man gave the peddler treasure in exchange for the lamp, and now Genie Jafar is loose and is wreaking havoc in Agrabah. We fly up on the carpet and take on Jafar. So yeah, this whole boss takes place on this carpet. What I'm about to say should be obvious by now, but I'll say it anyway. This boss sucks because it can't make use of your full mechanics, blah 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 blah. To be fair, this one isn't as bad because most of your defensive options are still present. That being said, Jafar manages to be the worst boss in this game for other reasons. In order to strike him directly, you have to attack his stomach first. Once that health bar is drained, you can do the RC to stun him and get a chance to hit him directly. This is how the boss repeats over and over and over again for the entire time. He throws in some projectiles to try and snipe you as you deal with the stomach, some of which are fine, but generally you'll either need to reflect spam or just fly around the arena until it's over, as there is no safe way to attack otherwise. Some of his attacks have some pretty rough hitboxes, like this spin he does. Yeah. Oh, back off. Then he commits the cardinal sin of boss design, a forced waiting period with no way to push it faster, nothing interesting to do, and no way to damage him. He flings debris at you constantly, but just moving up and down and forward will dodge it 99% of the time, so there's nothing to do but wait and fly around. If Jafar ever gets a decent boss in a single one of these games, I'll eat my shorts. Jafar dies for real this time, so I guess I won't be eating my shorts anytime soon, and we get the closing scene about friendship, which is admittedly pretty cute. I wanna be a good friend like Genie, but I can't do anything to help you. What kind of a friend is that? Oh no, it's not like that, Iago. Friends don't have to do stuff. As long as you have fun hanging out together, that's all that matters. So, what do you guys do for fun? Me <laughs> too! Uh, that's not quite what I meant. This world is just a waste of time from beginning to end. And yeah, I'm gonna include the first pass in that description as well. The story in both passes focuses too much on Iago, and Jafar is a terrible boss. What little bit of interesting gameplay we get is stuck sandwiched between a story that doesn't matter and a bunch of poorly designed gameplay elements. Alright, let's get one more good example to cleanse our palate. Halloween Town's second pass revolves around something stealing presents from Santa. Everyone automatically thinks it's Lock, Shock, and Barrel, and we end up finding them in the toy shop and fight them. This fight is fine on most difficulties, but just like in KH1, it blows at level 1. The problem is again that their attacks are so small and intangible that it can be difficult to even know what exactly killed you, much less how to better respond to it in the future. Pro tip, use Stitch for this one, he completely trivializes this fight. After we capture them, they deny any relation to the present stealing, and so the hunt is back on. We figure out that the Heartless are stealing the presents and end up hunting some of them down and getting them back. Weirdly, the Doctor's experiment, which he's been working on since the first pass, is missing, and Jack hatches a plan to catch the culprit red-handed. We head back to the toy shop and make some fake presents and then set up a trap. Sora and team lie in wait to jump out when the culprit shows up. Sure enough, the trap works, and the culprit is none other than the experiment itself. So this fight. I like the mechanics of this one. It's sort of like guard armor in the sense that it has a number of different limbs that can fall off and attack you independently of the rest of the body. The problem is that this boss is absolutely plagued with poor hitboxes and bad telegraphs, not to mention certain attacks can combo you in unfair ways. It doesn't really come out until you play at level 1, but you'll see what I mean when I do. Here's a small collection of garbage from this boss. In this clip, the attack that kills me is completely off screen until it was too late. In this clip, I got ganked by a bad hitbox. In this clip, an unpredictable attack with a bad hitbox hit me into an unavoidable combo. Yeah. 
In this clip, lasers comboed me in the air with basically no capability of avoiding them. Then I fell into an off-screen attack that I could not have possibly known was there in order to deal with it. And that's just my deaths in regular critical mode. Here's a veritable cavalcade of crap from my level 1 playthrough. It also has a tendency to glitch out in weird ways, not behaving consistently once you get into this phase where all of the limbs act independently. At lower difficulties, he's better because many of these issues aren't as obvious, but even still, that doesn't excuse this poor design. After this boss, we discern that all the experiment wanted was a heart, that it saw presence as a heart and wanted to take them for its own. This is actually kind of sad and a neat detail. Given that one of the game's biggest themes is what is in a heart, this is a solid way to begin exploring it. The party discusses the meaning of a gift, and Jack and Sally start to dance together. <laughs> yes, 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 this is good stuff. While I wish the gameplay of this world lived up to its story, the story makes it worth it. The exploration of what a heart is to something that doesn't have one is a great foil to the nobodies, and helps us to understand their plight a little better. I also love the character detail of Sora seeing him and Kairi dancing in Jack and Sally's dance. I just wish Goofy were here to make fun of Sora alongside Donald like they always used to. Okay, I'm kidding. Goofy actually survived and showed back up in this scene not long after his head trauma occurred. What, did you think Goofy would be taken out that easily? No, I Way. Let's zoom in now and take a look at level design. As we've already discussed, there is a change in focus with this game from platforming to more linear and straightforward levels which facilitate enemy encounters better. The focus on creating interesting combat arenas is easy to see in a few key locations. Pete's fight in Timeless River switches between five different arenas, all with different mechanics that can both harm and help your offense. The Halloween Town Square, where we have a few Heartless fights, also shows some great design in creating traps that both Sora and the Heartless can fall into. Barbosa's Arena in Port Royal has a few different levels and platforms that you can use to your advantage, although this one may also be an example of poor design because Barbosa has a tendency to not attack properly when falling off these ledges. Agrabah City has multiple levels that you can fight on, as well as lots of destructible elements which add some more interest to the arena as Heartless appear out of them. Worlds also tend to be either smaller or perhaps on par with KH1 overall. However, because of the more focused approach to their design, they don't feel smaller, and in fact feel like they have less wasted space. Worlds are not mazes anymore, I'm pretty sure there isn't a single maze in the game this time around. This is partially because of the mini-map, but also is just because the game's worlds are designed in such a way to keep you moving forward and in the direction of the action. So getting lost is almost impossible, barring things like is Beast's room to the left or the right of the ballroom, which is a question I rarely get right every time I start this game again. I would say this is a better fit for the Kingdom Hearts gameplay, although again, there's something to be said for perhaps creating interesting platforming challenges with a new movement system that this game just doesn't do. Chests and the new puzzle piece mechanic added in Final Mix are tightly packed and just as rewarding as in the first game. Given that there is less room for exploration this time around, these are rarely difficult to find and are often just off the beaten path. There's decidedly nothing wrong with this, as the first game didn't really justify its sprawling rooms beyond just the chest reward you got there. The more focused scope of the level design this time around feels better and wastes less of your time. Now that the game has basically no gameplay mechanics beyond moving and fighting, how does it keep things interesting for the whole campaign? Mostly with gimmick mechanics and minigames appearing periodically. Stuff like the morale gauge in Land of Dragons and searching for the coins in Port Royale add some interest to the basic combat so things don't get stale. There is also the element of enemy variety feeding into this as well, but we'll discuss that later. Many games like the light cycle and making the fake presence are usually pretty well designed and break up the monotony. They also typically come and go quite quickly, meaning they don't overstay their welcome. How about the world design from a visual aspect? 
The visual design of the worlds focuses on spectacle this time around. A notable element of this design is the out-of-bounds visual elements. In many, many rooms in the game, you can see other areas in the out-of-bounds zones of the one you're in. Easy examples to point to. First, we have the secret heart experiment room in Hollow Bastion. You can see the platform you end up on when you take the elevator down, and you can see the heart container stretch on for ages. The world that never was is also ever-present in the sky of the dark city prior to getting there, looming like a threat overhead. You can see the palace from the mountain in Land of Dragons as well, and then there's Jafar's boss arena in the sky, which shows a bird's-eye view of Agrabah, complete with the huge palace in the background. So do the worlds feel more alive this time around? Well, yes and no. On the one hand, there will often be people to talk to in safe zones, which is literally what I asked for in the first video. Notably, at least one of these people will often have a hint at how to progress, also solving an issue I had with the first game. On the other hand, the succinct nature of the level design sometimes makes each room feel more like a video game than a real place. They were designed to keep you moving, but that design also detracts from the world's feeling alive. This is an issue with no clear answer to me, because I've argued that the level design is much better suited for this game already, so this is going to come down to player preference, and mine in this case tends toward thinking the focused level design is positive. Continuing the visual design discussion, the game looks better than its predecessor, but not by a huge margin by any means. The increased complexity of the visual design of the worlds is nice, but overall it doesn't elevate itself much in terms of graphical fidelity. Not that it had to. I'm just mentioning it mostly. That being said, there are some clear visual marvels taking place in Port Royale that deserve their own paragraph. Firstly, the stark contrast between the more cartoony Sora, Donald, and Goofy, and Pete, and the fairly realistic looking pirates is pretty funny. But look at the fidelity with some of the human characters in this world. Barbosa in particular stands out as looking surprisingly good. This world is dark and grimy and is a blast to go through from a visual standpoint alone. This should go without saying at this point, but animation quality throughout the game is top notch. There seems to be more physical slapstick style gags this time around as well, really getting some mileage out of the animations and cutscenes. The animations and combat, however, are where this game really shines. The spectacle of the drive forms cannot be understated. Let's look at some drive combos slowed down and you'll see the little details, especially stuff like how Sora controls the Keyblades while in final form. Then there's the RCs. The scripted ones are incredible, but the unscripted ones are no slouches either. It's awesome to see such dynamic and impressive animations integrated so seamlessly into combat. The animation on enemies shouldn't go without praising as well. Heartless continued to impress, of course, but attention should be paid to the new nobody enemy type. We've spoken about their animation style before, but just to reiterate, they are animated so strangely, with absolutely no regard for logic or physics in the way they move. They are weird, buoyant, bouncy, the spectacle is off the charts here. You know, I'm realizing just how many times I've used the word spectacle so far. Well, I think it should be noted that this game's entire mantra might as well be style and spectacle first. There are numerous ways we can compare this game to the first one in order to see that easily. Sora's guard animation is one way. In the first game, he lifted up his keyblade to parry incoming attacks. Simple, but functions well at showing how the guard times out. In this one, Sora spins around and holds the keyblade behind his back toward his target, spinning back just as quickly when the guard ends. When struck, he instantly goes into a stance more similar to his KH-1 counterpart. My suspicion for this change is that they wanted the animation of starting a guard and an attack, making contact with the guard to be very different so it was easy to tell if he had successfully parried an attack. But his guard animation in this game looks kind of ridiculous for how flashy it is. Also, that stance is far from a stable one. General combos also show a difference. Sora's combos in this game end up being much more flashy, even in standard form, by the end of the game and with some abilities equipped. Let's not forget that, in order to defeat bosses, you now have to finish them off with a combo finisher. Normal attacks won't do it. This basically guarantees that the player will get some sort of flashy finish to the fight, unless they use Thunder or Blizzard to snipe the boss to death because magic doesn't follow this rule for some reason. Speaking of magic, each spell has a unique animation for Sora tied to it, both in standard form and in his drive forms. Then, RCs are a majorly obvious example to point to. Style first isn't necessarily a bad thing, far from it in fact, but what you run the risk of is getting the second half of that axiom slapped onto your game, as it typically reads, style over substance. And well, let's just say that Kingdom Hearts 2 was not immune to this phrase being applied to it, but we're not quite there yet. 
The visual design of the UI is much improved as well. Some elements that are basically the same are the health bars. I feel like the colors on the HP and MP for both friendlies and enemies are more vibrant this time around. I also prefer the new style of how they show multiple bars for enemy HP, largely because you can see how much HP the boss has immediately, whereas you couldn't if the boss had more than what a purple bar could show, but also because it looks better than the colors changing to me. One thing I didn't mention in the KH1 video, but will this time around, is the 2D images they use in the HP section for each party member. These are incredibly expressive, and I love how they emote in response to damage or win at critical HP. It adds to the readability of your status. They also change to fit anytime Sora and team take on a new look based on the location you're at. Then, perhaps the most impressive element is the new design of the command menu, which changes to fit the world you are in. So, so many little details are expressed through these unique designs that I can't get into it for the sake of time, but here's a couple examples. In Beast's Castle, rose petals fall out of the menu whenever you move the selection. They also change during combat, so Timeless River's boat steam becomes angry during combat. These little touches add so much flair to the game that the original UI was lacking. Sound design hasn't been improved much from the first game. It's not a bad thing, because the sound design of KH1 was excellent. I would say that it doesn't do much interesting in the way of how it uses its sound design. It's just good, not noticeable because it does its job just fine. A few exceptions to that rule do occur, however. Space Paranoids is one that stands out. Its sound design, such as footsteps and other ambient noises, is basically perfect for that world. Timeless River also stands out because they applied some pretty heavy filters to all of the sound beyond UI noises to make it seem like it was coming out of old-timey speakers. I'm fine with this because the world is fairly short, but it actually is so well done it gets kind of grating. They also cranked up the intensity of these effects for the final mix version, as the original wasn't quite as garbled. The Keyblades continue the trend of having different sounds on hit, which I'm glad to see return. This time around, certain enemies will have sound effects tied to their attacks as well, which is a nice touch that I think they should continue to expand upon. Notably, many of the nobodies have some sort of sound attached to at least some of their moves, which is good. If I had one criticism for my KH1 video for myself, it would be that the voice acting section just felt a little in bad taste. I focused a bit too much on the voice acting I thought was poor. Luckily, there's very few, if not no, voice actors that I think do just a flat out poor job this time around, so we shouldn't have that problem. Even some that I criticized that returned for this outing have stepped up their game, so props there. Here's some standout examples, particularly of characters that weren't in the first game. What can you even say about Jim Cummings other than he's excellent at his craft? He's been doing voice acting for Disney animated movies and numerous other notable animated movies and series for many, many years. His primary role in this one is Pete, and his performance is exquisite. I was even talking with someone who brought up the idea that some of his lines may have been ad-libbed, because it's pretty hard to believe that localizers came up with Herc the Jerk or a Gone with the Wind reference. He's a particularly great comedic relief, some of my favorite lines being said by him. Frankly, my dear, I'd rather run! And can you believe he also played Winnie the Pooh? That's insane. Dude's crazy talented. Yes, hello there, somebody I don't know. Roxas is played by Jesse McCartney. Yes, that Jesse McCartney. I don't want another pretty face. I don't want just anyone to hold. I don't want my While his inclusion here is a bit of a meme, he actually does a great job portraying Roxas, showing some solid depth between the depression he starts out in and the anger he ends up in. I'm dreaming. But which parts were the dream? Was that... Was that supposed to be a joke? Cause I'm not laughing! Diz is played by the incomparable Christopher Lee, and so it should come as no surprise that he's a standout. This is only a data-based projection. He portrays all the confidence and mystery the character deserves. <laughs> it's an honor, Ansel. Oh yeah, let's not forget my favorite, Zimnus. Maybe I'm just a sucker for villain voices, but Paul St. Peter does a great job of encompassing Xemnas' intimidating persona. No, I'll have to start all over again. 
Warriors of the Keyblade, go forth and bring me more hearts. Like I said, voice acting all around this time has greatly improved major and minor characters alike. Music from an implementation standpoint seems to be the same as it was in KH1, which is a bit of a bummer. You'll be hearing the same 30 second loops on repeat for entire worlds, but ah well. Soundtrack wise, one thing I appreciate about this game is that less of the songs are just reorchestrations of music originally from the movie the world is based on, as this oftentimes got kind of grating in KH1. The overworld tracks this time around have seen some marked improvement in my eyes, both in how they sound independently as music and how they function in the game. A few notable examples. The underworld track for most of Olympus Coliseum, simply called Underworld, is a busy and unsure song with lots of pitched percussion playing disparate lines over each other. The notes, especially in the almost choir-like vocal in the background, are strange and seem almost incorrect at times. The bass line, barely audible in the bottom of the track, is just two notes repeated, but there is a weird scoop between them that makes it sound off. It's a great song to aid in the feeling that the underworld gives of unease and unrest. The overworld track for Space Paranoids, simply titled, you guessed it, Space Paranoids, is another frantic piece. An unpredictable syncopated rhythmic chime makes up much of the melody over a set of more on-the-beat chordal strings. Then, this B section comes in, with a more pronounced midsection that begins to bury the chimes at the top of the mix. It's frankly kind of annoying to listen to, but it fits Space Paranoid so perfectly that it works well in its intended context. The track for Timeless River, simply titled Monochrome Dreams, is a bouncy callback to old cartoon music, just as its world implies it should be. Most of what people love from this series of soundtrack is the combat tracks, and especially boss tracks, so let's take a look at some of those. Notably, I'm listening to and will be playing the 2.5 version of the OST, which has completely reorchestrated tracks, whereas the originals were more synthetic in their construction. Tension Rising is the first boss track on the OST, and it definitely holds up the pedigree of great boss tracks that we've seen so far. This one is notable for flowing so well with the boss it is tied to, Twilight Thorn, that that is really the best place for it to be, though it will be reused from time to time in this game. Desire for All That Is Lost is one you'll be hearing a lot for some of the sillier bosses like Pete in Timeless River and the Volcanic and Blizzard Lords. It's a solid piece, with a pretty awesome piano solo in the middle. Dance to the Death is first heard in the fight with the Thresholder, and it's got some nice sinister undertones with its unyielding bass and lower horns. Vim and Vigor almost comes off as a derivative of Desire for All It Is Lost at first, before becoming its own track as it proceeds. For some reason, there are a good number of these tracks that use the sleigh bells prominently in their percussion, which is kind of funny in a way. This song has a few different sections that give the piece a lot of depth as it scores your fight, first appearing with Shan Yu in Land of Dragons. The Corrupted will be tracking a few big bosses as well, but first appears with Barbosa. A continuous snare rolls in the back of the track, scoring the offbeat horns both at the top and the bottom of the mix. This is a thick orchestration that doesn't relent for the duration of the fight. The Encounter scores the fight with Mufasa, and its percussion line is probably sweating by the end. Sinister Shadows will score many of the more prominent mob fights throughout the game, a less intense track with more breathing room to properly convey the feeling of fighting off waves of enemies as opposed to one particularly tough fight. The 13th Dilemma scores most of the Organization 13 fights. It's got a bit less of a hectic approach to its instrumentation, backing up tone as you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with another human that is just as capable as you, and encouraging careful consideration of your moves. A 
fight to the death scores much of the first half of the final boss and does a great job of uplifting the feeling of an uphill battle. With its harmonic line traveling up and up the scale and quick piano melodies played way over the top of the chordal strings. Darkness of the Unknown scores most of the second half of the final boss, its frantic symbols and melody supporting the understanding that things are getting more intense now. The track also changes a few times throughout to very different songs, flowing seamlessly with the boss as it progresses in phases. The final section scores just the battle with Final Xemnas, and it's a much more melancholic track, with almost no percussion to speak of, just some rhythmic harps and other instruments to fill out the chordal tones underneath. This part of the song too flows seamlessly as the boss changes, hitting different portions of the song just at the right time to increase the tension. This soundtrack, especially the reorchestrations from the 2.5 Remix version, is an excellent backdrop for the game with some of the best boss themes we've seen yet. Finally, the theme for this game is Sanctuary, and you're going to have a tough time convincing me it's not the best theme in the series. The way it moves with the opening movie is incredible, hitting just the right notes to complement the visuals. There are a couple great uses of this song in the end of the game as well that we'll see. This electric guitar line is awesome. This B section in the opening version is sick. I just really like this one. Lyrically, I believe this is from the perspective of Naminé, most likely speaking to Roxas. One of the things Naminé and Roxas both learn in their journeys in this game is what it truly means to have a heart, to be whole. We'll discuss this more later, so keep it in mind, but certain lines spell out the metaphor to me. Some lines are played backwards. When reversed, you can understand what they're saying. I need more affection than you know, so many ups and downs, and I need true emotions are what they say. These lines are reversed because Naminé and Roxas no longer feel this way anymore. Instead, they've figured out that, with each other as friends, as sanctuaries for each other, fears and lies melt away. They show each other that nothing is whole and nothing is broken, meaning that while they don't technically have hearts, they can still be complete just by being friends. That that means something, that they can feel for each other even without hearts. Alright, gameplay discussion part 2, Electric Boogaloo. This time we're going to dig deeper and talk more about advanced concepts, but first let's just go ahead and get the gummy ship out of the way. They completely overhauled the system, just like Nomura said, and it does indeed feel more like a Disney ride. In fact, there are Disney rides that are basically just this concept, sitting in a seat and shooting targets with a fake gun. This version of the gummy ship is more fast paced and there is much more spectacle involved, not only in how the routes are designed, but also in the number of enemies on screen. Yes, thankfully, gone are the colorful blocks and blobs of old, and now we have actually pretty interesting locales to fly through as we travel to new worlds. Enemy variety is much better handled, with lots of different enemies that attack you in numerous different ways. There are bosses as well, though they don't require you beat them, just that you survive until the level ends. To be frank, it can get kind of boring, especially on repeat playthroughs, but it's still a good improvement over KH1's Gummy Ship, which got boring even on the first playthrough. There also seems to be less of it per total playtime hours compared to KH1's Gummy Ship, so that's a plus as well. Now let's talk about the leveling system. Just like in KH1, you aren't experienced through defeating enemies. Gone is the tech point system, which is kind of a bummer, but tech points give KH1 its own identity in the same way I feel RCs do here, so that's fine. Your stats, such as strength, magic, and defense are leveled through level ups, whereas HP and MP are leveled through get bonuses exclusively. This, as we've already spoken about, ensures everyone gets a proper amount of health and MP to stay competitive as the battle level increases. Many abilities are distributed through level ups as well, the order of which is determined by the specialization you picked at the beginning. Shield is notable as probably being the best choice, as it gets second chance the new once more which saves you from death by multiple hits and leaf bracer early. Many useful abilities are also distributed through get bonuses as well. Beyond that, I'm not going to spend much more time on the abilities because it's the same Ferris KH1. Not that there are repeated abilities really, just that the general idea of what each ability does is the same in this one, and it's not really worth a thorough explanation. Now for one of my favorite depth-defining discussions, the damage calculation. This game's damage calculation is simultaneously more simple and more complex. The formula is just strength minus defense, or magic minus defense in the case of spells. 
Simple enough. However, there are a number of modifiers to this formula. PM, or power multiplier, is determined based on what kind of attack it is. For example, combo finishers have a higher power multiplier than regular attacks, resulting in them dealing more damage. Every attack has a power multiplier assigned to it, and some attacks have multiple power multipliers depending on if the attack has multiple hits associated with it. RES, or resistance, is the target's resistance to elemental attacks. Most of the time this is a flat 1, unless the opponent is clearly immune to an element such as Axel and Fire. In these cases, the inverse is often true, evidenced by Axel being extra susceptible to Blizzard. GM is a special value which refers to the game mode you're playing on. We'll explain these later, but notably, this value is only applied to the damage calculation sometimes. Strength minus defense as a flat value tends to be a bit dangerous in games, sometimes resulting in very stats-focused combat where high enough stats will cause you or the enemies to deal as little as one point per strike. However, this game has a hidden modifier for damage. If Sora attacks something and the basic calculation of strength or magic minus defense results in a value lower than 8, it is automatically corrected to 8. This damage floor is applied prior to modifiers, however, so damage can still easily be lower or higher than this depending on game mode, resistances, and the power multiplier of the attack. What this means is that, even when severely underleveled, you can still deal a decent amount of damage. To put it into perspective, each bar of health in this game is 200 hit points, so 8 damage before modifiers isn't shabby, it's far from chip damage. Increasing this value is easy, especially with combo boost and the decisive pumpkin keychain, not to mention exploiting boss weaknesses. So, while strength and magic are important, a few extra points won't make a huge difference. The importance of this damage floor cannot be understated and how much it helps this game to become less stats focused and more skill focused as a result, as well as reducing the chance of underleveling to basically zero. Now, with this damage floor, on top of all these new mechanics, there must be some broken stuff you can do to completely cheese the game like Lethal Frame and Recom, right? Well, let's discuss broken mechanics. The way I see it, for games like Kingdom Hearts, a broken mechanic must meet the following criteria. 1. The mechanic must be able to easily trivialize bosses, mob fights, or both. 2. The mechanic must not require intense understanding of the game's systems to be considered broken. To put it simply, a noob should be able to know it's broken when they use it. Lethal Frame is a great example of this rule because it's easy to see how it's broken even without a full understanding of the game and its mechanics. And 3. The mechanic must work on every difficulty, even at level 1. If a mechanic can't fit neatly into all three of these criterion, I don't see how it can be considered broken. Incredibly powerful or overly useful in too many situations? Maybe, but not broken. Again, this only really applies to games like Kingdom Hearts, in which balance is a factor that is always taken into account. Broken mechanics in many other games are a perfectly good thing, but that's a massive discussion we're not getting into right now. Now let's go down the rap sheet of supposedly broken mechanics and decide just how broken they are. I think the most common one people throw around is Reflect. The thing about Reflect spam is that it certainly is capable of trivializing bosses, but you have to time it properly or risk getting sniped in between casts. The magic combo system and the way it augments Reflect means that you can't just mash Reflect to win in basically any situation, and anyone you see spamming Reflect to win has timed out their button presses and understands the boss pretty well in order for it to work. You're also limited by your MP, and at lower levels, Reflect doesn't do enough damage to completely trivialize bosses without some item farming first. How about spamming limits? This one is debatable, but is much more likely to be considered broken. It does require good timing to use the limit in its most effective manner, but the difference between spamming through the limit and timing it out is pretty minuscule. This mechanic is limited heavily by MP. Spamming requires farming a lot of ethers or elixirs. The latter are very expensive, and the former will only restore half your MP charge per item anyway. That being said, especially Comet and Flare Force are pretty borderline, just on the edge of trivializing some bosses depending on how you use them. Limit form and final form specifically casting Faraga during it, are also commonly pointed to, but I would argue that these don't even begin to count. That's because they both require knowledge and exploitation of the revenge value system. What's that, you ask? Well, it's a system in place in the game where most staggerable bosses will automatically break out of your combo after a certain number of hits. You may think, okay, well that's simple enough, a player could figure that out and exploit it, but you'd be quite wrong, because every single attack in the game, including your limits, summons, and drives, all have a different revenge value attached to them. 
Because of this, the system is so obfuscated that figuring it out on your own is next to impossible. We're going to discuss the system more later, but for now, here's some footage of me using Final Form Faraga to trivialize a boss. There is more going on here than me just spamming fire to win, and the chances a casual player could figure this out are next to none. Finally, I think summons are sometimes brought up in this discussion as well, though rarely. In particular, Stitch does break certain small enemy fights and even some bosses, on top of restoring your HP and MP when it gets low. So I'd say these are broken, but only sometimes. There are ways to trivialize bosses with Peter Pan, but these again required exploitation of the revenge value system, so I wouldn't consider it broken. I did this because I wanted to show this game's impressive level of balance, in spite of its numerous new mechanics at your disposal. No one in particular will just wipe the floor with any boss that is truly meant to be a threat, aka the Organization 13 mostly. Perhaps used in tandem with other mechanics, and perhaps with item span or RV exploitation, you can trivialize bosses, sure, but the delicate balance between these mechanics will not be ruined for casual players. This, of course, is going to depend on your difficulty. Speaking of difficulty, this game shipped with three difficulty settings, Beginner, Standard, and Proud. Final Mix added Critical Mode. The game mode modifier for incoming damage is set to 0.5 for Beginner, 1.0 for Standard, 2.0 for Proud, and 2.0 for Critical. The game mode modifier for outgoing damage is set to 1.5 for Beginner, 1.0 for Standard, 1.0 for Proud, and 1.25 for Critical. This clearly means that you actually deal more damage in Critical Mode, the hardest difficulty available, than you do in Standard or Proud, making battles, especially at low levels, feel like less of a slog. Those of you paying attention may be confused, thinking that Proud should actually be harder than Critical because it has the same incoming damage modifier, but a lower outgoing damage modifier. These numbers don't paint the whole picture though, as there are other changes to Critical Mode that make it significantly harder. Beginner, Standard, and Proud are all the same except for the damage modifiers, but here's what they changed about Critical Mode. First, some changes that actually help the player. On the third day, the player is given the following extra abilities. Reaction Boost, which boosts the strength of your reaction commands, Finishing Plus, which adds a second finisher at the end of your combo, Draw, which draws in prizes from further away, two instances of the Lucky Lucky ability, increasing the drop rate of items, MP Hastera, which increases the speed of MP charge, and EXP Zero, which can be turned on to disable experience gain and leveling. Next, initial AP is set to 50, so you can equip all these abilities. AP also increases by 3 instead of 2 every time you earn it. Now for the rough stuff. Maximum potential HP is set to 60 instead of 120, so throughout the game you will have half the amount of HP you usually do. MP gains are also halved, so less magic to spam spells with. Finally, EXP gained is set to 75% of its normal value, so you will pretty much be perpetually underleveled. I love this difficulty, because it is by far the most engaging way to play. The addition of the free abilities you get at the beginning is an awesome touch, which speaks to a truth that often goes unspoken. Hard difficulties still need to be fun, and this one achieves that by increasing the complexity of your moveset from the get-go. But how about the difficulty in general? Is the game hard? Well, if you play on critical mode, it certainly can be, but a few things circumvent this. While it is basically impossible to underlevel now, it is still possible to overlevel. Harder to do so in critical mode because of the 25% reduction to EXP gains, but even still, it's possible. Let's look at an extreme example. The super bosses in this game are set to battle level 99. Now a quick explanation of battle levels. It replaces the star system from Kingdom Hearts 1, disambiguating the difficulty levels of each world. Not only does this number imply what level you were intended to be at to handle it, it also determines enemy stats. Here's a big chart with all the battle levels. On it you'll see that each battle level has an HP, strength, and defense number assigned to it. HP works as a modifier that multiplies by the enemy or boss's base HP. So an enemy that has 10 base health at battle level 14 will end up with 430 HP. Strength and defense are taken straight from the table. Enemy attacks presumably also have modifiers which are applied to the damage calculation on top of the strength stat, so not all enemy attacks will do the same amount of damage as that statement implies. This system allows for basic enemies to be easily scaled to fit the battle level. Bosses are also affected by the battle level of their location, although bosses are obviously not scaled to fit the current battle level, but their stats are appropriately determined based on the overall damage and defense threshold present throughout the world and where Sora should be when at that level. The problem is that at level 99, even on crit, super bosses feel like they are melting under the keyblade, and borderline broken mechanics are even worse due to less room for punishment on the boss's end. None of the super bosses are pushed Overs, but when at the level intended by the devs, they don't reach that extremely hard feeling they are supposed to be at. Besides all of that, it's finally time to talk about difficulty at release. When I tell you this game was too easy at release, even for me as a kid, I mean it. 
It was so easy, in fact, that it makes me question my hypothesis from Kingdom Hearts 1 that the game is supposed to be a test of skill throughout. I have a suspicion that this was an overcorrection on the part of the devs, as people did occasionally complain that the first game was too difficult. This may have been more to do with the fact that the genre was so new, and so people didn't really know the language or how to play them properly, as well as the game probably actually being too hard for its target demographic of children. But regardless, this seems to me like a deliberate attempt to onboard people better with lower overall difficulty. Even on Proud, though, this game was just too easy. Too many mechanics kill any challenge the original release had. As an easy to point to example, on top of the game being too easy, if you died during certain fights, you get the option to get saved by Mickey, who you would control momentarily. He could do a good amount of damage and was fairly survivable, and mashing triangle would charge up the drive gauge. The higher the drive gauge when Mickey is defeated, or if he gets full and the RC is completed, the more HP Sora would revive with in order to try and finish the fight. You can get Mickey to save you up to three times in some fights, which is pretty insane given how capable he is at rescuing a boss attempt. Then there's drive forms and limits, which greatly increase Sora's power, but the game didn't justify the need to do so. Stuff like this would be cool if the game was a proper challenge, but because it was too easy, these things aided in the feeling that Kingdom Hearts had become all style and no substance. Final Mix proves that we can have both style and substance, but the base game failed miserably at that goal. It's a shame, too. This overcorrection will probably forever be how people see the series, as being too easy and the combat boiling down to mashing X to win, which is a real bummer because as I believe I have already shown and will continue to show, this game has a lot of mechanical depth that is very engaging to learn. The game just utterly failed to exhibit that to the player, or ever require its use. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's continue to dig deeper into this combat system. The next layer is called the revenge value system. To reiterate, every enemy has a revenge value max that, when hit, will allow them to immediately break out of your combo and retaliate. You may say, this sounds similar to Sephiroth's 4-hit retaliation, and you hated that, and yeah, I did. But this one is better because every strike in your combo and every spell you can cast has a different revenge value attached to it. So even if you have a bunch of combo pluses equipped, the boss won't usually break out after less than a full combo. You aren't inherently punished for using abilities the game gives you, which is always a positive. This presents some interesting strategies as well once you know how it works and how many hits the boss can take in your combo before retaliating. Do you deliberately hit the RV Max and deal with the retaliation, or do you back off before the RV Max and get a safe distance away to deal with the next attack? Your answer to this question can and should change depending on which boss you're fighting. Some of them retaliate in ways that are easy to predict and you can get extra damage in during it with reflect or guard and counterattack into combos. Others retaliate inconsistently or don't allow you to combo them after the retaliation for whatever reason, meaning the safest thing to do is to learn how much leeway you have with your combos and try not to hit the max. This is why I like this system. It's quantifiable and presents some strategy you can use once you understand how it works. Not that the game wants you to understand it, necessarily. You basically have to look it up in order to get it because the game never tells you any of this and the system is so ambiguous you'd be hard-pressed to figure it out on your own. And that's okay, it's an advanced system that would be lost on casual players anyway. Regardless, it's a great addition to a combat system that already took many great strides forward. But there is one problem, though. The system is inconsistent only when a boss has a soft phase change. Soft phases are when a boss transitions into a second or even third phase after hitting a certain HP threshold. The easiest example to point to is probably Terra, one of the super bosses. He has three phases, each beginning at a certain HP threshold. Regardless of where his RV is, he will break out and retaliate against you as soon as you hit this threshold, even if it's in the middle of a combo or even after a single attack. I can't fathom why they chose this over just allowing the boss to warp away or something, but it's a questionable choice at best when the RV system is so consistent otherwise. Now let's discuss what changed in the Final Mix version. It added the puzzle minigame. Puzzle pieces are scattered around and completing any given puzzle gives you items. There are new keychains. They added limit form and dodge roll. They made the drive gauge easier to fill and increased the max drive gauge from 7 bars to 9 bars, contingent on beating the final boss and Terra. They added critical as the new hardest difficulty mode, and they also added the mushroom 13, which are sort of like the special Heartless from Kingdom Hearts 1 FM. Notably, these have consistent spawning now. Man, it's almost like they heard me from the future. There's a bunch of new super bosses as well, which we'll get to, whereas the game only shipped with one originally. 
There's also a number of balance changes which made the game harder on every difficulty. The morale gauge depletes quicker, you have 30 less seconds to beat Pete's second fight in Olympus Coliseum, and enemies don't drop prizes when escorting many in Disney Castle, just to name a few. I think these changes are all great, especially the new super bosses. We haven't discussed the enemy design in this game yet, so let's go for that now. Many Heartless, such as Fat Bellies, Fat Bandits, and Shadows make an appearance in this game, but most of the Heartless roster is original. I'm not going to go over every Heartless, but I would like to highlight just how much variety variety there is. To my memory, KH1 introduced two to three new Heartless per world. That's a good number to shoot for, but I feel like they weren't very diverse mechanically. Is there really much difference in how you deal with most of the enemies in that game beyond just running up to them and wailing on them or hitting them with magic? I would argue that KH2 did both of these things better. For this discussion, we'll only be looking at the first pass of each world. Land of Dragons introduces Nightwalkers, Assault Riders, Bolt Towers, and Rapid Thrusters. Assault Riders require a very different strategy to the other three because they are difficult to stagger and hit hard, as we've already spoken about. Beast Castle introduces Hook Bats, Fat Bellies, Gargoyle Knights, and Gargoyle Warriors, which fight pretty differently, and Lance Soldiers. The Gargoyle Knights and Warriors have alternative methods of dealing with them. If you parry their attacks, you can release the Shadow Spirit controlling them, killing them instantly. Olympus Coliseum introduces Rabid Dogs, Creeper Plants, and Trick Ghosts. Trick Ghosts in particular are tough because they have two different modes of attack which can be tough to deal with while taking care of other threats. Disney Castle introduces Minute Bombs, and Timeless River introduces Hammer Frames and Aeroplanes. Those last two enemies fight well together because one covers the ground while the other covers the air. Minute Bombs are unique because at a certain HP threshold, they have a chance to enter a suicide mode, where if you don't kill them in time, they will actually respawn with full health. Port Royale introduces three different human pirate enemies as well as air pirates. Each of the pirates is capable of different attack styles. The pirates in particular are very unique because magic affects them in different ways. Blizzard freezes them in place, thunder causes them to wander around for a while, and fire makes them run around aimlessly. On the other hand, you can only hit them when they are in the moonlight, so you still have to be pretty careful about how you deal with them. Agrabah introduces Luna Bandits and Silver Rocks and Fat Bandits and Fiery Globes and Fortune Tellers and Icy Cubes. Enemy variety is about the only thing this world has going for it. There's a good combination here of enemies that attack from a distance, enemies that attack up close, and enemies whose attacks are delayed. Halloween Town introduces White Knights, Toy Soldiers, Driller Moles, and Emerald Blues. Toy Soldiers and their Halloween Town counterpart, which is introduced in the second pass, are very tough enemies that have a number of attacks that can lay you out. Finally, Pride Lands introduces Living Bones, Aerial Knockers, and Shamans. Shamans and Living Bones can combine to make a new Heartless that behaves differently, and Living Bones also have two different forms, one with their head and one without. They are designed in such a way to encourage heavy use of free movement during spells. That recap, again, only goes over the first pass of each world, and the enemy variety continues to increase as you go through the second passes. Enemy variety is very high, not only in the number of different enemies, but also in how you deal with those enemies, and strategies you have to employ, at least on harder difficulties. Oh yeah, and I almost forgot about Hot Rods, which appear in Timeless River and are the bane of my level 1 playthrough. It doesn't stop with just Heartless though, there are a number of nobody enemies that continue to crank up the complexity. These guys and Heartless basically never mix, so most of the required mob fights during the second pass at each world are devoted to one of these nobodies. We've already discussed Dusks, the most common form of nobody. On their own they are easy, but in large groups or supplementing other more difficult nobodies they can certainly be a threat. Same with Creepers. Assassins can be surprisingly difficult to deal with depending on what other enemies are present. Samurais will mess you up if you leave them alone, and their RC is a great high risk high reward mechanic. Dancers are the worst. Their attacks are strong and come quickly, but the worst thing they can do is this. <laughs> They can't be staggered during this move, they chase you relentlessly, the only thing you can do is run away from them or reflect as they get close by which makes them stop the attack but doesn't trigger Reflex counterattack. They're not actually that bad in reality, dealing with them is just awful sometimes, especially when there's a lot of them in a group. Snipers shoot you with colorful bullets, but you can use the RC to knock them back at the enemies. You can also block them, parry them, or reflect them back. They warp around and try to kick you as well. They are very complex enemies, as most of the nobodies we have yet to mention are. Dragoons have a number of different attacks that can come from different directions. The Learn RC replaces your attack command with a similar attack to the Dragoons, which is cool. An unfortunate design choice with these guys is that they enter the battlefield with an attack, sometimes resulting in an unfair death that you couldn't have seen coming realistically. Gamblers have a unique RC, sort of similar to Samurais. You enter into a mini game where you have to activate the circle that moves around 
around the command menu. Activating the X will result in being turned into a dice for a time. They're simpler than most nobodies though. Sorcerers attack independently of their actual bodies, using these pink squares to strike at Sora and friends with a few different attacks. This means they can retaliate during combos, which can be dangerous. Berserkers are perhaps one of the toughest nobody types. Their attacks are strong and come pretty sporadically, and when they hit a certain threshold, they do this almost desperation move. They can't be knocked out of it either, so escaping or reflecting through it is advised. If you manage to stagger them, you can grab their sword with an RC which magnetizes them to you, then allowing you to strike them. There's lots of complexity and variety in the nobodies, but one of the coolest things about them is that they actually prepare you for the organization member they come from. Berserkers are tied to Syax, and you must use the RC in his fight to make him vulnerable. Dragoons are tied to Zaudin, who makes heavy use of the learn and jump RC during his boss fight. Snipers are tied to Zigbar, teaching you about reflecting or otherwise knocking back bullets during his boss. Gamblers are tied to Luxord, who uses the same command menu minigame during his fight. Samurais are tied to Roxas, who uses the same command menu minigame as their RC. I love how this game will plant mechanics to teach them prior to having to use them in boss fights. Speaking of boss fights, it's time for the part where we talk about every single one, except there's a lot more in this game than there were in KH1. I mean, a lot, so we may be here a while. I'll be skipping over the ones we already discussed during the recap, so let's get started. Going to Beast Castle, we first have the Thresholder and Possessor. I'm pretty confident that this boss is terrible. It has a few attacks it uses fairly often, and it spawns mobs at the beginning of each of its phases. You can clear out the mobs from the back somewhat safely, so they aren't a terrible issue, but the Thresholder's attacks make it very difficult to attack safely. At this point, you won't have dodge roll, quick run, or reflect, so there's few defensive options you can really even use. The second phase is even worse, as he spams this Dark Ball attack that leaves you almost no time to attack. Once you get the Thresholder's HP down, you RC him to unlock the Possessor, who is the actual thing you're trying to kill. Do this twice, and the boss is over. This one is questionable at best. I guess Beast kind of counts. You just have to spam the RC on him and get some attacks in between RCs. He only barely counts. Next we have Shadow Stalker, who is mostly an RC vest. He goes into the windows and sends out a blast at you that you have to dodge, then he possesses the chandelier which you must defeat, releasing it with RC in order to attack the Shadow Stalker directly. Then he goes into the ground and pops up at you, then he goes into the pillars which you again attack until you can RC him out to attack directly. Not much to it, kind of repetitive. Dark Thorn, on the other hand, also kind of sucks. He goes invisible for much of the fight, meaning you can't see any of his telegraphs. That, on top of a bunch of projectiles flying around this arena, means it's very difficult to attack him safely. You can remove his invisibility with the RC, which requires comboing him near the center of the arena, but he'll just cloak up again eventually anyway. Finishing him off with his RC is pretty cool though, but the choice to make him invisible for most of the fight was questionable at best. Next we move to Timeless River and Steamboat Pete. He's actually just a joke boss, so now on to Pete on the steamboat. This is another RC fest, although you can sneak in some extra damage with Thunder to push his offensive phase faster. Attacking the cage around the cornerstone is the actual goal, which can only be done while hanging from this hook. Occasionally it will try to toss you off, so use the RC to stay on. Simple, easy, not much to talk about. Then there's Pete himself, in his final appearance as a boss. I like this boss for a few reasons. For one, he has a decent amount of variety to his attacks, and they're all pretty well telegraphed and predictable. Then the arena continually changes, each new area having mechanics based Based on the mechanics from these zones from earlier in the world, but remixed in interesting ways. Finally, Old School Pete is in this fight, and his inclusion adds some interesting elements to how the fight plays out, as you have to watch out for his AoEs when he hits the ground and some other things that can damage you. It's a good fight. Barbosa is up next, and he can be pretty tough. First of all, you have to keep Jack alive for the whole fight or you get a game over, which can be pretty frustrating, especially on higher difficulties. Barring that, his attacks come pretty quickly and cover large areas. His gun attack is hit scan and so difficult to dodge. You can sort of cheese him with the ledges like I said earlier, and magic does affect him in different ways like the other pirates, but you have to be sure to attack him while in the moonlight, which adds a wrench to the boss. After a certain HP threshold, he will just start spamming his RC move over and over, which makes the latter half of the boss somewhat trivial. You've been watching my clip of me beating him at level 1. I'm mostly just showing it because I'm proud of it. Volcanic Lord and Blizzard Lord finish out Agrabah's first pass, and these guys are really lame. They take turns attacking at all, are easily staggerable, and their RCs completely demolish some of their most interesting mechanics, that being that they can make portions of the arena unsafe to traverse. Their attacks can be dangerous if they get the chance, but as long as you keep on the offensive, they won't get that chance much. Next we go to Pride Lands, which is finished out with the fight with Scar. 
He can be pretty tough as his attacks are fast and track you pretty well. Later in the fight, he charges himself up with a couple different elements which change his attack patterns. During these phases, your only options are to avoid the attacks or reflect to get some sneaky damage in. Next up is Zaldin at Beast's Castle. A lot of this fight boils down to an RC fest because he's impervious to regular damage because of his wind barrier for most of the fight. In order to break it, you need to use the jump command given by the Learn RC after avoiding or parrying his attacks. This means that it gets kind of easy once you understand the patterns, and then he just gets faster as the fight goes on, adding one new attack which is actually easier to deal with and gives a bunch of opportunities to stack jump commands, and a desperation move which is maybe the easiest one to avoid in the game. I like him because his attacks are mostly fun to deal with, but he is a bit basic overall. Hades closes out the second pass of Olympus Coliseum, and he is an easier, simpler version of his fight in the first game. Can't hurt him while his head is red, but you just have to hit him with these orb arc spawns to make him vulnerable. From there, you just combo him until he goes Super Saiyan again and then rinse and repeat with the RC. With a little luck with Hercules' patterns lining up just right, you can avoid Hades ever getting a chance to attack, which is certainly something. So many of these bosses are trivialized or made even worse by their own RCs, making them just a step above a quick time event half the time, which is pretty lame. Grim Reaper 1 is just a neutered version of Grim Reaper 2, so we're gonna skip it. With Grim Reaper, you have to put all the coins back in the chest in order to deal damage to him directly. Otherwise, you're hitting him with spells to make him drop the coins he's got on him. The spells affect him similarly to the pirates in Port Royale, so while it is possible to stun lock him with certain combinations of spells, figuring this out is actually pretty tough. You're also, obviously, limited by your MP. Using physical attacks on the Grim Reaper will drop MP orbs to help with restoring it, but ethers are still a valuable commodity. His RC is cool and makes him drop a bunch of coins at once, but there's a problem with it. The skulls that fly around him to protect him move so quickly that it can be tough to see them coming, much less dodge them. You also have to be on the ground to initiate the RC, so Quick Run is actually useless here because it lifts you off the ground with a bunch of ending lag until you hit the ground again. If you're close to him when he starts the RC move, the chances you're going to get sniped by a skull moving at Mach 6 speed is pretty high too, which is exceptionally frustrating. His DM is cool but way too easy to dodge. He also is one of those bosses that breaks out at HP thresholds, which I just don't understand. Overall, I like him more conceptually than I do in reality due to these issues. The Ground Shaker closes up Pride Land's second pass. He's fine, but a bit of an RC fest. The attacks are a little too easy to dodge to be dangerous. He also has the same problem as Darkthorn, where he goes invisible while you're attacking the Shaman thing on the back of the Ground Shaker, which again is just kind of stupid. Regardless, he's not much to write home about. The second trip to Space Paranoids brings us Sark and the MCP. Sark is a simple boss. Honestly, the mobs that spawn at the start are more of a threat. During the MCP's fight, Sark reveals his expansion fetish and terrorizes you for the fight. Draining both of his legs, HP bars will stun him for a while, freeing you up to deal with the MCP. You have to break the partitions in between you and him, and then spam the RC to deal damage. It's a really easy boss, pretty boring, honestly. Oh boy, so next up is Roxas, the man, the myth, the legend. This fight was added in the final mix version, expanding on what before was just a simple cutscene. Roxas is an excellent boss who exemplifies all the differences in boss design philosophy present between the original release of KH2 and the final mix release. He's much faster than basically any boss in the original game, and his attacks are designed to punish panic dodging and reflect spam. There's a couple things he can do at first. He starts the fight with this big AoE attack that he can throw in at any time. A simple block or dodge will deal with it, and its telegraph is huge. You just have to time it properly. His combo move is the one he will use the most often. Again, it's simple to block it. You just have to learn the telegraph. Blocking the last attack where he dashes at you will throw him completely off balance, opening up to attacks. His retaliation is fairly predictable and easy to punish, but occasionally he will throw in a different, much more deadly attack that is very difficult to predict. When I first saw this attack, I thought for sure it was unfair, but he almost never uses it outside of retaliations, making it a direct punishment for abusing revenge value. About halfway through the fight, his attacks gain unblockable lasers, which will change how you deal with them, forcing you to focus on your spacing. He can also force you into the dual minigame, losing will result in you taking a bunch of damage, but winning will gain you two extra keyblades which will attack Roxas directly during your normal combos. It's fun, frantic, challenging, probably the best fight in the main game. My only problem with this boss is that, due to his pacing and his design, he makes later bosses seem almost lame in comparison, and no boss matches this level of difficulty until well after the game is over. Zigbar is the next to block your path. Primarily, this boss encourages and rewards guarding and patience, as well as predicting when he will reload his guns, as he's perfectly open to attacks during that time. Occasionally, he will switch the arena on you, sometimes making it difficult to reach him. Other times, it just makes the bullets harder to see, but the fight plays out the same. 
After a while, he gets a new move where he can shoot these large glowing bullets that bounce around the arena. These are, frankly, not fun to deal with, as their pattern is pretty random and the RC tied to them doesn't even remove them entirely. In fact, the RC can result in you getting sniped into an unavoidable combo, which I have footage of. Rarely, he'll jump up into the rafters of the room and take cheap shots at you from above, but spamming triangle will get you through it just fine. Finally, his DM teleports you to a teeny tiny little arena where Zigbar shoots a wild volley of bullets at you. Dodging it is fairly self-explanatory and is made much easier with certain growth abilities. Its spectacle is impressive, but it is kind of annoying how many times he can use it during the fight, especially once you've gotten so good at dodging it that you rarely ever even get touched. In spite of his faults, he's a good fight, requiring you to use Sora's abilities in smart ways. Luxord is up next, and his health is time. Sora and Luxord both have a time bar tied to them, which continually drains throughout the fight. Getting struck takes a small chunk off the bar, and the first person whose time bar hits zero is the loser. Sora, unfortunately, still has his health bar that you have to worry about, because yeah, why would the organization fight fair? When the fight starts, you're dice, which is pretty lame. Using the jump to hit Luxord will drain the drive cage more quickly, but it makes you more vulnerable, so it's risk versus reward, but it's just kinda lame that you start out this way. Luxord has a few attacks he can hit you with, on top of spawning cards that will spin around dealing damage near them. But the main thing you need to worry about is his mini games. Occasionally, he will queue you up to do a command menu minigame where you have to select the zero just like the gambler nobodies. Winning will result in Luxord's time dropping somewhat significantly. Losing will result in you being turned into either a dice or a card. At a certain point in Luxord's time gauge, he will switch to a different minigame. He will spawn a number of cards, inside of which will be one of four things. Nothing, a bomb that damages you, a timepiece that subtracts some time from Luxord's total, and Luxord himself. Getting Luxord out of his card with the RC is the goal, but hitting the timepiece can help you to push the phase faster. Finally, his DM includes a large combo and then a more intense version of the first minigame where you have to get four circles without hitting a single X on the command menu. These can be very tough, but you can pause buffer the visuals to make it a bit easier. If you lose your time will be significantly hit and Luxords will be restored. It's not the end of the fight necessarily, it just means you have to fight even harder to beat him before your time is drained. Winning drains Luxord's time to the point where one combo will finish him off, but be careful, he still has one more attack he'll throw at you before standing there and accepting his fate. While the fight isn't exactly groundbreaking in terms of how it uses the mechanics, I do think it does a solid job of being entertaining in spite of this. Syax is the last boss before the final one. He spends much of the fight in an impervious state, but it's not a bad thing for a few reasons. One, his attacks are relentless and pretty tough to dodge, and two, you can knock him out of his impervious phase quickly by hitting him with his own weapon using the RC. If you're going to put a forced impervious phase into your boss, make sure at least one of those two things are true. Other than that, he sucks up power from the moon and retaliates with a basic three-hit combo. It's a pretty simple boss, but his moves during the rage phase are pretty fun to dodge. He's pretty good overall. Alright, so time for the final boss roster. First we have Zimnus. Well, I mean, technically the whole thing is Zimnus, but you'll see what I mean. Zimnus has fought alone. He warps around and throws a barrier up at you occasionally before coming out with some combos, which increase in complexity as the fight continues. There's actually not much else to say here, just learning block times and avoiding face tanking the barriers. He also has an RC where he appears on the top of the building and you run up at him as he jumps down at you. It's a unique RC in which there is actually strategy involved. The first two RC options that appear during the showdown deal less damage and result in a less favorable outcome than the third. Though, once you figure that out, you just wait for the third to appear and hit it, so it's not like, incredibly deep. But still, it's a nice exception to the typical triangle spam these things can devolve into. Next, the final boss has a few non-boss phases, followed by Armor Zemnus 1. This guy is cool because he will use all the organization members' abilities against you on top of his own abilities, and learning to dodge each one is fun, though the boss is a bit too easy because most of the attacks are aimed at the center of the arena, so when you're being offensive, you're not in much danger. He also just goes by pretty quickly. Armored Zemnus 2 is a slightly beefier version of the fight and involves some forced flying sections which are, you guessed it, an RC fest. The actual battle against Zemnus himself this time is simplified as he won't use the other org attacks against you, which is just kind of strange, but whatever. He goes by pretty quickly. While these two fights are a bit of a letdown for the final boss, I want to be clear that the spectacle of these fights is incredibly impressive, and the final phase of this battle more than makes up for these fights mechanically. Final Zemnus shows up wearing his cow suit and is ready to have a good time. 
please don't demonetize this video. That came out exactly how I meant it to, but still. He tosses you in the air and you have to spam the RC to avoid it. This works as long as you aren't playing on the PS3 version of KH 2.5, which broke this RC for some reason. Yeah, I still beat it at level one in that version, so I'm basically a god. Anyway, once on the ground, Zimnus will cycle through a couple different attacks that he can be staggered out of with proper timing. These attacks are fun to deal with and come quickly, but with enough time to react to them consistently. His second soft phase changes the fight. Now he warps around and queues up bullets to shoot at you with strange timing, necessitating you learn the timings well. I love this phase because it's so heavily based on your guard skills. Reflect can be used to get some sneaky damage in here, also in the airbound RC phase. After a third soft phase change, Zemnis will grab Sora and you will take control of Riku in order to save him. Sora takes constant tick damage and Riku also has to fend off one of the Zemnis clones while he makes his way to Sora. I realized this section is a little messed up when this happened to me. While Riku was the one that ended up dying, Sora started this phase at incredibly low HP, to the point where I'm 99% confident that even if Riku hadn't died and I moved as quickly as possible to Sora, I couldn't have made it. It's a cool scene, but because it's based on HP values, you can hit this point at a really awkward amount of health that makes it way harder than it has to be, if not impossible. Toward the end of the fight, Zemnis has one more trick up his sleeve. He spawns a million bullets that start to shoot at both Sora and Riku, and you have to hit both X and Triangle pretty quickly to avoid damage. It goes on for a surprisingly long amount of time, and while it's nowhere near as demanding as the microwave hallway or something, it's a really cool end to the fight. Afterward, Sora and Riku shoot a beam of light through Zemnis, who is then open to one final combo to finish him off. I love this fight because it doesn't shirk spectacle or substance. It has great mechanics and great scripted scenes and is a solid way to end the game. So that's every boss in the main game. Bottom line, the boss design here is better, but only when you're playing on critical mode. Otherwise, everything is so easy that you'll never be challenged to learn the mechanics. When you are challenged, the mechanics will show themselves to be better. Most moves are well telegraphed, most bosses are well designed from a technical standpoint, most of them are engaging in some way. There are some crushing exceptions to this rule though, but we're not done talking about bosses. In fact, we've got 15 more to go. Now, it's time to talk about super bosses. The super bosses in KH1 were simultaneously the best fights in the game and occasionally the worst design of them all, either being too easy or too broken. KH2 takes that pedigree, rips it up, and says, we're doing it right this time. So, let's do the same thing we did last time and start with the easiest super boss in the game, Sephiroth. You guys that haven't played this game can go ahead and pick your jaw up off the floor. Sephiroth is a way, way better boss this time around. He starts out the fight with an RC that can easily kill you if you miss it, which I'm pretty sure is supposed to be a joke at the player's expense the first time they try the fight. He throws it in occasionally throughout the fight as well. His basic attack that he repeats throughout the fight is a multi-hit sword combo that can be pretty easily blocked and countered, especially with Counter Guard, a move where Sora steps on the ground after a successful block that typically knocks enemies off balance. As the fight continues through its three soft phases, the move gets slightly harder to deal with as he moves across more of the arena to get to you. Blocking this can sometimes be tricky, but it's not too bad. After your combos, he will typically warp away. What he does after that is somewhat variable. He'll either stop and use another attack based on the phase he's in, or he'll come in for a slash that will knock you in the air. Getting hit by this is basically a death sentence if you don't know how to deal with it as he will continually combo you in the air, but once you do know how to deal with it, it's an easy pattern to get down and is consistent. The response I ended up going with was an aerial dodge into a reflect, which will knock him out of the combo, and it highlights the awesome property of aerial dodge having iframes and parry capabilities. Once in phase two, he will start sending out orbs to attack you. These hover around you for a moment before coming in and hitting you, but they can be knocked away with parries or reflect. Phase 2 also introduces the Fire Pillar attack, this time with more Fire Pillars and a magnet effect that pulls you into Sephiroth. Thankfully, the programmers made it so, most of the time, the first pillar that appears will be on the opposite side of Sephiroth, meaning you actually have a chance to dodge it this time around, even if you are right next to him. The only footage I have of this not happening is this clip, so it's not 100% consistent, but it happens enough that I think it's probably intentional, and welcome at that. Phase 3 introduces more complex orb attacks, faster attack patterns, and Descent Heartless Angel. This version of the attack is slightly more difficult to deal with as he flies high into the air while he does it. I believe all of these super bosses are designed around you having maxed growth abilities, because stopping this attack without them would be tough. Also, I actually have footage of it happening this time, and then immediately dying afterwards, so that's cool. Finally, his DM, Meteor, is really easy to dodge with max growth abilities, but is probably a nightmare without them. All in all, Sephiroth is now very consistent, while still remaining a very challenging experience. 
Now let's move on to the data organization fights. I'm not going to devote time to their absent silhouette versions for a couple reasons. One, I hate typing the word silhouette. Two, it's just the same fight as the data version, but less difficult and shorter. Just to explain what those are, absent silhouettes are fights added in a final mix that were peppered throughout the main game, and they are exclusively fights against the organization members that aren't represented in this game because they died during Chain of Memories, that being Marluxia, Lexius, Zexion, Vexen, and Larxene. The data organization battles are found at the end of the Cavern of Remembrance, a platforming and combat gauntlet with the hardest mob fights present in the game. Capped off by the second most difficult string of bosses the game has to offer. Rather than trying to rank these guys in terms of difficulty like I did with the other super bosses, I'm just going to go based on their numbers, in reverse order because I'm zany like that. So at number 13 we have Roxas. Roxas' data battle is, well, it's the same fight as his regular battle, but longer and he deals much more damage because the battle level is 99. While this will be true to some degree for every fight, it is more so true for the fights that were added in Final Mix, as they were already designed to be exceptionally hard, Roxas included. So not much remixing is seen here, it's just longer. That being said, he is extremely tough, one of the hardest single fights in the game by far, even compared to the other data org fights. Number 12 is Larxene. Her fight can be incredibly hectic, in fact it starts with her just spamming lightning bolts at you. Getting hit by this will either result in you dying or getting comboed till the end of time depending on if you have once more equipped or not. That's how this phase progresses regardless of how far you are into the fight. Her other phase, the two of which she can switch between multiple times throughout the battle, sees her splitting into multiple copies of herself and attacking sporadically. Each clone will take a turn attacking and one will cover the other if you hit her very low revenge value. She also has two different DMs depending on if she's in her solo phase or her clone phase. I don't like this boss because it feels like one of the few in the game where the expected responses to the attacks are so specific that you'd be hard pressed to figure them out on your own, instead encouraging you to look up guides on the best way to beat her, which I'm not a fan of because it's far less interesting. I didn't this time around, but I think I did the first time I finally beat her. Next we have Marluxia. At the start of the fight, he sets a doom-like curse on Sora that gives him a number of hits equal to his current level. If this number hits zero, or your HP hits zero, it's game over. As you can see, I beat all these bosses at level 72 this time around. Beyond that, it's a pretty standard fight. Any attacks from his scythe won't deal damage, instead subtracting from the counter, while attacks from these darkness pools or pillars in his DM will deal damage to your health. He has two basic attacks, a combo move that can be blocked but isn't counterable, and a spinning move that ends in an RC opportunity if you successfully parry it. There are two different RCs here actually, one restores your counter while the other deals damage. He can also smack you into the air, similar to Sephiroth, and won't stop until he misses or gets parried, as far as I can tell anyway. He will occasionally spawn these dark pools, which often comes paired with this attack where he surrounds you with thorny vines, which detonate after a moment, dealing damage. Best way I can tell you to avoid the damage is to reflect it. He also has two different DMs as well, one mainly focused on dealing damage and one focused on reducing your counter, but neither are very bad overall. He's probably one of the easiest data org fights at the high levels, but can quickly become one of the hardest at low levels as you'd imagine. Luxord is next in line, and look at that, they clearly agreed that starting you as a dice is kind of dumb because they don't anymore. He does more damage obviously, but the biggest difference this time around is that the games are significantly more difficult. The circles are moving at lightning speed for basically the whole duration of the minigame. And if you take too long, yeah, yeah, he turns you into a dice or whatever. Pause buffering is usually useful here, but where it's particularly useful is in the DM phase, where the circles are almost moving faster than you can possibly react to them. Even that doesn't make it trivial, as you could basically have to press confirm on the command when the X is present, because by the time the game registers the command, the circle will appear once at its fastest. I like this version of the fight a bit more because it's more challenging and rewards very quick reflexes and awareness. Number 9, Demix. Demix presents an interesting design decision that is used in some of these battles, especially the ones that are slightly remixed fights present in the original release. Demix has numerous soft phases, and in each he will water jump away from you and then use a specific attack. So in one phase he will repeatedly use his RC move, in another he will only use his bubble launch attack, in another he will only use his combo move. Toward the end of the fight he will start mixing it up again, but it makes roughly half the battle weirdly predictable and repetitive. Beyond that, he will also spawn a bunch of water clones at the beginning of the fight like he did before, except this time you can't use the RC and must use spells or attacks to kill them, making it much more difficult. 
The last thing you do before the battle is over is 99 water clones in 30 seconds, which is quite difficult and basically requires use of spamming fire in a dry form to accomplish. Dimmix is still a fun fight because the bones of the fight are so solid, and so this version is no exception, in spite of the somewhat questionable design decisions in the early half. Next up is Axel. Basically the only difference here is that the lava floor damages you now. That, and his patterns are a little harder to predict. He doesn't use his parryable move quite as much as the unparryable rush attack. The RC is a bit more strict with where you need to be in order to hit it properly. Other than that, the fight is basically the same. As an added bit of difficulty, if you dodge into the flame wall, it will damage you, so the safe area of the arena is a bit tighter. His DM is very easy to deal with, so it's hardly worth worrying about. Number 7 is Syax. He's the same fight except it's much harder to do the RC to knock him out of Berserk, both because his weapons will disappear much more quickly, and because the RC to attack him with the sword will appear and disappear much more quickly. He also gains his Berserk gauge much more quickly during your offensive phases. Number 6 is Zexion. Oh boy. Okay, so here's the part where I get to say that a super boss in this game actually sucks, because Zexion is the absolute worst. The battle starts out innocuous enough. Zexion will just continually put your party members in books, which you can break them out of with a couple combos. If he manages to put Sora in a book, however, he will transport you into library hell where all bets are off and the rules don't matter. In order to get out of this phase, you have to find a book that contains Zexion and drain its HP, finishing it off with an RC to go back to the island phase and attack him directly. Staying in this phase for any longer than necessary is a death sentence, however, because he can, at almost any time while in library hell, put you and your party members into even more books, I guess we're two layers deep here now, during which he will just drain your HP. If you can mash triangle fast enough, you can break out, but when I tell you that this is a lot to ask, you truly have to believe me. I have played and beaten every Metal Gear Solid torture scene, and this is truly the most difficult button mashing challenge I've ever experienced. If I successfully break out, I practically have no HP left because the timing is so tight. It's easier on liver difficulties, obviously, but that's not an excuse for how broken this attack is on critical, not even at level 1. It's pretty tough to even know when it's coming unless you already found Zexion's book and can see the telegraph, and even then there's no way to avoid it unless you have enough MP to cast Reflect. Oh yeah, and your party members are guaranteed to be dead after this attack. If you manage to get out of the book, Sora will warp to Zexion and deal a bunch of damage to his book, so that's nice, I guess. The other attack he will typically use at the start of Library Hell will lock your command menu in a book, forcing you to find the release prompt on one of the pages. There are a number of other commands, one that gives you HP orbs, one that damages you, and a few others. This one isn't as bad if you have second chance and once more equipped. The reason I say that is because, while you're searching for the release command, Zexium will continue to use insanely difficult to dodge attacks. Having once more means these can juggle you for pretty much forever and you can take your time finding the release command, but there's no guarantee he won't just immediately kill you after you release your commands because he's still attacking. I don't understand how they thought this was fair. Even if neither of these things kill you, he continually shoots books at you while you're trying to drain his HP, often from off screen so that it's impossible to react. Very cool. So how exactly are you supposed to get past him? Well, for that, let's meet up with our old friend Biscuit047 again and his data org guide. But uh, if you don't, what you want to do when you come in here so that your party members also survive is go right into a limit. So now what happened, and this is great for level 1 because now he's not able to trap me in a book, so... Now I'm free to move around without uh, being trapped in it because at level 1 you're get pretty much guaranteed dead if that happens, so limit is by far the safest option here. You can reflect, but Dolan will probably die, so you... Yeah, he trapped me immediately. I did wait. I did a lot of damage to him, and now I'm in the next phase. So now we all got trapped at once. No chance to break anyone out. All right. So now he's gonna open with a different attack. You see that book right there? That's him. He's about to uh, trap me in my commands, which is deadly at level one. So to prevent this, limit again. <laughs> You can reflect it too, but like I said, Dolan will die, so you're kind of gambling if you do So that. yeah, aggressively abuse infinite iframes to get through this boss. Great. Cool. I mean, it's a tool at your disposal. Sure, it's just lame that it's basically the only safe way to deal with these phases. I would be fine with this attack if they were tuned properly to not basically always kill you at higher difficulties, and it's cheap and uninteresting to always just go into a limit every time you go to library hell, but it's basically the only thing you can do if you want to win. Zexion's DM is pretty cool though. He transports you into a little mini game room where one of these three spotlights will change to blue and it'll cycle through pretty quickly. The goal is to be in the correct circle when the game ends or you'll get bombarded with book bombs. It's pretty fast paced and fun. I like it quite a bit, it's just a shame the rest of the fight sucks so much. Number 5, Lexius. I really like this fight. All of his moves are predictable and avoidable after some practice. 
He has a power level that gradually increases as the battle goes on, and it can't be reduced unlike his absent silhouette version. This not only increases the power of his attacks, but their complexity as well, with more rock shards appearing from the ground with every attack. In the end, he's just a pretty standard but well-designed fight. He has a few moves he can cycle through that can be dealt with in a couple ways, and it's pretty fun to do so. His DM is hilarious, because it's this super anime attack where he slams down on top of you with this big dash, but it can be blocked just fine, so it's never a threat. Number four is Vexen, and Vexen is the other organization boss that really just kind of sucks. Vexen's data circle will follow you around, increasing the data meter for any time it's directly under Sora. Once it hits one, anti-Sora will be added to the fight. You can kill him, but he'll eventually come back anyway. The higher the data meter, the more complex and tough Antisora will be, but even at level 1, he is a beast to deal with. Vexen himself will send a few ice-based attacks at you, and you have to break his shield to deal damage to Vexen's actual HP bar. It's incredibly tough to deal damage to Vexen and avoid the circle, so Antisora is more of an inevitability than something you can ignore. Then, his DM will absolutely mess you up without fail. It's technically dodgeable, but extremely difficult to pull off. So if you can't attack him without spawning Antisora, and Antisora immediately rips everything to shreds, how do we deal with Vexen? This time we resort to Final Form Faraga. This is a technique that abuses a quirk in the revenge value system where if, in Final Form, you cast a spell and the Keyblades continue to hit the target, the revenge value won't increase, allowing you to attack indefinitely without the boss breaking out. We still have to be careful because Vexen also has a soft phase change going into his DM, which we will then use a limit to avoid dying. During the DM, we can deal damage to the shield so we build up the drive gauge again. As long as it's over 5, we're good, because we'll be going into final form again once the DM is over. Break the shield one more time, final form Faraga to the end. This boss is tuned in such a way where the only one strategy is really safe or consistent on higher difficulties, and it's one that abuses iframes and a glitch in the revenge value system. This is in contrast to bosses that allow you to experiment with all the different tools at your disposal to find the best solution to the problem. It's limiting and frustrating. Zaldin is number 3. His fight isn't significantly different from the story version, except that attacking him is now even less safe because he always throws his wind barrier up, whereas he would sometimes not before. He also starts the fight moving faster, requiring better reflexes on the player's part. Other than that, he's basically the same. Number 2 is Zigbar, and his fight is actually quite a bit different. His bullets move much more quickly, and apparently he found an infinite ammo bandana somewhere because he no longer needs to reload. The only way to get stun time on him is to hit enough bullets back into him. He'll double over and will be open to comboing. His RC phase is somewhat more difficult as it's faster now, and he no longer has to charge up the bigger bullets, making them even more difficult to deal with. Ironically, because of how fast this one moves, I find the bigger bullets to be less of an issue this time around, as any time he transforms the arena, the bigger bullets go away. He's still a pretty fun boss, but the speed that the bullets travel at can sometimes feel unfair. This could easily be a get good moment for me though, so don't take it to heart. Finally, number one, Zimnus. Zimnus' data battle is split up into two fights. First the version with Sora in front of the big building, and then the version with Riku in the White Void. Both fights are basically the same with higher damage output on Zemnis's part and slightly different pacing. Notably, Final Zemnis's attacks behave similarly to Demix's in that he starts off fighting using primarily physical attacks and then enters a second soft phase where he starts using his bullet attacks in a predictable pattern. It's better this time around because it's not as exploitable, at least not until he gets to the bullet phase where he just repeats the same pattern over and over. He's still a good fight and one of my favorites in the game, probably. Alright, now for the toughest fight in the game. Who could possibly be worse than the Data Orc fights? That honor goes to the Lingering Will, similarly to how we fought Xemnas in KH1 as the toughest boss added in Final Mix. Lingering Will is a character we haven't met yet who will show up in later games. For sake of ease of writing this discussion, I'm going to call him by his real name, Terra. This is hands down the most complex fight in the game, so let's just start by describing all of his attacks. He can transform his Keyblade into a huge gun that launches an orb at you, exploding if it makes contact with anyone in the field. It's blockable but won't go away until it hits someone, usually either Terra or Sora. You can also dodge into it to make it explode, but it won't hurt you if the dodge is timed properly. With good spacing, this move is a free stagger. Next, he can hurl himself at you, using his Keyblade to propel himself through the air. He will do this at least three times in a combo, but can chain together this attack up to like four or five times. In later phases, he can go smoothly from this attack into others as well, with very little warning. It's blockable and dodgeable, and as long as he doesn't choose to follow it up, it can be staggered. His follow-ups are pretty easy to see coming once he's done them a couple times. Next, he will run at Sora and do a three-hit combo. 
As long as you see it coming, this is probably the easiest move to deal with and always results in a free combo. The trick to seeing it coming is to make sure you aren't ever standing right next to him when he's queuing up his next attack. Proper spacing is key here. Next, he will fly at Sora and slam his Keyblade into the ground. If Sora is caught in the blast radius, one of two things will happen. Your physical attacks will be locked away, or your spells and items will be locked away. You have to deal a certain amount of damage in order to unlock your commands. Getting hit by this attack is regularly a death sentence for the attempt, but it isn't impossible to deal with as long as you're careful. In fact, I got hit by this attack on my winning attempt this time around. Occasionally, he will transform his Keyblade into a bow and fire three arrows at Sora in succession. If any of these hit you, your commands will be locked and you have to press release in the command menu to get them back. All the while, your health is draining and Terra is attacking you. Pressing fall will also damage Sora further. While this attack is also a death sentence most of the time, avoiding it is fairly simple with well-timed dodge rolls as the timing is consistent. You can also reflect through it. I used to hate this move because of how easily it can kill you, but I've gotten so good at timing the dodge rolls that it's more of a free phase now, and I'm glad to see it pop up. Lastly, he will transform his Keyblade into some sort of glider and zoom around the map, attempting to run over Sora. He will do a seemingly random amount of passes before stopping. This can be blocked or dodged with relative ease, though the size of the glider keeps dodging from being reliable. At the start of the battle, Terra will use one of these attacks. This typically determines how he will behave for Phase 1, making Phase 1 fairly predictable. For example, if he chooses to use the 3-hit combo, he will most often choose it when deciding what attack to use next. The only exception to this rule is if he uses his Keyblade Slam, which has a pattern that is predictable but doesn't involve him using that attack constantly, just more often than otherwise. All of these attacks are dodgeable at the offset, but it can be tough to see them coming sometimes. It's brutal, but still fair. Now for a couple attacks that he can throw in around others. One involves him turning his Keyblade into a whip and spinning it around him. Interestingly, this isn't a blanket damage zone, but all those whip lines actually have hitboxes that determine if Sora is hit. He often throws this attack in after his Keyblade air dash, but most often you'll see it after hitting his revenge value or an HP threshold. Starting in Phase 2, he can send out these little drones that occasionally shoot bullets at you. While these are blockable and reflectable, they often show up in tandem with the glider attack, making them extremely punishing. This sort of stuff will happen most often during Phase 2, though only if he draws that appropriate attack pattern. Phase 2 is less predictable because he will often string together more of his attacks, depending on which pattern he drew. If it's the 3 hit combo, this will usually not be the case, but if it's the air slide or glider, good luck. Phase 3 sees a significant switch up because it's Terra's DM phase. Terra's DM is a three phase gauntlet of attacks that can come from just about any direction, making dodging or blocking them extremely challenging. The second phase is actually unblockable and must be dodged, along with the final strike at the end of the third phase. The rest can be reliably blocked, especially if you back yourself up against a wall so he can't appear behind you. Guarding it still requires some decent timing, however, but once you've guarded against the first attack, the rest can be guard spammed. Reflect can get you through the second phase, though gliding away is often more effective. After the DM, he will open up to attacks and will go into another short offensive phase where he uses the attacks we've spoken of before using his DM once again. He will continue this pattern if you don't lose his AI until either you die or he does. The DM itself isn't the worst thing in the world to avoid, but having to deal with it so many times across the course of a phase can be pretty brutal for your resources if you're having to use items or cures to get through it. Alright, so that's all of Terra's attacks. I think the notable thing here is that none of them are terribly difficult to deal with once you've got the timing down and figured out what strategy works best for you. This boss is hard because it's designed to drain your stamina. It's long and requires intense levels of focus and awareness for the duration. That on top of Terra just dealing a ton of damage per strike means you really can only make so many mistakes in a row before you're taken out. The DM, while not being the most difficult to dodge in the game, I'd say that honor still goes to Vexen, is repeated numerous times depending on how you do phase 3, making it quite draining. Phase 3 almost feels like a sprint, except you're running the same amount of distance in this lap as you jogged in the first two, as the more time you spend in it, the greater the chances are of you getting ganked. I love this boss because nothing feels unfair, even when Terra begins throwing in extra attacks at the end of the others. Well, almost nothing. If Terra rolls the drones plus glider pattern in phase 2, I usually just quit and try again, because dealing with that particular attack pattern more often than not feels like a crapshoot. But we're not done yet. This is the most complex boss in the game, of course, so that means it's gonna 
gonna be the longest to talk about too. Now let's talk Sora's offensive, because it's not quite the same as usual. When you first attack Terra, you may notice your attacks do almost nothing, literal chip damage. This is because hitting Terra has a unique property, where the damage increases exponentially with each hit during Terra's stagger. So obviously, you are highly encouraged to get as many attacks in during a stagger to maximize damage output. But hitting his revenge value can be very dangerous, as he will immediately use the Keyblade Whip attack, which can be very hard to dodge if you're right next to him. I love this, because it plays into the inherent risk versus reward the revenge value system implies, and basically begs you to play with fire in order to decrease the amount of times you spend in the fight. Terra is an excellently designed fight, gruelingly difficult but fair, and I can't sing its praises enough. It's not perfect, mind you, it does have a couple attack patterns, again namely drums plus glider, that can be pretty unfair at times, but it's good far outweighs its bad. Whew, that's all of them. Well, it, it, it's almost all of them. There are a few more quote-unquote bosses that only appear in the Hades Paradox Cup, an optional in-game challenge that comes after a number of other cups. Each one has special rules. In one, you have no party members but can use summons at reduced cost. In another, you have no party members but can use drive forms at reduced cost. And in another, you have party members and limits don't cost all your MP. The cups are also generally pretty short, each only coming in at 10 rounds with the boss at the end. Hercules makes a return but is honestly just as unimpressive as his iteration in the first game. Better, but not great, as he just kinda is dull overall. You can also battle the Final Fantasy gang in the Hades Cup. Tifa, Yuffie, Leon, and Cloud all make an appearance, and in a later fight you have to beat all four of them at once. They are decently well designed but only really have two attacks each to speak of, so there's not much point in giving them too much focus. The Hades Cup itself is 50 rounds long and uses the rules from the other cups for each of its 10 round sections, with the first and the last 10 round sections being ruleless and just requiring you to get through them. Generally, I look pretty poorly on this version of the Colosseum. While they are perhaps more interesting mechanically as they allow you to use your tools in different ways, their inclusion in the game feels like an afterthought. In KH1, when a new cup started, Chip and Dale would give you a very clear announcement, even if you weren't technically strong enough to pull it off yet. In this one, there is a simple message that appears pointing you toward Olympus Coliseum that says, a new episode has been added, which doesn't really mean anything. It uses this message for Atlantica when you unlock the next song, and 100 Acre Wood when you get a new page too, just by the way. Not only that, but the rewards for the Coliseum in KH1 felt more valuable, whereas the rewards in this game, I mean, Fatal Crest is cool, I guess, but Berserk Charge is only really useful for certain AI loop exploits, so it has very little value as disabling your combo finisher during MP Charge is questionable. The Coliseum just feels like a tacked on side quest to me, which is pretty lame because the Coliseum was such a great part of the first game. There's a new version of the Special Heartless that were added in KH1 FM, which comes in the form of the Mushroom 13. Mushrooms of varying sizes that are adorned in organization cloaks. Each one has a unique gimmick. In one, you have to press triangle at just the right time to confuse the mushroom so you can strike it. In another, you have to drain its HP while its HP continually refills. In another, you have to keep the mushroom airborne for a certain amount of hits, like Grandstander on steroids. I like these better than their KH1 counterparts for a few reasons, and the main one is that they have consistent spawning this time. The second is that their gimmicks are a little more creative this time around. Some of them are a bit too challenging to pull off, but it's not horrible most of the time. Getting a good enough score on the first 12 will allow you to get the 13th to give you the winner's proof, a new keyblade with pretty good stats, and it gives Sora a crown. Sora gets a crown from completing the Mushroom 13, beating all the data organization battles, and finally beating Terra, each new crown unlock changing the look of the crown from bronze to silver to gold. The synth grind in this game is... Well, it's gonna depend on your difficulty this time. If you pick critical, you start the game with two extra lucky luckies and you'll be able to do a lot of synthesizing throughout the game, giving you access to useful armor, accessories, and items to use during combat. If you picked anything else, your experience will likely be similar to KH1 synth grind in that you will hardly have enough items to do much synthing until the end game anyway. The grind is overall much easier on critical mode, especially if you're only going for the ultimate weapon, which boasts MP Hastiga, a very useful ability that drastically reduces your time spent in MP charge. It's harder if you're going for all the extra powerful accessories added in FM, which are mostly locked behind synth items that you attain by beating data org members. Regardless, it's overall improved, but only if you're on critical mode. Just to throw this out there somewhere, uh, 100 Acre Woods minigames are much better this time around. They are more creative, more interesting to watch, and don't involve any annoying platforming. That's all I really have to say about that, though. Why don't we discuss level 1 now? It's once again possible to beat the whole game and every challenge in it at level 1, and this time around it feels pretty balanced, due to the new damage calculations. 
It's perhaps less interesting because many abilities are lost at level 1, but it also has more challenge because there is no second chance, once more, or a leaf bracer. Unlike the first game, most challenges in this game feel like they are totally doable with enough practice at level 1, with a few of them requiring very specific strategies. Your 50 AP limit means you actually have to be aware of which abilities you need and which you don't, as you can no longer just equip everything you get. Certain abilities can actually get you killed more than they can help. One example of this is Quick Run during certain bosses, another is Finishing Leap because it takes up the square button during combo finishers, meaning it's likely to trigger if you're trying to dodge out of a finisher if you have Finisher Plus equipped. Overall, I'd say it isn't significantly harder than the regular Critical Run, especially if you choose to use all of your tools to their fullest. Certain abilities, limits, and summons can trivialize bosses even in this mode. Certain boss mechanics do become pretty unfair at this level, which seems to at least imply that it's not the best way to play the game. A great example of this is the Thresholder. The issues with this boss become significantly worse when just about any attack can take you out. Now, can you beat every boss in this game without taking a single hit? Sure. Is it fun? No. Sacrificing safety for forcing staggers on lower difficulties, even critical mode, is not only preferable, it seems intended on some bosses. At level 1, however, this will most often just get you killed. Some bosses become absolute slogs, or highly encourage spamming quote-unquote broken mechanics. Some final thoughts on gameplay. Enemy design is at an all-time high here, so is boss design, though with a few crushing low points. Combat is fluid, snappy, and a good bit more complex as well. While you don't often need the extra mechanics added in this game, they make it more interesting and all have a good amount of give and take in terms of how much they cost or how you use them. Magic is valuable without being spammable this time. The game is mostly fair when playing at a decent level on critical mode, but level 1 mode does present some issues even for otherwise fine fights. Anything below critical mode is unfair in the player's favor to the point of not being engaging anymore. Overall, it's a good step forward. It's not perfect, but it does a much better job of engaging when properly tuned, and it's fair much more often than not. Before we finish the actual story recap, let's go over the final mix differences for the story. There were a number of cutscenes added in this version, adding more context and some new story elements meant mostly to tie into future games. Most of these are cutscenes between the members of the organization, further showing their relationships and goals throughout the game. We learn that Zaldin was the one that gave Axel the orders to get rid of Roxas. We also see some scenes where they discuss their plans after key moments in the story. I like these mostly because the organization is a good group of villains and they needed more screen time. There's also a cool scene where Axel and Namine are hiding out at Sunset Hill after Roxas wakes up. Ansem shows up, saying he's supposed to eliminate them at the behest of Diz, but ends up letting them go. There's also this massive new cutscene prior to the Demix battle, which is... Ooh boy, it's bad. Just, just take a listen. What about you, Zexion? What do you think? I think eavesdropping is intrusive. Why are you even here? You and Zaldin were tasked to recruit new members. I'll have you know, I found one just yesterday. Mar something. That puts the organization's count at 11. And since I've been working so hard, I had Lexius take my place for the day. Is that so? Well then, I will leave you to it. I have work to catch up on. Good day. Oh, don't be like that. Come on, stay and talk. Isn't it time you told me about Xemnas's secret? How long ago was it? When a bunch of warriors wielding key-shaped swords appeared and unleashed a spectacular battle. And when it was all over, all that was left was a man lying unconscious without his memories. Xemnas, er, yeah. I mean Xehanort, was found by Ansem right around then, wasn't he? Your point? The Chamber of Repose. If you recall, that's where we spent our time researching the darkness that resides within people's hearts. It's a graveyard that was sealed by order of Ansem the Wise. The first thing Xemnas did once he got rid of him was to undo the seal and build a room in the back. Ever since then, he holds himself up in that room when he can and he talks to someone. But who? The Chamber of Repose is part of a pair. The Chamber of Waking is the other. Another graveyard, if you want to call it that. It was constructed by someone other than Xemnas himself. And that's where he'll find it. That's where he'll find his other friend. 
This cutscene is the embodiment of, we have to put this information somewhere. Zigbar just goes off reciting events that Zaxian already knows about, so why on earth would he be saying this stuff? There's stuff about Xehanort and Ansem the Wise, a Keyblade War, something called the Room of Awakening. It's all pretty irrelevant right now, but maybe I'll bring it back up in a future video when it becomes relevant again. It's all pointing to the next mainline game in the series, which the original didn't do much because, as I said at the top, Nomura planned on this one being a satisfying ending. Speaking of that ending, I'll denote any more new cutscenes as we go, but let's finish this thing out. After finishing the second pass of the Disney Worlds, Chip and Dale find the source of their reading, which they've been contacting us about periodically. As you progress through the second phase, you can see this large something or other appear at the top of the world map. Particularly, astute players will realize the reading grew stronger because they continued to kill Heartless, furthering the organization's goals. Twilight Town also has something happening to it, so we go there. Hayner and his gang were looking for Kyrie at the mansion, and they think there is probably a duplicate of Twilight Town somewhere out there because their money bag and crystals were duplicated. The king shows up and we fight some nobodies together. Mickey says they found Ansem the Wise, and that they think they know where Kyrie is. He also lets slip that he made a promise to Riku, Sora taking this to mean that Riku is okay somewhere. The team goes into the mansion and finds the computer that we saw Diz using, and it needs a password. That password is sea salt ice cream, and if you can't remember it, you can talk to Mickey and he'll basically give it to you. Unlocking the computer opens a portal to the duplicate Twilight Town, and then we continue on into this strange new area, a bunch of nobodies not far behind. Axel shows up after the fight and admits that he kidnapped Kyrie, but she got away and Syax got her instead. Axel is going to hold off the nobodies and let Sora go in, but he sticks behind and helps Axel fight them off. In order to escape, Axel uses a huge attack that wipes out the nobodies. You're fading away. Well, that's what happens when you put your whole being into an attack. You know what I mean? Not that nobodies actually have beings, right? Anyway, I digress. Go. Find Kyrie. Oh, almost forgot. Sorry for what I did to her. When we find her, you can tell her that yourself. Think I'll pass. My heart just wouldn't be in it, you know? I haven't got one. <laughs> Axel, what were you trying to do? I wanted to see Roxas. He was the only one I liked. He made me feel like I had a heart. It's kind of funny. You make me feel the same. Kyrie's in the castle dungeon. Now go! In a new scene, the organization discusses Axel's death. Perhaps he put his existence on the line and won what he'd been longing for. Wait a minute! How would that even be possible? We don't exist, remember? What you're saying goes against the laws of nature. Then perhaps he bet his non-existence. Either way, he came out a winner. Oh, Axel. A grifter till the end. That's absurd. He won nothing, and is nothing. He couldn't stand the emptiness of being without a heart, and that led to his demise. He was foolish and weak. But... Weakness has the power to awaken that which is dormant. It is clear that through his actions, however foolish they may have been, Axel has touched Sora's heart. Perhaps he will soon awaken. We move on now to the final world, the world that never was. I love the design of this city. It's dark and futuristic in a way that no world in the series has been. Continuing on, we run into some samurais, then Roxas shows up. 
We fight him. Then we get into some new scenes. In the first, Xemnas appears to Roxas, offering him a new name and a new purpose, the moment Roxas joins the organization. Then, we see a scene between Axel and Roxas on the top of the clock tower, talking for the last time as they both begin to fade away, one joining his original body and the other passing on into nothingness. Soon we won't be able to talk like this anymore. Does that mean... it's time for me to go back to where I belong? You know... I've been thinking about something Naminé said. Are you really sure that you don't have a heart? Is it possible that we all have one? You, me, her? Or is that just wishful thinking? I don't know. I can't just look inside. Yeah, I guess not. But I figure if there is something in there, inside us, then we'd feel it, wouldn't we? And if so... No... Never mind. Come on. Don't leave me hanging. Sora will find the answer we're looking for. I know he will. Because he's me. <sighs> True enough. Man, I miss the old times. Still got it memorized. The day we met, and you got your new name, you and I sat right here and watched the sunset. Yeah. This place is home. Well, I should go. Sora's waiting for me. Yeah, I suppose he is. Man, this is some good ice cream, huh? Take care, okay? Right back at you, buddy. Next, we see Kyrie is in jail somewhere. Naminé appears to help her escape. Then, Ansem shows up to help her as well. Later, Syax taunts Sora and spawns in shadows to attack us. Kyrie jumps down to try and help, but immediately gets bodied. Ansem helps her up and hands her a keyblade. Okay. Maleficent and Pete show up, Maleficent declaring she wants to take over this castle as her own. Pete says it's too close to the darkness, but Maleficent says that he has underestimated her once again. Cute, you two, trying to be relevant. It's honestly adorable. We see a scene between King Mickey and Diz, who is revealed to be none other than Ansem the Wise. Ansem the Wise? Why didn't you come to me before things got so bad? Xemnas, the organization superior, is the nobody of Xehanort, my foremost apprentice. The burden was mine to bear. Is that all? I won't deny there was more. I was obsessed with thoughts of revenge. I can't help you with revenge. I know. Riku's told me a thousand times. Where is he? He must be with his friends by now. Riku was a great help to me. I found him wandering the darkness after you and he lost track of each other. Riku left, well, because Xehanort's Heartless was still inside his heart, troubling him. But what I don't understand is why he looks like that now, when he's still Riku at heart. I am to blame. When I met Riku the first time, he still had the appearance of a boy. Probably because he had such a strong heart. I asked him to find a young man named Roxas from Organization 13 and bring him to me. When I told him it would help Sora awaken from his slumber, Riku left without a word. He fought Roxas, and I can only surmise Riku lost that fight. Riku must have realized then, to fight in the realm of darkness, he would have to immerse himself in that same darkness. And when he did, you saw what became of him. When Riku brought Roxas back to me, he was introducing himself as Ansem. If that was what it took to awaken his friend, he was ready to live in darkness. 
Riku was the victim of my revenge. How my heart ached. I could only laugh to hide my shame. I guess it must have been after that when I saw Riku again. He said he wanted to help Sora, but he made me promise. Promise that Sora wouldn't ever find out about what happened to him while he was out in the darkness. My friend, the time has come. I must make amends to these young people. So it was Ansem the Wise's fault that Riku ended up looking like Ansem Seeker of Darkness, as he was the one that ordered Riku to capture Roxas. I like this detail a good bit, and Ansem the Wise being present for the whole game, working in the shadows, is actually a decent twist in my opinion. It's not painfully obvious and recontextualizes a lot of his actions, explaining why he cares so much about the organization and Roxas. We fight Zigbar, and then finally get reunited with Kairi and Riku. You are different, Kairi, but I'm just glad you're here. You and Riku never came home. So I came looking for you. I'm sorry. This is real. Wait, Ansem! I mean, Xehanort's heartless. I never thought for a second that I'd ever see you again. Just thinking about all the things you did makes me really mad. But... but you saved Kairi, right? I have to be grateful for that. Thanks. Riku! Don't go! Huh? Oh? Kairi, what did you just say? Riku... I'm no one, just a castaway from the darkness. Sora, come here. Say something to him. Here. You'll understand. Riku, Riku's here. I looked for you. Come on, Sora. You've got to pull it together. I looked everywhere for you. I didn't want you to find me. But it was him that was helping us, wasn't it? Huh? Those clues we kept finding, that must have been Riku. I was starting to worry you guys weren't ever going to catch on. Sora never did pick the brightest friends. What do you mean by that? Why didn't you let me know you were okay? I told you. I didn't want to be found. Not like this. I couldn't. I fought with Ansem, with Xanort's Heartless. When it invaded my heart and I won. But to use the power of darkness, I had to become Ansem myself. Does that mean you can't change back? This battle isn't over. And until it is, I still need the power of darkness. Then, let's finish it. You're still Riku, no matter what. So how about it? Think we can handle one last rumble together? The King's waiting. Yeah! Let's get going! I love this scene. It's so sweet and also pretty sad. Riku's story pays off well in the end. We'll talk about that more later, though. Next, we fight Luxord, then Syax, followed immediately by a scene depicting Riku's second fight with Roxas. According to him, Roxas left the organization because he wanted to meet Sora. Sora says he wishes he could meet Roxas, and Riku tells him Roxas is inside of him. Next, we catch back up with Ansem the Wise and his data machine. I spent years studying the workings of the heart. Yet it seems I still haven't learned a thing. What do you mean? The process of encoding hearts is incalculable. 
the inhabitants of my twilight town, were data created from real hearts. I was convinced that they would think and behave the way I had envisioned, but I couldn't have been more wrong. A heart is so much more than any system. While I was trying to bring Sora back, I had so many plans in store. But once Sora was an acting force, they fell apart. All my research amounted to nothing compared with that one boy's heart. Ansem, a machine! All the more proof that hearts cannot be contained by data. Run, my friend! It's going to self-destruct, and anything could happen. What? Your Majesty! Sora, the rest is up to you. And Roxas, I doubt you can hear me, but I am sorry. I was wondering, who would dare interfere with my kingdom hearts? And look, here you all are. How convenient for me. Ansem the Wise. You look pathetic. Have your love. I deserve as much for failing to see you for the fool you are. None of this would have happened without you. You are the source of all Heartless. It was your research that inspired me to go further than you ever dared. I admit, my disregard brought chaos to more worlds than one. But what were you seeking? You erased me from the world, only to take my name and continue research better left forgotten. Is this the answer you've been looking for? All that and more. I'm carrying on what you yourself began, and I'm creating a brand new world, one heart at a time. I thought you'd praise me, but all you ever do is hold me back. I understand, though. Unlike me, you have a heart, and you're powerless to control it, consumed by the jealousy you feel toward the student who surpassed you. They are not foolish apprentice of a foolish man. You have surpassed nothing, only proved how little we both know. We may profess to know the heart, but its essence is beyond our reach. We're both ignorant, as oblivious as when we began. Afraid that any world you try to create, any world of yours, would be an empire of ignorance. That is why you and your creation are destined to fall. We've said enough. Rico, you know what to do. King Mickey, my friend, forgive me. Farewell. After the explosion, Riku's form returns to normal. While climbing, Maleficent and Pete save us once again. Finally, we get to the summit of the castle. No. I'll have to start all over again. Warriors of the Keyblade, go forth and bring me more hearts. No! Denizens of Light, answer this. Why do you hate the darkness? Huh, we don't hate it. It's just kinda scary. But the world's made of light and darkness. You can't have one without the other, cause darkness is half of everything. Sort of makes you wonder why we are scared of the dark. It's because of who's lurking inside it. Then allow me another question. You accept darkness, yet choose to live in the light. So why is it that you loathe us who teeter on the edge of nothing? We who were turned away by both light and dark. 
never given a choice. That's simple. It's because you mess up our world. That may be. However, what other choice might we have had? Just give it a rest. You're nobodies. You don't even exist. You're not sad about anything. <laughs> Very good. You don't miss a thing. I cannot feel sorrow. No matter what misery befalls the worlds, no matter what you think, what you feel, or how you exist. Now Sora fights Xemnas alone. Once that's over, Xemnas disappears into the fake Kingdom Hearts, but a door appears, given to us by the Hearts. They want us to protect them. Now we're at the final boss. The first few phases are highly spectacle, low substance. We jump across buildings, destroy huge engines, and destroy the ship's core, prior to getting to the first armored Xemnas fight. Once that's over, we appear back at the summit. I need... more rage. I need... more... hearts. Xemnas... There's more to a heart than just anger or hate. It's full of all kinds of feelings. Don't you remember? Unfortunately, I don't. You're coming back with us, right? I had given in to the darkness. Riku! How am I going to face everyone? Like this? <laughs> Ridiculous! Well, I'm not sure. But we better hurry and get through. Row, 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 Wait for me! Thank you, Naminé. Sure. See? We meet again, like we promised. Huh? You said we'd meet again. But when we did, we might not recognize each other. I did, didn't I? But I knew you. Hmm. It's strange. I think I understand. I see myself the way you remember me. And you see yourself the way I remember you. I always thought nobodies were doomed to fade back into darkness. Yeah. But you and I didn't. We got to meet our original selves. So... We can be together again! Right. Anytime Sora and Kyrie are together. We'll be together every day. Right, Sora? Uh, yeah. Look sharp. Don't worry. You're all still you. Hey, let's go home. Riku, come on. Yeah. Uh? Sora, Riku! <gasps> what? Everyone leaves through the dark portal, but before Sora and Riku can, Xemnas' dragon appears. Now we begin the second portion of the final boss, which starts with this glider phase. This is boring and too easy, though I do like they sort of took the gummy ship gameplay and gave it relevance in the final boss. There's a new scene prior to Armored Xemnas 2, in which we hear that Sora wanted to thank Naminé. I couldn't bring myself to say it. Not until everything was back to the way it was before. Don't worry. We'll make that happen. Once this is over, you can thank her all you want. Yeah! They fight Armored Xemnas, then the final fight begins. Heroes from the realm of light. 
I will not allow it to end this way. Not yet. If light and darkness are eternal, then surely we nothings must be the same. Eternal. You're right. Light and darkness are eternal. Nothing probably goes on forever too. But guess what, Xemnas? That doesn't mean you're eternal. <laughs> no more eternal than that radiance of yours. Final Xemnas ends, Xemnas disappearing into nothingness. A bunch of dusks appear and Riku does something we can't see to wipe them all out, but it does take a lot out of him. You know, I always figured I was better at stuff than you. Really? Hmm. Are you mad? No. I kind of always thought you were better at everything, too. Riku, look! What's that light? Sora and Riku find themselves at a familiar beach. Now we know for certain this is the realm of darkness. This world is perfect for me. If this is what the world really is, just this, then maybe I should fade back into darkness. Riku. If the world is made of light and darkness, we'll be the darkness. Yeah. The other side. The realm of light is safe now. Kyrie, the king, and the others are there. That's what I mean. What I said back there. About thinking I was better at stuff than you. Mm hmm? To tell you the truth, Sora. I was jealous of you. What for? I wished I could live life the way you do. Just following my heart. Yeah, well, I've got my share of problems, too. Like what? Like wanting to be like you. Hmm. <laughs> well, there is one advantage to being me. Something you can never imitate. Really? What's that? Having you for a friend. Then I guess... I'm okay the way I am. I've got something you could never imitate, too. A bottle washes up on the shore, and Riku hands it to Sora. Thinking of you wherever you are. We pray for our sorrows to end. And hope that our hearts will blend. Now I will step forward to realize this wish. And who knows? Starting a new journey may not be so hard. Or maybe it's already begun. There are many worlds. But they share the same sky. One sky. One destiny. Light. The door to light. We'll go together. Yeah. Oh, 
Such a satisfying feel-good ending. During the credits, we see some videos of the worlds after the events of the story. A notable cute example is Tron doing a little dance after Sora says this at the end of the second pass of Space okay. Paranoids. Then I'll tweak your program when I get back to the user world. You? Maybe we better not try that. Aw, oh, how about it, guys? Singing Tron? Dancing Tron. Sound good? Sora also finally sees the finished cave drawing. After the credits, there's one more scene. Sora and Riku hang out on the weird tree on the islands, and Kairi runs up with a bottle in her hand, a note inside of it, signed from the king. We don't see what it says, but it's a classic open ending. It can mean whatever you want it to. Maybe they continue to adventure, maybe the king was just thanking them, but either way, this adventure is over. Final Mix added a new secret movie as well. We see this huge wasteland with what look like keyblades stuck into the ground for as far as the eye can see, and three armored individuals. The title of the secret movie is Birth by Sleep, so I think it's obvious what this is pointing toward. For this game, I want to go through and talk about most of the important characters and discuss how they were used, and through them we will be discussing the major themes. Let's start with a simple and mostly humorous example, Maleficent and Pete. Pete's primary purpose is to be a comedic relief, but they both share a purpose in being a through line that connects basically all of the first passes at the Disney worlds together. Either Pete, Maleficent, or both are present in each Disney world, instigating the events in some way. I think this is a pretty positive addition, as it performs this function better than the League of Disney villains did in Kingdom Hearts 1. That's for only the first half of the game though, as they quickly disappear into obscurity after the second half starts, only appearing a couple more times, mostly in the final world. Their lack of presence in the second half is both a good thing and a bad thing. On the one hand, it allowed the organization to become primary antagonists in these Disney worlds, fulfilling the same purpose Maleficent and Pete did in the first half, which is a good use of their characters and also serves as a through line for the second passes. On the other hand, this makes them almost seem like an afterthought when they reappear at the world that never was, their purpose being diluted by their lack of inclusion. This difference in purpose and role for Maleficent is probably a positive change, as the organization needed space for all seven of its members to sprawl out and become relevant. However, I think Maleficent's introduction in this game makes it seem like she's going to be more of a threat than she ends up being. I think the game does a poor job of explaining through its design that Maleficent is not fulfilling the same role she did before, which is what likely caused most people's disdain toward her use in this game. I think her presence is well done here. The game just doesn't support its own new interpretation of the character. Pete, on the other hand, is perfectly represented and used here. He's a phenomenal comic relief villain and adds so much to the scenes he's in. Mickey is indeed much more present in this one, as Nomura wanted going into it. One significant change in his character is that his voice acting is more appropriate and less cartoony. But now I know I forgot the most important thing. Helping others should always come before asking others for help. We're safe and sound, and free to choose! I like that his relationship to the plot is made more clear, that his role is more pronounced. We got to see how some of the events of the past that he took part in led into the events of the present. He feels more important and more like what the first game implied him to be, and I think that's a great change. Donald and Goofy are much more engaging this time around, as they have more opportunities to be themselves when most of the stories are no longer told around them but with them. Their relationship with Sora has really come into its own, and it's really great to watch. I praised the first game for giving them conflict, but now that they are more connected, their relationship is appropriately stronger and they are more confident in each other. Lots of moments play into their characters and it's really nice to see them getting these little moments. 
On the whole, the Disney characters in their relevant worlds are better handled. One easy to point to example is that every Disney villain now makes sense, their motivations are understandable. Part of this is because, obviously, some of them were already present in the first game and we can build on the time that we spent with them back then too. Even the new ones though, such as Barbosa and Shan Yu, are either well explained because the story takes time to do it, or they don't really need an explanation. The friendly characters are all helpful and feel more like instigators of the story. There's also this sense that the world doesn't revolve around Sora and the team's presence, like how Herc continues to fight monsters in the Colosseum while we go take care of the business with Hades, or how the experiment's goals have nothing to do with them. While the actual stories here are not always something to write home about, the characters and their interactions, with and without the KH gang involved, are pretty good, and give some life to the worlds that I feel they desperately needed. It's not perfect, but it's serviceable. The Final Fantasy gang are actual characters now, finally. They don't just stand around waiting for Sora and team to make moves. They are actively working on repairing Hollow Bastion for the whole game, even before Sora and team show up. This can be seen most obviously in Hollow Bastion 3, in which Sora and team must work at the same time as the Final Fantasy gang to save Hollow Bastion from the MCP. There are numerous cutscenes that show the Final Fantasy gang making moves on their own volition, and it wouldn't have all gotten done in time if they hadn't been working alongside Sora and team to get everything done. This is a much better use of them because they actually feel like they are capable of doing things and having goals. On the other hand, I feel like the Cloud vs. Sephiroth story present here is tacked on and too much time is spent on it. What little there is is too much. Because again, we don't really understand why they hate each other. They try to explain it, something about Sephiroth being Cloud's darkness and Tifa being Cloud's light or whatever, but that doesn't really make sense in the context of Kingdom Hearts' lore and how we understand darkness and light to work. Other than that, the Final Fantasy gang are well utilized this time around. The organization is full of pretty interesting characters. While I have to admit that many of them are pretty much just anime cliches, their interactions with each other are where they shine. There's this cool dynamic between them, this sort of love-hate relationship they have for each other that is really fun to watch. It's clear for some of them that this is all business, but for others they want to have some fun during their time in the organization. The final mix cutscenes go out of their way to show this dynamic, and it is the best new inclusion from a story standpoint. As villains, they also come very close to succeeding once again. They once again tricked Sora and team into doing their bidding, and I love how competent they are. This time, their interest in fighting Sora directly actually makes sense too, as Sora and team actively attempt to defuse their short-term goals. We'll be discussing more about these guys later though, as we discuss this game's primary theme. Ansem the Wise, an interesting character at the heart of this story. Throughout the game, you earn secret Ansem reports for many major battles and events. These were written by Ansem the Wise, the real Ansem, while the Ansem reports from Kingdom Hearts 1 were written by Ansem Seeker of Darkness, Xehanort's Heartless. This game's report details Ansem the Wise and his relationship with his apprentice Xehanort at first, as Ansem seeks to understand the darkness of the heart. He aims to do psychological experiments on Xehanort in order to learn more about the heart. Things turn bad, however, when one one of Ansem's other apprentices, Ienzo, spurred him on to construct a massive laboratory in the basement of his castle. There, Ansem's six apprentices began collecting a large number of subjects on which to perform dangerous experiments into the darkness of the heart. So Ansem's curiosity caused these six apprentices to take things too far, as their own curiosity grew. Ansem ordered them to stop and to destroy what data they had collected, but they continued on in secret. The door that appeared in the basement was the last straw for the apprentices Evan, Ienzo, Brague, Dylan, and Alias, as well as Xehanort. They plunged themselves into the darkness beyond the door and were gone. It was around this time that Mickey came to see him, and it was not long after that Ansem exiled himself, taking on the name Darkness in Zero, or Diz, and swore himself to get revenge on his apprentices. During his exile, Ansem found himself at Twilight Town and set up shop in the basement of the abandoned mansion. He learned of his apprentices' work, how they had done so many horrible experiments on so many people, and created Heartless from the hearts they had collected, both Purebloods and the synthetic Heartless denoted by emblems. He thinks that they were probably too enraptured with the power that darkness gives you, as he almost once was himself, but he managed to neither reject it nor fear it, in a similar bout to the one he encourages Riku to take during his time in Castle Oblivion. Ansem begins learning about nobodies the beings left behind when a powerful entity is turned into a Heartless. He figures that if Xehanort and his other apprentices turned into Heartless when they delved into the darkness, did they make nobodies as well? He hears of the Organization 13 and their exploits, gathering members and working out of Castle Oblivion, and he hears more of the king he met earlier, along with a new hero wielding a Keyblade, who puts a stop to Xehanort's Heartless and his plans. 
He hears of Naminé, and he figures out why she was different. Kyrie had no darkness in her heart, and so no Heartless was created when she lost her heart. On top of this, her heart resided inside of Sores, instead of going to the Realm of Darkness. So her nobody was created through completely unique means, meaning Naminé had none of Kyrie's memories. This is likely why Naminé manipulated people's memories. She wishes she could have memories of her own to be a part of others as well. After Sora sleeps, Riku appears to Ansem and he concocts a plan, to use Riku to find Sora's nobody, as Ansem needs a Keyblade-wielding hero to travel through the Realm of Light and defeat Organization 13. Roxas, like Naminé, has none of Sora's memories, unlike other strong nobodies which retain their original form's memories. Ansem thinks this is because Sora so quickly returned his heart to his body and took his human form once again. He also thinks this is why Sora's memories are so slow to return. Roxas is half of Sora, and so Sora needs the other half to be whole. He plans to convert Roxas into Data and return him to Sora, the duplicate of Twilight Town acting as a familiar place for Roxas and a hiding place from the organization, who are sure to want to find Roxas. In his final report, he ends by saying this, when all of this is over, it is my fervent hope that Riku will be able to return with Sora to his island. Dear King, my friend, I believe that at some point in time you will come across these, my truthful accounts. How I wish I could have chatted with you again. I was a fool, obsessed with revenge. Forgive me. All of this gives Ansem's actions throughout the game more context, and more emotion. In the end, we see Ansem trying his best to undo the hurt he has directly caused everyone, but in the end, he still doesn't understand hearts and that he can't contain them so easily. His final conversations with King Mickey are rushed and to the point, lacking in the small talk I'm sure he wished he could have had with his old friend. Interestingly, Xemnas and Ansem are foils to each other. Ansem the Wise, while a good guy in the end, seeks petty revenge and gets a lot of people hurt in the process. Xemnas, while a bad guy, is driven by an understandable desire to be whole. Neither of them truly understand what is in a heart, what it means to have one. Ansem redeems himself in the end, trying his best to help, defying his old apprentice up until his last moments. It's a great story and I love how subtle it is, the game once again using this drip feed style of development to great effect. Kyrie, 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 Kyrie. Maybe after three games of basically no time on screen or character development, I should just give up on expecting her to ever come into her own. She's fine in this one, but is still very underutilized. More screen time and less time in a kidnapped state, but not by a significant margin. She still spends most of this game as a damsel in distress. Even when she's safe, she barely gets any time or interaction with Sora. You can even sort of see the game shafting her in the scene where Sora, Kyrie, and Riku finally reunite. Some might say, well, Sora didn't react as strongly to Kairi because he knew she was safe, but he had no idea what happened to Riku. But like, did he? She was in the organization's custody for the whole game. I would hardly call that safe. Regardless, she basically fulfills the same purpose in this one as in the first game, and that's a bit of a bummer. I like that she tries to help, but she does get immediately bodied, so. Also, is she a Keyblade wielder now or what? Or is this one of those fake Keyblades, like the one Riku made in the first game? I don't know, it's not really explained. I wish more would be done with her, but some of the other characters more than make up for her lack of one. Riku's story arc in these three games has been pretty incredible, frankly. In light of Chain of Memories' a story, he ends up accepting the darkness and becomes a shadow of Ansem, though he is still himself, still maintains his autonomy. I love this because, for Sora, Castle Oblivion is no longer something he did. He has no idea it even happened. Naminé does to some degree make that story relevant to Sora, but it's through Riku's story in this game that Chain of Memories has emotional and thematic weight. He is ashamed of what he had to do, and so wears a blindfold so others can't see him for who he is. He didn't know how he was going to face Sora or any of his loved ones, but in the end he realizes that he can still be himself, and he finally truly accepts that he can be darkness and still be good, still have Sora's friendship. It's a great story arc for him, and it pays off amazingly with the scenes between Sora and Riku in the world that never was. I love Roxas and what is done with him. I've already discussed the prologue, all the ways he has tested and tried throughout it. There are so many great ways this game, and others we haven't played yet, explore his character using the events of the game, as well as the primary theme of the game. I love his relationship with Axel, and the scene after his battle is incredibly well written and sad. Yeah, I don't know what else to say, Roxas is a great inclusion and his story is a great foil to Sora's more triumphant self-assured tale. Speaking of Sora, he's finally coming into his own in this one as well, although I do have to wonder if his exploration in this is as good as it could have been. He is tested in this game, sure, especially with the twist at the halfway point that fighting Heartless is helping the organization. The problem that I have is, after this cutscene, it basically doesn't come back, Sora doesn't struggle with the idea anymore, and I just feel like that's kind of weak. 
more could have been done with this prior to the world it never was in order to give him some more nuance. As it stands, his interactions and love for the other characters in the story is where he really shines. Perhaps the exploration of his character itself is weak, but he does so much to lift up the other characters, Roxas and Riku especially, that I can let it slide. I've mentioned it a couple times, but there is a single theme that ties everything in this game together. The organization, Sora, Riku, Roxas, Axel, King Mickey, Ansem the Wise, even some of the Disney worlds explore the concept. What is a heart? What's in it? What makes people who they are? Many people in this game have a different opinion on this topic. To Zimnus, the heart is full of anger, rage, and power. To Axel, the heart is full of friendship and love. To Roxas, it's fulfillment and a sense of wholeness. To Sora, the heart is light and goodness. To Ansem the Wise, the heart is indiscernible, unknowable. The great thing about all these interpretations is that they are all right, and they are all seeking to prove how right they are through their actions in this game, and frankly, they all succeed too. Everyone in this game is fighting for what they believe is the definition of a heart, the most obvious of these being the organization because they are literally fighting to have hearts, as they have none. I love this because it gives the heroes and the villains a direct, understandable connection, one that they share even as they take different paths to further understand the heart. Our heroes understand the organization's plight. There's probably even a part that feels for them. Their understanding of what a heart is grows and shifts as the story plays out, but the organization's understanding stays the same, one of the many reasons why they seek their goal with such fervor even as they hurt those around them. Perhaps they didn't know, but Roxas and Axel already figured out what it means for a nobody to have a heart long before the events of this game come to a conclusion. Maybe they should have asked them but that's a story for another time. This game is a bit of a toss-up for me. I love it in the state I am able to play it now, but I can't ignore how massively different the base game was. I see this game as some steps forward and some steps backwards. When the game was originally released, it was a massive step backward in terms of gameplay, failing to challenge most players and instead devolving into button spam. Rather than building on the lessons the team learned from the first game, it seemed like they were just simplifying the game even further, to the point that the gameplay no longer engaged in any way. On the story side, however, it was a good step forward. Nomura spoke in an interview about the game maturing with its audience, that they wanted the story to be more complicated and deep, and to that end I think they succeeded. They also managed to give it a solid ending with enough satisfying payoff that, had the series ended there, I think people would have been happy. I certainly would have been. Then, when Final Mix released, everything flip-flopped. Now the gameplay finally had enough challenge to justify the new additions, you could actually engage with the pretty decent boss design, and some of the new bosses were the best we'd seen at that point. The story, on the other hand, took a hit, with a cutscene that is so bad it makes everything around it worse. They started including details that tied forward to games that hadn't come out yet, increasing confusion and just generally muddying up what was a perfectly good story otherwise. Critically, it was a success, of course, but it did receive universal panning for its easy combat and reliance on button mashing. This is really sad, as I've said, because it gave the whole series a reputation moving forward, one I feel is mostly unwarranted. If only Final Mix had released first, though I'm still glad we got it eventually. Now, looking toward the future, there were already three new games on the horizon by the time Final Mix released in Japan in 2007. One was to come out on mobile phones, before the smartphone popularized this, mind you, another was to come out on the DS, and yet another was planned at the time to come out on the PlayStation 2. Though it would eventually get moved to the PSP instead because Nomura hates for his fans to have money. Time would tell if these games would be spin-offs or story-relevant titles, but knowing this series thus far, the latter was much more likely. 